tab. It's time to buy the right stuff. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now on America This Morning, Trump on trial. What to expect as opening statements get underway today. The key witnesses expected to take the stand and the two other big legal battles on Trump's schedule this week. Security boosted at Columbia University as pro-Palestinian protests escalate. A rabbi now urging Jewish students to leave campus due to security concerns. And overseas, as the war in Gaza rages, a first-of-its-kind move expected by the U.S. to punish an Israeli army unit. Can cities punish homeless people for sleeping outdoors? The case in front of the Supreme Court today and how it could influence how the government addresses homelessness and the affordable housing crisis. Caught on camera. It felt like a movie. It was so chaotic. Meet the heroes who risked their lives to save this man from a burning SUV. A potential ban on TikTok moves one step closer to reality. What happens next and what the social media platform's owner is now promising. Plus, singer Luke Bryan taking a nasty fall because of something a fan had thrown on stage. And face to face with an alligator, a diver describes being pulled underwater and how he was able to fight back and survive. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Monday morning, everyone. I'm Rian and Ali. And I'm Andrew Dimber. We begin with history being made in New York today as former President Trump goes on trial. We are expecting opening statements today at Trump's hush money trial, but this is not the only legal battle in the president's schedule today. ABC's Morgan Norwood has more from the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. Good morning, Morgan. Hey, good morning to you, Andrew. That's right. It's the start of a busy week for Trump, beginning with that criminal hush money trial here in New York City. This morning, opening statements in former President Donald Trump's historic criminal trial set to get underway. This is a giant witch hunt to try and hurt a campaign that's beating the worst president in history. The New York District Attorney accusing Trump of illegally falsifying business records to cover up payments to porn star Stormy Daniels to keep allegations of an affair out of the tabloids before the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty. In a statement yesterday, Trump saying in just 24 hours, I'll be back in Biden's corrupt court. The jury of seven men and five women includes a woman in product development, two lawyers, a retired wealth manager, a speech therapist, and a teacher at a charter school. Prosecutors haven't said publicly who their first witnesses will be. Among the possibilities, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker. Prosecutors say Pecker agreed to be the eyes and ears of Trump's campaign by identifying damaging stories about Trump and keeping them out of print. Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, also expected to be a key witness, along with Stormy Daniels and former White House communications director, Hope Hicks. It's going to be up to the defense to try and discredit the witnesses on cross-examination, point out inconsistencies in their accounts. In the case of one of the key witnesses, Michael Cohen, they'll hammer on his credibility uh, because he is a convicted felon. In a separate case today, a judge will hear arguments over the $175 million bond in Trump's civil fraud case, where he was found liable of falsely inflating his real estate assets. The New York Attorney General is asking the judge to void that bond payment, saying the bond company has failed to show it has the money to cover the amount. And another big legal battle for the former president is this Thursday, when the Supreme Court hears arguments on Trump's presidential immunity claim in the January 6 election interference case. Former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney in a New York Times op-ed today urges the Supreme Court to issue its ruling on immunity quickly and decisively, adding, if delay prevents this Trump case from being tried this year, the public may never hear critical and historic evidence developed before the grand jury. And back here at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan, Trump's hush money criminal trial is expected to take at least six weeks, weeks with court in session four days per week. Rhiannon. All right, Morgan Norwood live in Manhattan. Thank you for that. The other big story this morning is the growing concern about security at Columbia University as protests stemming from the Israel-Hamas war intensify. And one rabbi is now urging Jewish students to leave campus.
This morning, Columbia University is boosting security ahead of the Passover holiday with more protests expected around campus. The school now adding 35 guards and more than 100 additional safety personnel. Pro-Palestinian demonstrators have gathered at the school since last week, rallying against the Israel-Hamas war and at times using violent rhetoric. Videos online show protesters promising to carry out massacres, similar to the Hamas attack of October 7th, chanting phrases like, we are Hamas. A rabbi associated with the university is now urging Jewish students to go home, saying Columbia University's public safety and the NYPD cannot guarantee Jewish students safety. New York's mayor says he's horrified by the hate speech, but says because Columbia is private property, the NYPD can't stay on campus unless the school requests it. Police made multiple arrests at a protest near campus Saturday, days after arresting more than 100 people on campus when the university's president asked law enforcement to clear out an encampment. The mass arrests and the suppression of students, I would say that's galvanized us. This is nothing compared to what people in Palestine are dealing with. People in Gaza, they are starving. They have lost everything. <laughs> Overseas, the Israeli military is vowing to carry out a ground offensive targeting militants in the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where airstrikes yesterday killed 22 people, including 18 children, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Meanwhile, Israeli leaders are criticizing an expected decision by the U.S. to withhold military aid from a unit of the Israeli military accused of human rights violations in the West Bank, an unprecedented move that could widen the rift between President Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And we have breaking news now from Tel Aviv. The head of Israel's military intelligence has resigned over the failures stemming from that October 7th attack. This is the first senior figure to step down after the Hamas attack. Here in the U.S., a 29-year-old man is in custody in Los Angeles after allegedly breaking into the mayor's official residence. Police say Mayor Karen Bass and her family were at home at Getty House when the suspect broke in through a glass door early yesterday. The mayor and her family are okay. No word yet on the suspect's motive. Security at the mayor's home is now being examined. The Supreme Court takes up a case today that could influence how cities all across the country confront the issue of homelessness. The case involves whether homeless people can be fined. ABC's Allison Kosick explains. This morning, the Supreme Court takes up the issue of homelessness and what cities and towns can do about it. The question, can cities ticket, fine, or possibly jail homeless people who sleep outside in public areas? Or does that violate the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment? There's no place to go. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here, and uh, still not enough. ABC's Devin Dwyer traveled to Grants Pass, Oregon. That city's crackdown began this legal battle. So the city came in and said, you can't camp right there on those wood chips. They, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the officer said I was too close to the playground and I was too close to the, to the fence. The case shines a spotlight on an issue cities are grappling with nationwide, how to balance public health and safety. We've had shootings in our parks. We've had fights in our parks chronic drug abuse in our parks. In 2013, the city passed an ordinance banning anyone from sleeping in public. But with no public shelters inside city limits, a homeless group sued and won. The reality is um, the only thing that works is more permanent, affordable housing. Brian Boteller runs the only private homeless shelter in town, but it's only half full. The shelter has religious requirements and bans smoking, drinking, and pets. Or that's the big question. Is there nowhere else to go? Or is there just nowhere else that they want to go? Elected officials from both parties are urging the Supreme Court to make it easier for cities to clear tent encampments. There's those of us that are struggling and fighting and taking one step out as we're digging out of the hole. After today's arguments, the court's ruling is expected before the end of June.
Rhiannon, Andrew. Allison, thank you. Terry Anderson, one of the longest held hostages in U.S. history, has died. The longtime Associated Press correspondent was abducted by Hezbollah in Lebanon in 1985. It was nearly seven years until he was freed. Anderson died at his home north of New York City from complications following heart surgery. He was 76. Happy Earth Day, everyone. President Biden will mark the day by visiting a national park in Virginia, and a new poll finds 45% of adults in the U.S. say that they are more concerned about climate change in the past year than they were before. That includes about 6 in 10 Democrats and a quarter of Republicans. ABC News has launched a series called The Power of Us, People, the Climate, and Our Future, featuring reports on the climate challenges we all face and possible solutions. Those will air on all ABC News platforms all throughout this week. Time for your Earth Day weather. So Denver saw more than six inches of snow over the weekend. The biggest snowstorm this late in the season in some 17 years. It'll melt quickly with temperatures rising to nearly 80 this week, but it still feels like winter in much of the country with frost advisories and freeze warnings from Arkansas all the way to New England. Temperatures across that region are mostly in the 30s this morning. Checking today's high temperatures, mid 60s around the Great Lakes, 70s on the West Coast, nearly 100 in Phoenix. Coming up, work begins on a major new high-speed train in the U.S. We'll tell you the cities it will link. But first, a potential ban on TikTok moves one step closer to reality after a weekend vote in Congress. So what happens next? And later, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame announcing its newest inductees. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. Did that told us the complete truth? Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, a new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Traveling with the president to the U.S.-Mexico border. I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. A groundbreaking is scheduled today for a high-speed rail line that will connect Los Angeles and Las Vegas. The $12 billion Brightline West project includes $3 billion from the Biden administration's infrastructure bill. The line could be up and running by 2028. That's when the Olympics will be held in L.A. The train would make the trip in just over two hours. That is about half the time it takes to drive it. There's new uncertainty this morning about the future of TikTok. A proposal to potentially ban the social media app in the U.S. is gaining support ahead of a crucial week. This morning, the U.S. government is one step closer to potentially banning TikTok. The House Saturday passed a foreign aid bill, which includes a proposal to force TikTok's Chinese parent company to sell the social media platform in the U.S. within one year 
or be banned. The bill is passed. Next, the proposal heads to the Senate, where support for the potential ban is growing. This is a very important national security issue because we know that those who control ByteDance, the owner of TikTok, are connected with the Chinese Communist Party. They use this tool to push disinformation to Americans that they won't allow to be pushed to their own citizens. The FBI director has also warned China's government could use TikTok to collect users' data for espionage. TikTok responded yesterday, vowing to fight in court, saying the bill, quote, would trample the free speech rights of 170 million Americans. I don't think it's going to pass First Amendment scrutiny because I think there are less restrictive alternatives. We could have uh, made it a, a crime to transfer Americans' data to an adversarial foreign nation or foreign state interference. But to just ban 170 million Americans or engage in speech and livelihood, I doubt we'll it survives through scrutiny in the Supreme Court. The proposed ban is also expected to face legal challenges from TikTok users. I'm like literally shaking thinking about the possibility of this. Many have protested on Capitol Hill, insisting a ban would take away their livelihoods. My whole business would be done. Devastated. TikTok creators are planning another protest at the Capitol tomorrow when the Senate takes up the bill, which President Biden has promised to sign. More to come. Coming up next, country music star Morgan Wallen is opening up about his recent bad behavior. Also ahead, meet the heroes who risk their lives to save a man from this burning SUV. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines from southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The cut fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Now with country singer Luke Bryan, oof, taking a tumble. There it is. He was performing at a festival in Vancouver when he slipped and fell on a fan's phone that had been thrown on stage. It looked like a hard fall, but Bryan laughed it off, joking that his lawyer will be calling. He asked another fan to share the video, saying he wanted to go viral. And country singer Morgan Wallen, who faces three felony charges after his arrest at a bar, spoke to fans this weekend about his past. During a Mississippi concert, Wallen said back in high school, he nearly got kicked off his baseball team for bad behavior. He described himself as a little rowdy. The adult Wallen is accused of throwing a chair off the sixth floor of a Nashville bar this month, nearly hitting some police officers on the ground below. He issued a statement saying, I'm not proud of my behavior and I accept responsibility. He's due in court next week. Now to Minnesota and a man trapped in a burning SUV who may have died, if not for the bravery of some good Samaritans. In St. Paul, Minnesota, complete strangers making a split second decision to help save a man's life. All I see is that there's a man in a car that can't get out that needs our help. The good Samaritans running out of their vehicles to try and pry open the door of this burning SUV that had struck a light pole, eventually pulling 71-year-old Sam Orbovich from the vehicle. It 
felt like a movie. It was so chaotic. Emotions were so high. Tessa Sand was driving by when she saw Orbovich trapped. Several people at the same time I did were out trying to get the door open, find something to break the glass, trying to find even somewhere around the other side of the car. The group tried to get that door open, but it was pinned by the guardrail and the fire was intensifying. So you know when you're at a bonfire and you can hear the flames and you can hear the crackles? It was like that, but like 10 times, 100 times worse. I mean, you could feel the flame. Even from how fat, far back I was standing, you could feel how hot it was. Eventually, a state transportation worker arrived and smashed the driver's side window, allowing them to pull Orbovich out and to safety. And then, just moments later... The car just totally went up in flames. Orbovich suffered only minor injuries. It's 100% a miracle. I... If those, if strangers had not come together to form this community to get this man out of the car, I don't think he would still be here today. You can see what a miracle it was by that video. Orbovich told Good Morning America he is incredibly grateful to those people who pulled over to help him. Coming up, how long a man played chess nonstop to set a world record. Let's hear from the diver who came face to face with, yes, an alligator and lived to tell the tale. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The cut fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. Did that told us to complete you. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I could tell by looking at it. <laughs> You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the Port of Baltimore, I'm Elizabeth Solzi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Check the polls. We begin with Peter Frampton, one of the newest members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, the new inductees were just announced last night. The list also includes this iconic band. That is, of course, Cool in the Gang. They are among this year's inductees. Ozzy Osbourne also on the list. It'll be his second time. He was already inducted as a member of Black Sabbath, though. Also being inducted this year, Mary J. Blige, Cher, the Dave Matthews Band, Foreigner, and a tribe called Quest. Congratulations to all. Next, a life and death struggle against an alligator in South Carolina. Oh, a hunt for fossils ended in one man's fight to survival. William Georgitis is recovering after a gator dragged him to the bottom of a river. He was diving last month when the gator grabbed him and, yes, took him under. He was going so fast that he was almost hydroplaning on top of the water. He rose up out of the water. At, I mean, and it, he came at me like a lightning bolt, basically. When he was about a foot away, he turned his head and opened his mouth to chomp down, basically, on my head and shoulders. And I uh, defensively put my arm up. 
Wow, he managed to get away by stabbing the gator with a screwdriver. Good Morning America will have more of his story of survival, including how other divers re helped rescue him. Amazing. Next, another wild scene, a dramatic rescue operation in Connecticut. A mama bear and her baby were crossing this bridge when the cub fell off and plunged into the river below. The frantic mom responded, quickly running off the bridge and making her way down the hill. She then dove into the water, scooped up her cub, and carried it to dry land. And finally, imagine playing chess for 60 hours nonstop. It happened in New York's Times Square. Two chess masters, one from Nigeria and one from Brooklyn, faced off trying to set a world record for the longest chess marathon. The old record was 56 hours and nine minutes, but they made it more than 60 hours. Time to play checkers after that, right? <laughs> this is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. But that told us to complete you. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories now. The head of Israel's military intelligence has resigned, becoming the first senior Israeli official to step down for the intelligence failures that led up to the October 7th attack by Hamas, which ignited the war in Gaza. Columbia University is stepping up patrols and allowing remote learning as pro-Palestinian demonstrators rally against the war in Gaza. There's growing concern for the safety of Jewish students as Passover begins tonight. And police near Detroit say an intoxicated 66-year-old woman drove her car into a building where a child's birthday party was being held. Two siblings, aged five and eight, were killed. Several other people were injured, and the driver is now in custody. Today's weather sunny and warming up in the west. Showers from the northern plains to the Great Lakes. Rain in south Florida, but clear in the northeast. Finally, kids give us their take for Earth Day. Danny New spoke to them. like about the earth I like how it's blue and green I love how the earth keeps us healthy I mean no earth we don't we wouldn't be existing Wow where would we be nowhere I really like that the earth gives us nature we can't live on Mars too hot we can't live on Neptune the whole place gives us food we can't live on on Venus, because then we'd be literally pop. Adele, what is your favorite thing on Earth? Oh, um, I don't know. My family, my friends? I think it might be the Grand Canyon. I like myself. Maybe McDonald's. Is McDonald's paying you a big sum of money? No. Like, but they should. <laughs> yeah, I'm their loyal customer. How can we make the Earth better? I would um, clean up all of the dirty stuff. I would, like, 
stop pollution. I would recycle. Pick up the litter off the, off the streets. The, it's everywhere. By cleaning up the ocean. Pick up all the trash. I would recycle. Do you think New York City is clean? Mm, not as much. Sometimes people don't pick up dog poop. <laughs> There's so much dog poop. Why is Earth Day important? Earth Day is important because it's the, it's the day where we give back to the Earth. Let's talk about Earth Day. It's Earth Day <laughs> coming up. <gasps> Earth Day! Oh my gosh, why do you like Earth Day? I like Earth Day because like the Earth is really dirty and we get to clean it up. They give me hope. Thank you, as always, to Success Academy in Manhattan for having us. Guys, are you going to pick up some litter today? Every day is Every Earth day. Every day is Earth Day. Those kids are so smart. And they have such great advice. <sighs> That's what we do it for. The next generation. That's what's making news in America this morning. Happy Earth Day. ABC News, America's number one news source. Macedo, let's get straight to our top story. For the first time in American history, a former president will be tried in criminal court. After a week of jury selection, opening statements are set to begin today in the hush money trial against Donald Trump. Now, they're expected to reveal the clearest view yet of the allegations against the former president and Trump's expected defense. Trump pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. We have team coverage starting with senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky outside the courthouse in downtown Manhattan. Opening statements in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. And it's a shame. It's a shame. And I'm sitting here for days now, from morning till night. Seated in court, Trump is relegated to silence. Prosecutors will introduce the case, which they've said is about whether the defendant, Donald Trump, broke the law in falsifying business records to cover up an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. In their opening statement, defense attorneys are expected to say Trump relied on lawyers to arrange the $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels to keep her from revealing her claim of a sexual encounter with Trump, which he has long denied. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. Prosecutors say Trump worried about his electoral prospects and turned to National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, who they say was part of an alleged scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about Trump. Pecker's among the early witnesses. Stormy Daniels will testify, along with Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer, who wired her the hush money. Prosecutors said some of the witnesses have what you might consider some baggage. Trump says he could testify, too, during a trial expected to last six weeks. Well, I'm testifying. I tell the truth. I mean, all I can do is tell the truth. The testimony is going to be heard by a jury of seven men and five women. That includes two native New Yorkers and two immigrants. Seven jurors have advanced degrees. One juror praised Trump's outspokenness. Another called the former president selfish. Each promised to be fair and impartial. And ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci and ABC News contributor Kim Whaley joins me now for more. John, what are you watching for as these opening statements get started? You know, it's funny. I'm going to be watching for a couple of things. First, I think that to see an image, and it's such a shame there's no cameras in New York State Court, but to mm. see Donald Trump sitting there as prosecutors describe him as a criminal, right? To think Donald Trump cannot say anything, cannot do anything. You know, there was a great piece in the New York Times over the weekend, Diane, and it said it was one of the rare moments that Donald Trump was ordered to sit down in his life in court on Friday as they were wrapping proceedings. That is going to be Donald Trump's life for the next several weeks. His schedule, his agenda, his ability to speak, it is all out of his hands for the first time ever. So I think just that body language to see Donald Trump sitting there is going to be striking. The other thing that I think we're going to see from the defense side of the Trump arguments here is really a breakdown of the witnesses because this is a case that really became to life after Michael Cohen first spoke to special counsel Robert Mueller 
Mueller and detailed some of Donald Trump's financial practices. So Cohen is a main target for Team Trump mm. to tear him down. So I think seeing how much they get into that in opening statements, right, to of course defend President Trump as it's their job to do, but start attacking the other witnesses are going to be called. And it's just a reminder, right, they're attacking people or probably will attack people that Donald Trump himself hired. And I think that's going to be a really hard argument to make for a guy that has said repeatedly, I only hire the best people. Oh, and, and John, you talk <clears throat> about body language. Trump has chosen, today he has to be in yes. court, but he has chosen on many other occasions to be in court yeah. by choice. So what are you hearing from his inner circle? Is there a part of him that likes the fact that he gets to be there, that he gets to look these jurors in the eyes, that he gets to look these witnesses in the eyes? Complete opposite. He hates every single moment of this because, mm -hmm. again, it is not within his control. The other thing you have to remember, too, is that this case is going to get into a lot of Donald Trump's personal and private life. You know, one of the things that is going to come up at some point during this trial because one of the witnesses is Stormy Daniels. They're going to talk about, at some way, shape, or form, Donald Trump's, I hate to say it, but sex life. And that's something that Donald Trump is, as I've been told by sources, embarrassed about. He doesn't want to talk about it. I mean, would anybody want to talk about that in open public? And that's just a reminder, right, that so much of this is going to get personal. You know, think about the other witnesses that have been mentioned in court by Judge Mershon and included as part of our reporting as a potential list by prosecutors. They're going to bring in many former assistants to Donald Trump. Donald Trump didn't have many assistants during his professional life. He only had two, believe it or not. One was with him up until she died, the other up until he went to the White House. They knew everything about Donald Trump. And in part because Donald Trump, in the era with which he rose to f fame and success, didn't use technology, didn't use computers. It was known that if you had to email or reach out to Donald Trump once we got into the 21st century, you went to Rona Graf, his longtime assistant. She is the gatekeeper. She knows everything about Donald Trump's life. So depending how wide of a scope prosecutors do, could be a lot of things revealed about Donald Trump that, frankly, none of us knew before. Now, Kim, it took a week to select this jury. Seven men, five women. What stands out to you about those picked? I think it's interesting. There are three, I think, attorneys on the jury. Uh, that is unusual. Uh, when I was a first-year law student, my law professor told the class, look around, none of you will ever be on a jury. So it, someone will be the foreperson, and that person, I think, will help, potentially, the other jurors understand the legal concept, this idea that it's not just the falsifying records, it's not the hush money, it's the connection between uh, stopping this bad information from getting out in the 2016 election and and then allegedly falsifying the business records. It's a novel theory. Uh, it, this is unusual to have the falsification of business records, the standalone uh, cr uh, alleged crime here. Usually it's, a, it's an add-on to other serious crimes. So I think the, the jurors are, are probably going to look to some of these lawyers. The other piece, of course, has to come down to credibility. As John said, it will be, in a way, the dueling credibility of Donald Trump, who's, a, who's claiming publicly anyway, that he had no knowledge of this, that he was just passing an along to his lawyers, and then people like um, David Pecker and, and Michael Cohen, who might testify, listen, I had a conversation, or I knew, he knew exactly why this $130,000 was going to Stormy Daniels, and it did have to do with the election. It wasn't about embarrassing information getting to his wife, Melania, for example. And we're watching the motorcade now. We just saw former President Trump leave Trump Tower, get into the SUV, and now we're watching the motorcade make its way down to court. John, what are you hearing from Trump's inner circle as they prepare for opening statements in this historic trial now. This is the first time we're going to yeah. see this happening in criminal court with a former president. Well, I think that one of the things that they've been talking about, Diane, is that they want to be able to bring other people into court to be around Donald Trump. Now, that's going to be a little challenging because of just the setup of the courthouse. But one of the things that they are preparing for in part is twofold, right? Number one, it's the audience of one in the sense that, you know, though Donald Trump's lawyers have a job to do, if they don't hit certain points, if they don't, you know, get certain, you know, items across the board that Donald Trump wants to make sure are said or heard, that's going to be a struggle for them because we know, and we saw it in court during jury selection, Donald Trump will not hold back when he has an opinion. He'll pull his lawyers down. He'll write them notes. I mean, he's a very active client. He mm -hmm. doesn't sit there passively at all. I don't think there's anybody who would ever say Donald Trump is passive in any aspect of his life. Um, the other thing that, you know, you have to just brace for here in part as this gets underway, you know, when we saw some of the reporting from the jury selection that Donald Trump was, you know, closing his eyes, moving around, 
there's going to be parts of this, forgive me, that are going to be a little boring when you go through witnesses and whatnot. You know, not every witness is going to be explosive. Some of it is going to be very paper, if you will, because it's a financial case at the end of the day. So we'll right. hear from Who controllers. Signed what document, what date, what does that line exactly. mean? Exactly. So, I mean, some of that's just going to, you know, frankly, put anybody to sleep. So I think Donald Trump actually keeping his attention when he can't be on his cell phone, can't be talking to anybody, can't, again, we said earlier, get up and move around. I think just that's going to be interesting to see how you control Donald Trump as a client. And again, don't take my word for it, right? We've now seen Donald Trump in a courtroom. Think about at E. Jean Carroll, the case that happened earlier this year. He got so annoyed at one point during Roberta Kaplan's closing statements. Remember, he got up and bolted, yeah. right? That's that iconic image that the sketch artist drew of him just saying, I'm out of here. Can't do that in criminal court. And again, I do think you made a great point earlier where Donald Trump, you know, said he, you know, went, went to court because he had to go and he liked being there. That was civil when he could pick. This is criminal. He cannot. Different world. And again, for anyone just joining us, we're watching the motorcade there with former President Trump headed to court in downtown Manhattan for the hush money trial against him. This will be the first time prosecutors will be presenting a criminal case against a former president before a newly seated jury. Uh, Kim, Trump's lawyers are expected to focus on the credibility of the prosecution's witnesses here, suggesting the case is politically motivated. How big of a hurdle is the political timing here for the prosecution? Former President Trump is running for president, currently the Republican presumptive nominee, and that uh, election is just a few months away now. Well, anytime there's a uh a public figure that's in politics that is indicted and prosecuted, arguably it's it's political because it's they're a politician. So I think that the, the idea that somehow this is politically motivated was probably sorted out during jury selection. That's part of the point of the voir dire is to, to make sure the jurors not so much know nothing about Donald Trump. That's probably not someone you'd want on a jury that is just asleep and has no idea what's going on, but someone who can say, listen, I can set my th those biases potentially those viewpoints aside and just decide the the case based on the evidence. I think the defense is going to argue, like most or defense attorneys, that the burden of proof is on the government. They, they have to put all the beans on the scale. In theory, Donald Trump doesn't have to prove or disprove anything. His lawyers could just sit there and say, listen, you've heard all the evidence. They just haven't demonstrated that Donald Trump had the intent to defraud. It's that state of mind. It's climbing in his brain and his thinking that that, that really is the line between a civil type of case where you could have money damages or an injunction and a criminal case. The big line being a criminal case can deprive someone of their liberty that can actually end up putting the person in prison. And that's why it's so important that the government uh, be, be held to its burden of proof. Uh, the government's also, though, going to have to make sure, however it does things, it, it preserves uh, the appeal that he, it doesn't allow things to get in or mistakes to be made that Donald Trump later, if there is a, a verdict uh, um, against him, can, can use to overturn it. So all of these moving parts have to be taken into account. And I do think that the prosecution is motivated to make sure it's, this is not about politics. It's about the evidence. It's making sure the evidence is in there pursuant to the rules of evidence legally, uh, and that they persuade the jury that the elements of this crime have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. All right. Former President Trump now headed to that court as we speak. John Santucci, Kim Whaley, thank you both. And we will be following this trial all day long. We will bring you updates right here on ABC News Live as soon as we have them. Meanwhile, House Speaker Mike Johnson appears to be gaining new support from across the aisle after putting his job on the line to push through a $95 billion foreign aid package. Some hard-right Republicans opposed to that package are threatening to force a vote to remove Johnson as Speaker of the House. Now a top Republican and progressive Democrat are praising the Speaker, suggesting he'll be able to hold on to his job if it does come to a vote. Meanwhile, the Senate is expected to vote early this week on that package of four bills. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang has the latest. The bill is passed. Congress is one step closer to passing billions in foreign aid that's desperately needed by America's allies. With the Senate set to vote on critical funding for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan after a dramatic weekend in the House. The House will be in order. Speaker Mike Johnson putting his job on the line to push through the massive aid package. $60 billion for Ukraine, 
$26 billion for Israel, $8 billion for Taiwan and Indo-Pacific allies, and legislation to force a sale of TikTok from its Chinese parent company or face a ban in the U.S. We did our work here, and I think uh, history will judge it well. For months, Johnson stalled on President Biden's request for more funding. But after classified briefings, including with the CIA director and lots of praying, the devout Christian made a dramatic turnaround. <laughs> arguing to his fellow Republicans that helping Ukraine is critical to U.S. national security and that they need to be on the right side of history. To put it bluntly, I would rather send bullets uh, to Ukraine than American boys. My son is going to begin in the Naval Academy this fall. This is a live fire exercise for me, as it is so many American families. But a majority of his members revolted. More than half of Republicans voting against aid to Ukraine, with Johnson forced to rely on Democrats to even bring it up for a vote. Now, at least three hardliners are threatening to oust Johnson over it. He betrayed us three times. The vote was held today. Mike Johnson is a lame duck. Are you, are you he's, bring he's, he's done. He's done. With the GOP's razor thin majority in the House, that's enough Republicans to push Johnson out as Democrats and moderate Republicans praise Johnson for bringing these bills to the floor. I commended by name traditional conservatives led by Speaker Mike Johnson for doing the right thing. But Speaker Johnson's job is still under threat. Those hardline Republicans can still try to oust him when the House is back in session next week. In the meantime, the Senate will vote on this tomorrow. And President Biden says he's ready to sign this legislation right away, even though it includes that possible ban on TikTok, which the Biden campaign uses to reach those young voters. Diane? Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, thank you. And that massive foreign aid bill uh, also includes a potential ban on TikTok in the U.S. The bill gives a Chinese-owned bite dance one year to divest TikTok or face a nationwide ban. ABC's Janae Norman has more on what it could mean for content creators and the more than 170 million TikTok users. Today I'm saying my final goodbye to TikTok. The clock could be ticking for a popular app, TikTok. Breaking news right now, the House of Representatives has officially passed another TikTok ban. Over the weekend, the House of Representatives passing legislation that could see the app banned in the U.S. if Chinese owner ByteDance doesn't sell within a year. The two options are sell to a U.S. owner or cease operating in the U.S. An unprecedented move that sparked serious concerns for some content creators. I'm happier than I have ever been, and it is because this app has opened the door for me to figure out how I can make a difference in the world. There are over 170 million users on TikTok in the U.S. Many, like content creator Jennifer Gay, have found financial security from the platform. Suddenly my voice mattered and I had a purpose and I started living boldly. 100% of my livelihood is connected to TikTok. The TikTok ban is a response to top intelligence and lawmakers' concerns that user data could become compromised. A TikTok spokesperson calling the move unfortunate, telling ABC News the bill would trample the free speech rights of 170 million Americans, devastate 7 million businesses, and shutter a platform that contributes $24 billion to the U.S. economy annually. I don't think it's going to pass First Amendment scrutiny because I think there are less restrictive alternatives. We could have uh, made it a, a crime to transfer Americans' data to an adversarial foreign nation or foreign state interference. Bill has now passed the House and it is on the fast track to becoming actual law. The Senate is expected to take up the legislation tomorrow and if passed, President Biden has already indicated he will quickly sign it into law. But... Not so fast. Experts say don't expect the app to go away anytime soon. It's not like the app is going to delete off your phone right away. It could be months, it could be years of, of waiting through regulatory and legal hurdles to actually get this done. So for now, TikTok is not for sale. But if and when that bill passes, it would likely kick off a very lengthy legal battle. Diane. Janae Norman, thank you. And two gunmen are under arrest in Jerusalem after a car plowed into a group of pedestrians earlier this morning. Surveillance video shows the car ramming into a crowd and men then jumping out of the car firing rifles. Three people are slightly injured and the IDF is calling it terrorism. Meanwhile, 22 people, including 18 children, are dead after two Israeli strikes in Rafah in southern Gaza. 
At least one of the blasts happened at a refugee camp, according to a spokesperson for the Kuwait hospital. And the first Israeli military official has resigned in the wake of Hamas's initial attack on October 7th, citing intelligence failures. Foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge is in Tel Aviv with the latest. Good morning, Diane. Yet yeah, shocking video. A car ramming pedestrians in Jerusalem, three people just lightly injured, then escaping the two gunmen who were later arrested. And after that major intelligence failure prior to the October 7th terror attack, the head of Israeli military intelligence stepping down. In Gaza, Israel ramping up attacks on the southern city of Rafa ahead of an expected invasion. 22 people, including 18 children, killed this weekend, say local doctors, as U.S. lawmakers approve $17 billion of additional military aid for Israel. Thanks from Israel's prime minister for that, but Netanyahu reacting angrily to unconfirmed reports that the U.S. could take measures against an ultra-Orthodox unit of the IDF, which has been accused of human rights abuses in the West Bank. The Israeli leader saying he will fight such a move with all his strength. Secretary of State Blinken expected to address the issue later today. Diane? Tom Sufi Burridge in Tel Aviv, thank you. Coming up, highway heroes. Hear from the Good Samaritans who saved a man trapped in his burning car. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The cut fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. Did that told us to complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Good Samaritans are speaking out after a fiery car rescue caught on camera. The group rushed across a busy highway to pull a man from his burning car. Now the 71-year-old driver is doing okay as one witness calls it a, quote, 100% miracle. GMA3 anchor Eva Pilgrim has the details. It's the fiery Minnesota highway rescue caught on tape. All I see is that there's a man in a car that can't get out and needs our help. Watch as Good Samaritans jump into action, racing to rescue 71-year-old Sam Orbovich, who was trapped inside his Honda SUV that was engulfed in flames. You could feel how hot it was, the smell of the smoke just wafting in the air. Minnesota State Patrol telling ABC News Orbovich's vehicle struck a light pole and then guardrail Thursday during rush hour on Interstate 94 in St. Paul. One of those Good Samaritans, 24-year-old registered nurse Tessa Sand. I was scared, like shaking scared. The car just totally went up in flames. Sand and several others stopping their own cars, rushing to help free Orbovich. Sand directing others to pull on the doors. I was trying to figure out, one, how to get him out of the car. So trying to break the guardrail down, pulling the car, trying to see, get him out on the passenger side 
which was also um, engulfed in flames. Then highway response stepping in, smashing the driver's side window. The Good Samaritans pulling Orbovich out of that window to safety. You could see the fear and the panic in his eyes. He was taken to an area hospital, surviving with minor injuries. It's 100% a miracle. If strangers had not come together to form this community to get this man out of the car, I don't think he would still be here today. And a lot of people calling these Good Samaritans heroes. One telling me he doesn't consider himself a hero, but it does feel good he could help. Diane? Oh, so great to have a happy ending there. Eva Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, kids are giving us their hot take on Earth Day, what they say is their favorite thing on the planet, next. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! For our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. I'll make a dollar line. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a, a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. Today is Earth Day, and all week long, ABC News is celebrating the power of us. Throughout the week, we will feature reports on climate challenges we face and possible solutions. And today, we're kicking things off by looking to the future. ABC's Danny New talked to some students at Success Academy here in New York City about what they love about our planet. What do you like about the Earth? I like how it's blue and green. I love how the earth keeps us healthy. I mean, no earth, we don't, we wouldn't be existing. Wow, where would we be? Nowhere. I really like that the earth gives us nature. We can't live on Mars, too hot. We can't live on Neptune. The whole place gives us food. Yeah. We can't live on on Venus, because then we'd be literally pop. Adele, what is your favorite thing on Earth? Oh, um, I don't know. My family, my friends. I think it might be the Grand Canyon. I like myself. Maybe McDonald's. Is McDonald's paying you a big sum of money? No. Like, but they should. <laughs> yeah, I'm their loyal customer. How can we make the Earth better? I would um, clean up all of the dirty stuff. I would like stop pollution. I would recycle. Pick up the litter off the off the streets. The, it's everywhere. By cleaning up the ocean. Pick up all the trash. I would recycle. Do you think New York City is clean? Mm, not as much. Sometimes people don't pick up dog poop. <laughs> There's so much dog poop. Why is Earth Day important? Earth Day is important because it's, it's the day where we give back to the Earth. Let's talk about Earth Day. It's Earth Day <laughs> coming up. <gasps> Earth Day! Oh my gosh, why do you like Earth Day? I like Earth Day because like, the Earth is really dirty and we get to clean it up. Aw, thanks to Danny New for that story. We'll be right back. Happy Earth Day to you all. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling 
traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. You guys don't know what happened that day. The day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Their reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a care, in it. How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. Ismael. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Let's get straight to our top story. Former President Trump has arrived at the courthouse in downtown Manhattan for his historic criminal trial. After a week of jury selection, opening statements are set to begin today in that hush money trial against former President Trump. They're expected to reveal the clearest view yet of the allegations against the former president and Trump's expected defense. Trump pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky joins me now from outside the courthouse, along with ABC News chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl, ABC News editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks, and ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley. Aaron, what are you watching for as these opening statements get started today? Each side is expected to go about an hour, Diane, and we expect prosecutors to lay out what they consider to be the original election interference case against former President Trump. They'll take the jury back to the eve of the 2016 election. The Access Hollywood tape had just come out. A number of women had just come public with allegations of sexual misconduct against former President Trump. And Stormy Daniels was out there with this claim of having a sexual encounter with Trump years earlier, which he has always denied. And prosecutors are going to say that he decided to pay her $130,000 to make sure she stayed quiet. Paying hush money is not a crime, but the way the payment was logged, prosecutors say was falsified business records to conceal this payment from the voters so they wouldn't find out about it and damage his electoral prospects. And the defense, Diane, is expected to say there was no crime here. The expense was paid by Michael Cohen, who was then the former president's attorney. Trump reimbursed him. It was logged as a legal expense, which is what it was, they say, because Cohen was, after all, his attorney. John Carl, big picture, what's at stake here for the former president? 
Well, you're seeing him now as a criminal defendant. You know, he's been through the indictments. Those each were big moments and all this, but this is the first time he actually has to sit through an entire uh, criminal trial. This one is by far the one where his defense is the strongest. Uh, I mean, there is a clear defense here. Uh, the argument, as you heard uh, Aaron say they will make, is that Michael Cohen was uh, Donald Trump's lawyer, that those payments were simply a retainer, that even if it was a payment for hush money, there's absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, it's quite routine for wealthy, uh, famous people to try to protect their reputations uh, by using uh, NDAs, which is what Stormy Daniels was paid for. Uh, but look, the country is going to see him stuck in a courtroom for a matter of weeks. It's a trial that could go six, eight weeks. It might not go that long, but it, but it's going to be a matter of weeks. And uh, he doesn't look like a presidential candidate. He looks like a defendant. Uh, John, what are you hearing, Santucci, what are you hearing from Trump's inner circle in terms of how he's been preparing for this moment? I mean, not well is the reality, right? I think Donald Trump, you know, just look at his body language on Friday. But frankly, as you went through the week of seeing Donald Trump leave court, right? I mean, you went from somebody that, you know, looked a little bigger and then suddenly every day just a little more sunken down, right? Because the reality is that Donald Trump can't control anything in this courtroom. He can't control the temperature in the courtroom. I mean, the fact that he said repeatedly, it's a little cold in here, can we do something about that? And nothing happened. It's the first time Donald Trump in his entire life has not been able to control any form of the situation. I do think, you know, just looking at his week, right? Like John talked about this, doesn't look like a presidential candidate. There was a great line, I forgot who wrote it, it was over the weekend, but even Donald Trump campaigning last week in New York, he went to a bodega and the line, I think it was uh, Haberman in the Times, she said that it was more like a mayoral candidate, not a presidential candidate. Mm. It just talks about how this ability for Donald Trump to be on the road as a presidential candidate is completely on hold because of what we're doing right now. And we just saw that video of the former president walking into court. Uh, Mary Alice, the former president's campaign sent out an email over the weekend saying he would be trapped in court. How is this impacting his ability to campaign? For, to John Santucci's point, you know, the, the election is just a few months away. What does this all do for that side of things? Yeah, I mean, just like you guys were talking about, the biggest impact is on his schedule. He can't control the temperature in the room. He can't control his own schedule. I'm thinking about this past weekend. He finally had some days where he could go out before having to sit for the next few weeks in this courtroom. And he wanted to hold a campaign rally. He also couldn't control the weather. Uh, you know, he said that to that crowd in North Carolina that he was going to reschedule. Uh, but his options are going to be limited. He doesn't have much control of the days and the weeks ahead. And that's going to make a big difference. Of course, that has been an argument from the Trump campaign that they view this case as a different kind of election interference, that it is impacting his ability to campaign. You know, on the flip side, of course, here, President Biden is taking advantage of these weeks. He is hitting the campaign trail himself. He has a big campaign event scheduled tomorrow in Florida, a big speech on abortion. Uh, it's a one week before a new strict abortion law is set to go into effect there. Uh, so we are going to see some of that split screen, too. President Biden able to be out and campaigning while, as we've all been talking about, uh, the former president is there in court. Kim, Trump's lawyers are expected to focus on the credibility of the prosecution's witnesses, suggesting that this case is politically motivated. How strong is that argument, given the timing here? Well, it's indicated the, the timing's a big piece. The, the the fact that this was after the Access Hollywood tape and very shortly before the 2016 election, the inference drawn there that it was the intent of this was to cover up information relating to the election. And there are federal election laws that require that certain information be disclosed to the voters and and to the public. Um, D uh, Michael Cohen has uh, has is has a track record of lying to Congress, although he said after the fact that it was to cover up for uh, the loyalty. I mean, it was, it was a loyalty uh, move at the time when he was still uh, Donald Trump's fixer. So uh, this will, I think, come down to, for the jury, whether Michael Cohen is to believe or potentially Donald Trump is to believe, because the, the defense, even if he doesn't actually testify, is that he knew nothing uh, and that, we, that the jury's expected to believe that someone who has this kind of tight control over his business, over his campaign, would allow something like this to happen under his nose with people close to him and have no idea. Idea about it. That's really at the end of the day, the the juries are going juries going to have to decide um, who's more credible and whether the government's proven that Donald Trump uh, had this knowledge beyond a reasonable doubt.
And John, what about the optics of the timing of the case itself? The fact that it's being brought now so close to the 2024 election when they're talking about something that happened before the 2016 election. You know, in, in a way, the timing actually works for Trump in that it is this case that is going first and perhaps the only case that will go before the election. Because again, it is the weakest of the cases. One of the, I mean, the, the credibility of Michael Cohen, the central witness, this is somebody uh, who has a convicted perjurer. He has lied to court before. He has lied to Congress before. Uh, and, and they will clearly make that case. Uh, but, you know, I mean, having being stuck in a courtroom for whatever case, however strong or weak, uh, in the midst of a presidential campaign is not what you want to be if you're a presidential candidate. And John Santucci, what are you looking for in terms of some of the key witnesses? We're expecting the National Enquirer's David Pecker to testify, Stormy Daniels to testify, Michael Cohen to testify. Yeah. What are you watching for? Well, on that actually, front? right now, I was texting with our colleagues, Aaron Gutersky and Catherine Folders. They've just learned that indeed the first witness in this case will be David Pecker. Now, David Pecker, a longtime friend of Donald Trump's, he is the one that prosecutors are going to argue along with Cohen and Trump devised this catch and kill scheme. And the big thing here is that you and I were talking off air that though this case is about Stormy Daniels and this payment, there's more than just that, right? It's Karen McDougal, who we also had an affair with. There's another incident in which a doorman was paid for something about a child out of wedlock that never came to fruition. But the idea that Pecker, Cohen, and Trump did this repeatedly, this was not a one-time thing, that when the campaign started, there was almost like basically an understanding that if we hear anything, Pecker, you're going to be the one to go catch the story, pay the person off, we'll reimburse it, and make it all go away. And that's exactly what they're going to try to do with setting him up as the first one. And, and again, year. They'll, they'll say this is simply a wealthy, famous person trying to protect his reputation. Sure. But John, I was going to ask you, is this the kind of thing that has happened in politics for a long time? Not um, that it's okay, sir, but is sir, this something that happens a lot? Certainly not the head of the National Enquirer having yeah, a yeah, catch and kill thing. scheme yeah, for a presidential yeah, candidate to yeah, cover up yeah. uh, uh, affairs. But you, you certainly, I mean, you had the, the case with John Edwards uh, and and his child out of wedlock and a supporter who, you know, allegedly paid to right. cover cover that up. But, but, but look, uh, you know, th th there is going to be a lot that comes out uh, uh, during this, a lot of facts that, that have been known, but we've never heard David Pecker speak publicly about this, even though we've known about the catch and skill mm -hmm. thing. It's going to be fascinating to see that. And the key thing here that is, although the lawyers, Trump's lawyers, will argue, look, this was uh, simply him protecting his reputation, what's the timeline? It happened as Trump was running for president. And there's a key meeting we're going to hear about yep. uh, between Pecker, Cohen, and Donald Trump after Trump announces he's running for president, uh, basically outlining all of this. There was clearly stepped up activity to protect that storied reputation after he became a presidential candidate. All right. And we're going to hear it all laid out today as those opening statements get started. Aaron Katursky, John Carl, John Santucci, Mary Alice Parks, and Kim Whaley, thank you all. And we will be following this trial all day long. We, of course, will bring you updates right here on ABC News Live as we get them. Meanwhile, House Speaker Mike Johnson appears to be gaining some new support from across the aisle after putting his job on the line to push through a $95 billion foreign aid package. Some hard right Republicans opposed to that package are threatening to force a vote to remove Johnson as Speaker of the House. Now a top Republican and progressive Democrat are praising the Speaker, suggesting he'll be able to hold on to his job even if it does come to a vote. Meanwhile, the Senate is expected to vote early this week on that package of four bills. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang has the latest. The bill is passed. Congress is one step closer to passing billions in foreign aid that's desperately needed by America's allies. With the Senate set to vote on critical funding for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan after a dramatic weekend in the House. The House will be in order. Speaker Mike Johnson putting his job on the line to push through the massive aid package. $60 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, $8 billion for Taiwan and Indo-Pacific allies, and legislation to force a sale of TikTok from its Chinese parent company or face a ban in the U.S. We did our work here, and I think uh, history will judge it well. For months, Johnson stalled on President Biden's request for more funding. But after classified briefings, including with the CIA director and law 
lots of praying, the devout Christian made a dramatic turnaround. <laughs> arguing to his fellow Republicans that helping Ukraine is critical to U.S. national security and that they need to be on the right side of history. To put it bluntly, I would rather send bullets uh, to Ukraine than American boys. My son is going to begin in the Naval Academy this fall. This is a live fire exercise for me as it is so many American families. But a majority of his members revolted. More than half of Republicans voting against aid to Ukraine, with Johnson forced to rely on Democrats to even bring it up for a vote. Now at least three hardliners are threatening to oust Johnson over it. He betrayed us three times. The vote was held today. Mike Johnson is a lame duck. Are you ever going to bring He's, he's done. You, he's done. With the GOP's razor thin majority in the House, that's enough Republicans to push Johnson out as Democrats and moderate Republicans praise Johnson for bringing these bills to the floor. I commended by name traditional conservatives led by Speaker Mike Johnson for doing the right thing. But Speaker Johnson's job is still under threat. Those hardline Republicans can still try to oust him when the House is back in session next week. In the meantime, the Senate will vote on this tomorrow. And President Biden says he's ready to sign this legislation right away, even though it includes that possible ban on TikTok, which the Biden campaign uses to reach those young voters. Diane? Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, thank you. And the Supreme Court is hearing one of the most significant cases on homelessness ever to reach the justices. Today, the High Court will consider a California ruling that found fining people for sleeping on the streets amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran has more. The Supreme Court is tackling its biggest case on homelessness in more than 40 years as cities and towns across the country struggle to deal with more and more people living on the streets. For all intents and purposes, a lot of the behavior you see here today uh, is illegal. At the center of the case is Grants Pass, a small city of 40,000 in southwest Oregon. In the parks around town, hundreds of homeless people have set up encampments. In 2013, the city cracked down, local officials citing unsanitary conditions and crime, banning anyone sleeping in public from using a blanket, pillow, or cardboard box. Penalties included civil fines and a potential 30-day jail term for repeat offenders. But with no public shelters in Grants Pass, a group of homeless residents sued the city in federal court, arguing that the law is unconstitutional because it violates the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Criminalizing people for being homeless is not the solution. The case has huge implications for the rest of the country. So many communities are swamped by homeless encampments, which are often rife with unsanitary conditions, drug use, untreated mental illness, and crime. These encampments in California are unacceptable. These homeless camps overwhelm just the quality of life. But advocates say the homeless have nowhere else to go. Criminalizing the victims of our failed housing policy is morally wrong and it's unconstitutional. And that's essentially what the, city's, the city of Grants Pass has done by making it illegal for someone to exist while being homeless. After over five uh, years living park. in parks it before a nearby fine. church took her in, Helen Cruz telling our Devin Dwyer she received more than $5,000 in camping-related fines. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here, and uh, still not enough to be able to rent a place. Their uh, terms of low-income housing here is $1,000 a month, and that's not workable either, you know. It is a national crisis, but the big legal question that the justices must consider in this case is whether what Grants Pass has done really qualifies as cruel and unusual punishment under the Constitution. A decision in this case is expected by late June. Diane? ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran, thank you. Coming up, climate change on the ballot, how environmental advocates are pushing people to get out and vote, and why they say turnout is their biggest challenge. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. 
reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. You guys don't know what happened that day. The day that my son died. The cops fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. But that told us to complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think it just ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 True Crime Limited Series, tonight on ABC. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Climate advocates in the U.S. are rallying voters to make their voices heard during this year's election. A new poll shows climate is not among the top issues for registered voters. So now a group in Pittsburgh is trying to change that. ABC News White House correspondent Mary Ellis Parks has more. Emily Church is a biologist turned activist. I'm aiming for around 80 today. Knocking on doors in Pittsburgh, she tells me she used to spend time pushing lawmakers on climate change, but lawmakers told her voters didn't care. The people who prioritize climate and uh, the environment need to show up. If the voter comes to the door, basically just follow the script. The Environmental Voter Project is targeting very specific voters, environmentally conscious citizens, often young people and people of color, who rarely head to the polls. Of all the ways to work on climate change, why this? Uh, because uh, yeah, yeah, people who vote or who politicians pay attention to, and so they make the decisions. And that's our biggest problem in the climate movement right now. We don't have enough voting power. The group's founder, Nathaniel Stinnett, says they've had some success. We've sometimes increased turnout as much as 1.8 percentage points in general elections, 3.6 points in primaries, and 5.7 points in local elections. Okay, if I'm being honest, that doesn't sound like a lot. Ask Donald Trump how big a deal 1.8 percent is in Pennsylvania, and I'll tell you. The group is nonpartisan, though acknowledges it's almost exclusively Democrats right now working to address climate change. They hope they can push Republicans to come to the table, too. We want to scare the bejesus out of as many politicians as possible, no matter what side of the aisle they're on, until they think, you know what, the only way I can win elections is if I start recognizing the biggest crisis that humanity faces. But that's no easy task. Across the board this election, registered voters list immigration, the economy, abortion, and democracy as their top issues, with climate change not even making the top 10. Partisan and generational divides at play. Basically, the younger the voter, the more they're likely to prioritize climate change as a voting issue. And yeah, that is going to be a, a reality that Republicans are going to need to grapple with eventually. In November, the choice before voters is stark. But many Democrats worry young progressives might still stay home, despite the Biden administration investing billions to fight climate change. What do you say to those young voters who argue he hasn't done enough? Well, the fact is President Biden has done more to address climate change than any president in U.S. history. And there's a lot more to be done. Scientists have said that we still can avoid the worst of the worst of the climate crisis, but what we do in these next few years is essential. Nathaniel says big policy matters, and too often Americans have been told to focus on their own small habits. Hey, don't pay attention to that coal-fired power plant back there. Instead, it's all your fault for having a plastic water bottle in your hand. And we bought it.
when in truth, it is far more of a political and a systemic problem that needs political and systemic solutions. It's an uphill battle, but for Emily, finding and activating these new voters is worth the fight. The science is very clear, so um, we know what we need to do. It's just a matter of getting it done. Our thanks to Mary Alice Parks for that report. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from a hot air balloon over Russellville, Arkansas, 350 couples have signed up to be married moments before totality. You're streaming ABC News Live. We have breaking news. Former President Trump is speaking outside a Manhattan courtroom as he heads into court for his criminal trial. Let's listen. All right, thank you very much. I just want to say before we begin, these are all Biden trials. This is done as election interference. Everybody knows it. I'm here instead of being able to be in Pennsylvania and Georgia and lots of other places campaigning. And it's very unfair. Fortunately, the poll numbers are very good. They've been going up because people understand what's going on. This is a witch hunt, and it's a shame. And it comes out of Washington. It's in coordination with Washington, everything, including the DA's office. It's in coordination with Washington. I just want people to understand that this is done for purposes of hurting the opponent of the worst president in the history of our country. Second of all, we have another trial going on right now. That's Letitia James. She campaigned on the fact that I will get Trump up or get Trump. And it has to do with a bond of $175 million. First of all, she doesn't want me to participate with financial companies in New York. So we have a company, I guess, based in California. It's a bonding company. And I put up $175 million in cash. But she says the bonding company is not good. She doesn't like the bonding company because she doesn't know if the collateral is good and I put up $175 million in cash, and she's questioning the bonding company. Well, when you put up cash, and the number is 175, which is what we're supposed to be putting up, but I give it in cash, she shouldn't be complaining about the bonding company. The bonding company would be good for it because I put up the money. And I have plenty of money to put up, but nobody is going to be putting up with this. Nobody is going to be listening or coming to New York anymore, businesses are going to be fleeing because people are treated so badly. It's got to be the most unfriendly place to do business, and that's why businesses are leaving and people are leaving as migrants come in and take over our parks and our schools and everything else. So on the Letitia James case, she's the worst attorney general in the country, by the way, 
on Letitia, and she keeps a lot of business out of New York, and businesses that are here are leaving, and that leaves jobs and a lot of revenue. Somebody's going to step in, the governor, somebody has to step in and do something because your business is a fling. But on Letitia James, the money was put up, it's $175 million, and I don't think she's complaining about me for the first time ever. She's complaining about the company, but why would she be doing that when I put up the money? So I just want you to know that that's taking place in front of an extremely crazed judge who's the most overturned judge in New York State. He was overturned four or five times on that case alone. That's, uh, you know who it is, I don't have to mention names, I want to be nice. I want to be very nice, but uh, a thing like that and a thing like what's going on right here should never be happening. It's a very, very sad day in America, I can tell you that. Thank you very much. That was former President Trump as he gets ready to head into the courtroom for opening statements in the criminal hush money trial against him. I want to bring in ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl, along with ABC News Executive Editorial Producer John Santucci. Uh, John, I want to go for, to you for context first, because we're hearing former President Trump call this one of the Biden trials, yeah. talking about this being a coordinated effort with Washington. Put this all into context. Where are these accusations coming from, and is there evidence for it? Well, there's absolutely no evidence. This has nothing to do with Joe Biden. This is, uh, this is the Manhattan District Attorney. The other case he was complaining about is from the New York Attorney General, the, the civil fraud case against uh, his company, the Biden uh, White House, the Biden Justice Department uh, have nothing to do with, with any of this, but he is trying to tie this all together and make the point that he is being politically persecuted. This is uh, not just his message vis-a-vis -vis his trials. This is, in a way, his central campaign message. Uh, that this and, 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 the, and this is a, his campaign appearance every day. You're going to see he comes before the cameras Everybody tunes in at the beginning and at the end of the day. He may add on some events in New York as this goes forward, but this is his, uh, this is his campaign now. What I thought was interesting here is he got into the weeds of the money that he had to put up in the civil fraud case and, and, and this challenge that the New York uh, Attorney General has made to the company that helped him put up the bond. It's pretty weedsy, but it clearly has bothered him greatly. I'm not sure any of that actually resonates with voters or if they can even follow what he's talking about. Uh, John Santucci, what is the latest on that? The fact that he put up the, the bond for this civil fraud yeah. case and now Letitia James is saying she's not so sure about the company underwriting. So exactly that. She's challenging the company that underwrote This is a California bonding company that stepped in. Remember, originally Donald Trump was on the hook for the whole thing, nearly $500 million. The appellate court stepped in, lowered it to $175 million because in part, Donald Trump went around with his legal counsel approaching nearly 30 bonding companies and couldn't get anybody to underwrite him for half a billion bucks. So that is where that has ended up now. That argument has not begun yet. It'll begin later this morning at just a courthouse a few feet away. <laughs> and I think it's actually remarkable. I mean, you're laughing, but it's yes. true, right? I mean, the fact that you have two courthouses on the same street yeah. hearing Trump cases today, it just goes to speak about how this election for Donald Trump is less about the politics and more about the courtroom it's, and the it, week he's going to have. I mean, it's, it's a courthouse election. And then, of course, on Thursday, we're going to see exactly. the Supreme Court is going to hear his Lawyers argue that a president should have essentially absolute immunity for any actions they take as president that can be remotely tied to their official duties. Uh, so you have three courthouses, <laughs> two in New York, yeah. uh, a really big one in Washington, uh, all consumed with Donald Trump. But it's also interesting the fact that, you know, given that you can't be in three places at <laughs> once, he is told he can't be in any of the other places at the yeah. same time, mm -hmm. but Judge Mershon, because you'll recall last week as they were going through the scheduling yeah. process of this hearing, Judge Mershon was, said anything you want to bring up. Trump's team said, well, we'd like to go to the Supreme Court on Thursday. The judge turned around and said, sorry, you are a criminal defendant. We're now in trial. You have to be here. It just speaks to how the whole tone, tenor, control, everything Donald Trump's been used to in his life. I mean, the guy ran his business, was a television star, was the leader of the free yeah, world, yeah. but now People as a stood defendant. when he walks in the yeah. room. Now he has to stand when the judge walks in the right. room. Uh, Kim, Trump's critics are going to look at that and say this is a man who has no regard for the law, and so that's why he's facing all these cases and so on. His supporters are going to look at this and say this shows that this is all politically motivated, that he's being prosecuted for things that other being, people wouldn't be prosecuted for. How much of 
that do you expect to come into the courtroom? It's one thing to say these things outside of court, but how much do you expect to hear that from his attorneys once they actually start opening statements today and they start presenting this case formally? Sorry about that. It's okay, we got you now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, of course, the jury is is required to make uh, a decision based on the evidence in the trial. But, of course, the, the prosecution or the, the defense lawyers in their opening and closing statements can can try to, to, to reframe the narrative to demonstrate or argue, essentially, that this is a... Uh, for lack of a better word, a trumped up crime, that that this is a crime within a crime. These are a bit, falsification of business records, which don't... T don't tend to be a standalone indictment. Usually it's tacked on to more serious crimes in New York. And that there really isn't a strong uh, precedent set for saying that a hush money payment is a federal election crime. The, the Department of Justice declined to actually prosecute Donald Trump for that, that thing under federal law. So they can say, listen, if you put all these pieces together, uh, this is not someone, if it weren't for Donald Trump, who would be in the hot seat. Um, I think the prosecution could say, listen, well, uh, someone who is president is going to put themselves in the hot seat or someone who's running for president uh, should have more accountability, not less accountability. And it'll be up to these New Yorkers, a jury of his peers, um, to decide at the end of the day, not only whether he should potentially get a prison sentence, because remember, uh, these these uh, these crimes do carry four years in prison. Uh, there's no, no knowing whether he'd actually get that. But everyone knows this does impact um, the, the future of the country and the, and the election in November. And I, I do think it's unlikely that that there'll be any other criminal trial that will go uh, to verdict before November. So there's so much riding on this. The very first case that many legal analysts thought was a weak one that shouldn't have been brought, and it's now uh, one of the most important uh, cases in the history of the United States, probably. So, John Carl, those are the legal stakes here. What are the political stakes here? Well, you know, the, the political stakes, the one thing that we just don't know is how does it affect his standing with voters if he is actually convicted of a felony. We've seen polling, and including exit polling in, 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 in the early primary states, uh, that suggests that it's people that have supported him, even though he is indicted, would rethink that if he was actually convicted of a crime. Now, whether or not that actually happens once and if he is convicted, uh, you know, who knows? Because he will make the case, political prosecution, this is ridiculous, democratic city, democratic prosecutor. But the other thing that we don't talk about as much, what, what if he's acquitted? Which is really possible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that could be a boost, a real boost. I mean, look at what, I, I, I was on hand twice when he was acquitted in Senate impeachment trials. And he, you know, took that as a, uh, t t took a real victory laugh on that, uh, on that uh, saying this was, uh, you know, he, he was declared innocent of all charges, which is not exactly what happens. It means that the charges were not proven. Doesn't mean you're innocent, but he, he will uh, take that to the people as well. So I, I don't think we know, uh, you know, the, 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 the political impact of this. Santucci, how much does it matter that this is the first criminal trial going forward of the indictments that Trump is facing? Well, as John Carl made the point earlier, which I completely agree with, shocking. Wow. That, yeah, and don't, don't let it go to your head, John. But the reality is that this is the best one for him politically, right? I mean, all the other cases, besides the fact that, A, they all pretty much have indicated they would go on for months if and when they go to trial, this will be the shortest. But this is the one that is so far away from the 2024 election, just the idea of having to re-educate the voter alone. We're talking in 2016, involved in an affair, Michael Cohen, all of it, and the fact that, again... An affair from 2006. Right. 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 I can't, we're going back another yeah. decade. But I think all of that, again, to just reinforce that, you know, this is so far in the past... They're going to make the argument why you're bringing it now. And again, as John said, which I agree with, that this was standard procedure, right? An NDA. That, frankly, as Donald Trump has gained more and more national popularity, has been around. I think more Americans know the phrase NDA because of Donald Trump than anything else. I would, though, want to make a quick pivot because as court is getting underway, you know, we talked last week about just so much of the process of things going on. Mm. Our team just talk about how the jurors really impact the day. One of the alternate jurors apparently has a toothache this morning. So court was going to go until 2 o'clock today, ending early to observe Passover. Now we're going to end even earlier at 1230 because the juror with the toothache 
has an appointment with the dentist. Needs to go dentist. to the dentist. Has to go to the dentist. And that I'm appointment thinking... is not at 2.30? No, it's not. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. You'd think the dentist would make a little room in their schedule and squeeze them in. No, but I think it's just, okay. as they go through so much of this, right, I mean, you're, you're seeing already comments about, you know, concern about the media attention and whatnot. This is just really going to be a lot of process before we get to opening statements, which should begin shortly, Yeah, hopefully. just a reminder, this is real life, real people with real toothaches, apparently. <laughs> John Carl, John Santucci, Kim Whaley, thank you all. And we will be following this trial all day long. We'll bring you updates as we get them right here on ABC News Live. Keep it here. Meanwhile, Columbia University is holding all classes remotely today as the university's president calls for a reset on campus. The move is part of increased safety measures as protests related to the Israel-Hamas war intensify around campus. One rabbi is now urging Jewish students to leave campus. ABC's Rihanna Nally has more. Columbia University is boosting security ahead of the Passover holiday with more protests expected around campus. The school now adding 35 guards and more than 100 additional safety personnel. <laughs> Pro-Palestinian demonstrators have gathered at the school since last week, rallying against the Israel-Hamas war and at times using violent rhetoric. <laughs> Videos online show protesters promising to carry out massacres, similar to the Hamas attack of October 7th, chanting phrases like, we are Hamas. A rabbi associated with the university is now urging Jewish students to go home, saying Columbia University's public safety and the NYPD cannot guarantee Jewish students safety. New York's mayor says he's horrified by the hate speech, but says because Columbia is private property, the NYPD can't can't stay on campus unless the school requests it. Police made multiple arrests at a protest near campus Saturday, days after arresting more than 100 people on campus when the university's president asked law enforcement to clear out an encampment. The mass arrests and the suppression of students, I would say that's galvanized us. This is nothing compared to what people in Palestine are dealing with. People in Gaza, they are starving. They have lost everything. <laughs> Overseas, the Israeli military is vowing to carry out a ground offensive targeting militants in the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where airstrikes yesterday killed 22 people, including 18 children, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Meanwhile, Israeli leaders are criticizing an expected decision by the U.S. to withhold military aid from a unit of the Israeli military accused of human rights violations in the West Bank, an unprecedented move that could widen the rift between President Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Rihanna and Ali, thank you. And Reagan Meggie from our New York station, WABC, is near Columbia's campus. Joining me now for more. Uh, Reagan, what's the latest there on campus? Well, you know, the latest is that the president of the university, Dr. Manush Shafiq, had sent an email in the overnight hours telling the students that the classes today will be remote because of all of the protesting. And as I speak about that protesting behind me, I don't know if you can get a look at it, we, it appears that we have a group of pro-Israel protesters. Uh, there's an American flag that's divided into the Israel flag and the American flag, and there seems to be a peaceful congregation of people at this hour. Uh, this is important because we're expected to have some congressmen here later on this afternoon uh, talking about the anti-Semitism violence and the harassment among the Jewish students uh, allegedly on campus. So um, in addition to the virtual classes, uh, that's a way for the president to say the university just to have a reset day. As we know, sundown tonight begins the holiday Passover. Diane? So what are protesters demanding from the university? Yeah, so what basically they're demanding is for the uh, Columbia University to divest in any Israel-backed business. So um, things like they say divest its stocks, its funds, and an endowment from companies that they say profit from Israel's violations of international law and Palestinian human rights. And they said that they are vowing this. They're going to stay protesting on campus. In fact, they're allowed to go back onto the South Lawn and protest peacefully and they say they are sticking around until their demands are met. Greg and Meggie from our New York station WABC, thank you. Coming up, is sleeping on the street a crime?
The Supreme Court is weighing that very question today, why some major cities say fines are necessary. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Here are some of the top stories we're watching today. For the first time in American history, a former president will be tried in criminal court. Opening statements are now underway as prosecutors lay out in detail their hush money case against former President Trump, and Trump's team gives a preview of their defense. Uh, former porn star Stormy Daniels will testify along with Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer, who wired her the alleged hush money. We'll be covering the very latest all day right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, a man is under arrest suspected of breaking into the home of Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass. Police say the 29-year-old smashed a window to get into the mayor's official residence early Sunday morning. The mayor was home at the time, but she and her family were not injured and nothing was taken. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has announced its newest inductees. The latest class includes Ozzy Osbourne, Mary J. Blas, A Tribe Called Quest, and Dave Matthews Band. Four of the eight inductees were on the ballot for the first time, including Cher, Foreigner, Cool and the Gang, and Peter Frampton. The induction ceremony will happen in October and stream later on Disney+. And this Earth Day, Hong Kong is taking the major step of banning single-use plastic items. Straws, utensils, and plates will no longer be an option in the city's restaurants starting today. According to Greenpeace, single-use plastic utensils are the second largest source of plastic waste in Hong Kong after single-use plastic bags. And the Supreme Court is expected to hear oral arguments on homelessness today. This after a lower court in Los Angeles found punishing unhoused people to be cruel, unusual, and unconstitutional. ABC senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer has more on what's at stake from Grants Pass, Oregon. On the banks of the Rogue River, tucked away under trees on the side of the road, even in center field of the local Little League ballpark, the homelessness epidemic is inescapable even in sleepy Grants Pass, Oregon. Population 40,000, roughly 600 call parks like this one home. Brandon, a 38-year-old Grants Pass native, says he has no choice. So the city came in and said, you can't camp right there on those wood chips. They, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the officer said I was too close to the playground and I was too close to the to the fence. Local law requires that he move his camp every 72 hours. The city had tried to ban camping in parks outright, but was blocked by a federal court for now. If I don't feel like I just I, I belong, I'm gonna feel like an outsider, and then I'm gonna want to continue doing the same thing because there's no reason to to thrive for anything different. There's no place to go. Helen Cruz knows the indignity firsthand. 
Over five years living in parks before a nearby church took her in, she says she received more than $5,000 in camping-related fines. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here, and uh, still not enough to be able to rent a place. Their, their uh, terms of low-income housing here is $1,000 a month, and that's, that's not workable either, you know. So when the police come through and they do a sweep of this area, what do they do? What do they tell you? If you don't comply, you are trespassed and you could possibly go to jail. The city of Grants Pass is among a growing number of American communities passing laws to crack down on homeless encampments. A perfect storm of skyrocketing housing prices, sunsetting COVID relief programs, a mental health and drug abuse crisis, and an aging population without retirement savings has led to record numbers of unhoused people nationwide. For all intents and purposes, a lot of the behavior you see here today uh, is illegal. And then our community will ask, well, what are you doing about it, Chief? Chief Warren Hensman says his officers are caught in the middle. We have community members in Grants Pass that are afraid to come to their parks. We've had shootings in our parks. We've had fights in our parks, chronic drug abuse in our parks. So, so much of our citizenry are not walking through our parks. In 2013, the city passed an ordinance banning anyone from using a blanket, pillow, or cardboard box for protection from the elements while sleeping in public. Local Representative Dwayne Yunker says it was intended to crack down on unsanitary conditions and crime. Critics of Grants Pass say the, the council has tried to criminalize homelessness. Is that what's going on here? We do have a responsibility to keep people safe. And that's the struggle, is how we keep everybody safe. Is it safe to have a kid play in the park where there's a tent 20 feet away? I don't know what the people in the tent are doing. But with no public shelters inside city limits, a group of homeless residents alleged the new law was cruel and unusual punishment. They sued in federal court and won. We're fighting between what the law is telling us and what the people want us to do and trying to make everybody happy. That's a big, huge struggle for us city government. Criminalizing the, the victims of our failed housing policy is morally wrong and it's unconstitutional and that's essentially what the, city's, the city of Grants Pass has done by making it illegal for someone to exist while being homeless. I had a beautiful vegetable garden. I love to cook. Laura, a 55-year-old Grants Pass native and mother of three, says homelessness hit suddenly after her husband died in 2021 and health problems sent her to the hospital. So, um, Have you been ticketed by the city? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have over a dozen citations. And what are the citations for? Um, mostly for scattering rubbish. And that means that uh, anything outside of your eight foot by eight foot diameter limits is considered rubbish, trash. Her home is now a tent in this park. I needed well, a little bit of color out here. here. A single daffodil, one small sign, Laura is clinging to hope. There's those of us that are struggling and fighting and taking one step out as we're digging out of the hole. <laughs> you have nowhere else to go. Yeah. Yeah. But across the river... You've got 78 beds in this building. Mm -hmm. It's only half full. Why is that? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. So this is what we call our 30-day dorm. Brian Boteller says the doors are open at the only private homeless shelter in town, the Grants Pass Gospel Rescue Mission. For over 40 years, it's provided warm beds and meals, but with religious requirements. How many times a day do they so go to chapel? Twice a day, our guys go to, go to chapel. They go to the chapel once in the morning, once in the evening. The Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Residents must also quit smoking, drinking, and drug use and give up their pets. The Ninth Circuit said that it's cruel and unusual punishment sure. on the part of Grants Pass to cite and fine some homeless folks for living in the park when there's right. nowhere else to go. Well, that's the part, that's the big question. Is there nowhere else to go? Or is there just nowhere else that they want to go? Boteller says so long as courts say Grants Pass cannot ban camping in public, more people will choose to stay on the streets. We've seen a drop in our residency, and we've seen an increase in people in our parks and freeway underpasses and, and that kind of stuff in places where they ought not be. Cities from Phoenix to Los Angeles to Seattle have joined Grants Pass in appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court. These 
encampments in California are unacceptable. Elected officials from both parties urging the justices to make it easier for cities to clear tent encampments like these. It's not acceptable for anyone to call the streets or a park their home. And cities need to have these ordinances so that they can help to incentivize people to accept offers of help. That's what these laws do. The reality is um, the only thing that works is more permanent, affordable housing. This case is not going to solve homelessness. If we prevail in this case, our homeless problem is still going to be there. It just means that we can't criminalize people while they're homeless. For Helen Cruz and Brandon, a lot is on the line. We're just a small little community with a really big homeless problem and no place to put us. Devin Dwyer, thank you. Coming up, soaking up the sun and all its benefits, how spending time outdoors can help your health on this Earth Day. Families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. 911. The cut fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. But that told us to complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think it just ends in a good way? The Interrogation Tapes, the new 2020 True Crime Limited Series, tonight on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the 2024 campaign trail, I'm Eva Pilgrim. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A new initiative from the National Park Service is encouraging doctors to write park prescriptions. Uh, this comes as a number of medical programs are stressing the benefits of getting outside and moving. ABC News medical correspondent Dr. Darian Sutton has more on this Earth Day. Park Rx is a community health initiative that works to provide the prescription for wellness by getting more people outdoors. You cannot get a better opportunity to reinvigorate yourself, to reset yourself, and then getting outside in the outdoor, great outdoors and taking a walk and being in the national parks. Getting outside and exercising can help your health in a number of ways. Just simply getting exposure to sunlight can help you build up vitamin D, improving your immune health and your muscle function. Also, just simply being outside in green spaces can benefit your mental health. Walking and incorporating aerobic exercise can help keep your heart healthy and reduce stress. Dozens of programs across the country are now available to help increase outdoor activity. One of these programs, Walk with the Doc, encourages patients to go outside and walk. Walking is medicine, and for me, it's a form of medicine. And when I get outside and I start walking, it just feels freeing. Like, oh, the weight of the world starts to fall off of me when I have a chance to walk. How much walking do I need to do every week? Is there a specific amount, or is there too little, too much? What, what do I need to do? Important question. <laughs> it's 150 minutes a week, so 20, 25 minutes a day. Um, and if you miss a day, it's okay. 
Um, but key is just sticking with it. And I always think about this, you know, uh, walking versus running. Uh, you know, do I have to be extra, you know, exert myself beyond, or can I just simply walk? Yeah, walking really gets it done. Running gets it done a little faster, but you get all the benefits from walking and its lower impact. When I look across our medical system and the ability of doctors to use all the tools that they can at hand, our parks prescription program is probably a key to that. Being able to get and prescribe to people who are having stressful issues or who, who may need to do rehabilitation, getting them outside into the national parks or any park for that matter so that they can enjoy and get through recovery so that they can again reduce their stress level so that they can center and focus on their own personal well-being. You can't ask for a better program. Dr. Darian Sutton, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. A million dollar life. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a, a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7, straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I'm Kana Whitworth at the Apex Summit in San Francisco. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm 
Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story. Former President Trump is inside a New York courtroom for opening statements underway now in his historic criminal hush money trial. It's the first time ever prosecutors will present a criminal case against a former president before a jury. Opening statements will also reveal the clearest view yet of Trump's expected defense. He pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Sources tell us the district attorney's office plans to call former National Enquirer publisher and longtime friend of Donald Trump's David Pecker as its first witness. I want to bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein along with ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Rick, how big are the stakes here for the former president? Well, this is obviously huge. I mean, this is an actual criminal trial with actual evidence being presented against him. Never happened before in, in American history uh, for a former president or for a presidential candidate, the presumptive uh, presidential nominee. And look, the details matter. We've seen public opinion polling that suggests that a lot of Americans don't think anything criminal happened here. Does the jury agree with that? We've also seen polling to suggest that if he's convicted of a crime, that changes public opinions, that there are people who now say they are Trump supporters who are at least saying now that they would not be Trump supporters if they uh, if he is found guilty of a crime. So the, the, the fact of that criminal conviction doesn't disqualify him from everything, but it obviously has an impact on the, the immediate campaign and the longer term outlook over the next six months. Uh, so, Rick, how does he play this politically? Are we going to see a lot more Trump speeches outside the courtroom, for example, more emails from his campaign? He has telegraphed this strategy for months, Diane, and it is one of suggesting that he's a victim of political persecution, often without evidence and often very much straining the facts, suggesting that President Biden and Democrats are behind this prosecution, that they just want to disqualify him from office, and that this is, in his words, a witch hunt. That's the political message. He has raised a lot of money off of it. He has got his supporters dug in on it. The question will be, now that we're in general election mode, do voters agree with that? Because if he is convicted, he's going to count on a backlash against that very conviction. That is a wild scenario, but it's the, it's the best scenario that he has right now in staring down not, this, not just this one, but other cases where he could end up being criminally convicted. And I want to bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, as well. Uh, John, given what Rick just said, yeah. could this case end up benefiting Trump politically, depending on how it goes? Well, I, I think, as we discussed earlier, that if this ends up in an acquittal, uh, that it will give him momentum and he will certainly play that up and he will go on. But even if not, um, you know, the, he, he has certainly benefited from being, it's just the oddest thing to say, but he has benefited politically and financially from being indicted. Mm. Uh, he has used it. Every indictment has led to a big boost in his fundraising. And actually, if you look at the polling, his campaign in the Republican primary was at its low point before the first indictments. And then he dominated the field. Playing victim has worked very well for him, at least among Republicans. What we don't know is how does it play in a general election? Mm. And again, day after day of seeing Donald Trump as a criminal defendant stuck in a courtroom, I'm not sure this will benefit him, uh, but as we have seen, this has not played out in a predictable way. Now, John Santucci, the judge is now saying that one of the seated jurors was concerned about the media attention yeah. surrounding this case. What's the latest on that? So for now, juror number nine is staying. They had a sidebar with the judge, discussed that concern. But again, not too surprising, right? Because we saw how many potential jurors last week basically disqualified themselves when they talked about the case, said that they were afraid for their safety, their security. Um, we also saw that, you know, a lot of the personal information of jurors was reported in some media outlets, you know, pretty full blown, right? Giving enough details that, you know, even though it's anonymous, their names are not announced in court, but between where they work, where they live, some of their hobbies, people were pretty easily identifiable to their friends, neighbors, and colleagues. So I think that the reality of this case is that though for the moment we're fully intact, 12 jurors, six alternates, you know, alternates are there for a reason, that if one of the jurors has to bow out for any reason, cause, et cetera, we may see as this goes on that, you know, this original slate, if you will, that we're beginning with is not the final slate that judges Donald Trump. Uh, Brian, sources say that former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker is set to be the first witness the prosecution calls. Now, the DA alleges uh, that Pecker met with Trump shortly after he announced his presidential campaign and agreed to act as his eyes and ears in this catch-and-kill scheme where he's supposed to look out for negative stories about Trump and kill them by paying people off, for example. So what are you listening for as he takes the stand? 
Diane, let, let's put it this way. A prosecutor's best friend is chronology. Well, for a defense attorney, it's often chaos. So for the prosecution, they want to go through a chronological setting of this is when Donald Trump met with Pecker, and these were the conversations that were had, and these were the agreements that were made. And then this system of catch and kill was created. And then from there, I would expect that more facts would be substituted into that narrative to kind of give the jury a glimpse as to how the prosecutors themselves came to the understanding that this system worked and the way that it benefited the president and then ultimately lead to those bigger witnesses and those bigger uh, stories, namely Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. Uh, Santucci, we're also yeah. just learning Trump can be questioned on some previous legal issues if he testifies. What do you make of that? Because he has suggested that he might take the stand here. I got to tell you, based on reading this note from our team in court, if I'm Donald Trump, <laughs> I ain't taking the stand. So mm -hmm. let me just read you from our Olivia Rubin in court, Diane. Judge Marchand specifically ruled that Donald Trump can be questioned by prosecutors on six determinations from four of the previous proceedings. And what we mean by that is think about all of the cases Donald Trump has gone through up until this moment, the two E. Jean Carroll cases, et cetera. All of that can come up in court and talking about where Donald Trump, of course, violated the gag order in some of those proceedings, being the attorney general's case and was hit with fines, et cetera. Um, of course, there are other determinations they wanted. They wanted to talk about other elements of Donald Trump's life, but this is the scope that he's limited to. And, you know, I think the reality of this is that, you know, they're going to try to build a case here about Donald Trump and the fact that, you know, he's done this before, his behavior. We've talked about that in the catch and kill of it, but now they're going to be able to do this in Donald Trump, the courtroom, the defendant, in other examples. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is not a good thing for Donald Trump or his legal team as they're trying to say this is politically motivated, it's a one-off case, because they're then able to introduce all the other for lack of a better word, shenanigans that Donald Trump has been engrossed with the last year between all of the civil proceedings, all of which, let's be clear, did not go Donald Trump's way. Between the E. Jean Carroll verdict and the New York Attorney General's verdict, we're talking nearly half a billion dollars Donald Trump is on the hook for in damages in both those cases alone. Damages does not mean you did not commit a crime, but it does mean you're innocent either. And obviously, that's exactly what they're going to try to build here as they introduce this if and only if he takes the stand. I mean, the bottom line is, if he takes the stand, he's going to face a very uncomfortable cross-examination. He may ultimately decide to still take the stand. Mm, sure. Again, he's going to be sitting in that courtroom day after day, listening to the likes of Michael Cohen testify against him. He may want to get up there and take that, take that shot. But what this makes clear is, if he does, that cross-examination will not be uh, enjoyable. But, but, but I also think that, again... And will be risky. Will be totally risky, but also it'll touch on the issues that Donald Trump does not want yeah. to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Like, he's when absolutely... A wall after the verdict in the New York Attorney General's case to yeah. have to relive that again, to have to relive E. Jean Carroll, both the damages and the original accusation that he was ultimately found liable for sexual assault. I mean, all of that to come up in this case, not a great day. Brian, you're the lawyer here. If he's your client, what's your advice now that we know the scope? I've had this conversation many times with my clients, and I would say this is just the tip of the iceberg. Because when a prosecutor is given the ability to go into these issues, it doesn't mean that if uh, Donald Trump takes the stand and says, I never said that. I would never do this. He starts using superlatives, as he often uses in his speech. That allows the, the prosecution to say, oh, you've never said that? Okay, Your Honor, the defendant has opened the door for me to be able to go into more detail as this. Let me play the audio, Your Honor, that you said I was not able to play. Let me get another witness to impeach Donald Trump. So the rulings that uh, John Santucci has given us, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Because if you have a defendant that takes the stand and starts answering the way that we've typically seen Donald Trump answer in some of these pressers, <laughs> the prosecutor is going to have a field day going into each and every detail within that issue and potentially more. All right. Rick Klein, John Carl, John Santucci, and Brian Buckmeyer, thank you. We will be following this trial all day long. We will bring you updates right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, House Speaker Mike Johnson appears to be gaining new support from across the aisle after putting his job on the line to push through a $95 billion foreign aid package. Some hard-right Republicans opposed to the package are threatening to force a vote to remove Johnson as Speaker of the House. Now a top Republican and progressive Democrat are praising the Speaker, suggesting he will be able to hold on to his job if it does come to a vote. Meanwhile, the Senate is expected to vote early this week on the package of four bills. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang has that story. The bill is passed. 
Congress is one step closer to passing billions in foreign aid that's desperately needed by America's allies. With the Senate set to vote on critical funding for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan after a dramatic weekend in the House. The House will be in order. Speaker Mike Johnson putting his job on the line to push through the massive aid package. $60 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, $8 billion for Taiwan and Indo-Pacific allies, and legislation to force a sale of TikTok from its Chinese parent company or face a ban in the U.S. We did our work here, and I think uh, history will judge it well. For months, Johnson stalled on President Biden's request for more funding. But after classified briefings, including with the CIA director and law Lots of praying, the devout Christian made a dramatic turnaround, <laughs> arguing to his fellow Republicans that helping Ukraine is critical to U.S. national security and that they need to be on the right side of history. To put it bluntly, I would rather send bullets uh, to Ukraine than American boys. My son is going to begin in the Naval Academy this fall. This is a live fire exercise for me, as it is so many American families. But a majority of his members revolted. More than half of Republicans voting against aid to Ukraine, with Johnson forced to rely on Democrats to even bring it up for a vote. Now, at least three hardliners are threatening to oust Johnson over it. He betrayed us three times. The vote was held today. Mike Johnson is a lame duck. Are you ever going to bring He's, he's, he's done. You, he's done. Are you, are you with the GOP's razor-thin majority in the House, that's enough Republicans to push Johnson out, as Democrats and moderate Republicans praise Johnson for bringing these bills to the floor. I commended, by name, traditional conservatives led by Speaker Mike Johnson for doing the right thing. And senior White House correspondent Selena Wang joins me now from Capitol Hill for more on this. Selena, let's first talk about this big moment for Speaker Johnson. Why did he change his stance on Ukraine aid and what's in this legislation? Yeah, Diane, this is a really transformational moment for Speaker Mike Johnson. I mean, he went from being staunchly opposed to any more aid to Ukraine to then putting his own job on the line to try and get this $95 billion aid package passed. So the big question, Diane, is what caused this dramatic turnaround? Well, for one, there was this massive pressure campaign from the president, other congressional leaders and world leaders. Then on top of that, there were these classified intelligence briefings, including with the CIA director, which played a role in shifting his perspective. And then third, Thirdly, he's a devout Christian, and his colleague, Congressman McCall, said that he prayed. He got on his knees and prayed for guidance on what to do here. So this bill, this is a big deal. It's something that's been stalled in Congress for months. It includes $95 billion in aid to Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and other Indo-Pacific allies in order to get past the far right wing of his party. This Mike Johnson, he had to divide this into a bunch of separate bills so that he could find a majority for each one of these different aid packages. And then he bundled it all together, including a fourth part of this, which includes that TikTok ban. So the Senate is going to vote on this tomorrow. And given the bipartisan support, Diane, there is a possibility that this actually speeds its way through the Senate. All right. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Coming up, Highway Heroes. Hear from the Good Samaritans who saved a man trapped in his burning car. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed.
Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Good Samaritans are speaking out after a fiery car rescue caught on camera. The group rushed across a busy highway to pull a man from his burning car. Now the 71-year-old driver is doing okay, as one witness calls it a 100% miracle. GMA3 anchor Eva Pilgrim has their story. It's the fiery Minnesota highway rescue caught on tape. All I see is that there's a man in a car that can't get out that needs our help. Watch as Good Samaritans jump into action, racing to rescue 71-year-old Sam Orbovich, who was trapped inside his Honda SUV that was engulfed in flames. You could feel how hot it was, the smell of the smoke just wafting in the air. Minnesota State Patrol telling ABC News Orbovich's vehicle struck a light pole and then guardrail Thursday during rush hour on Interstate 94 in St. Paul. One of those Good Samaritans, 24-year-old registered nurse, Tessa Sand. I was scared, like shaking scared. The car just totally went up in flames. Sand and several others stopping their own cars, rushing to help free Orbovich. Sand directing others to pull on the doors. I was trying to figure out, one, how to get him out of the car. So trying to break the guardrail down, pulling the car, trying to see, get him out on the passenger side, which was also um, engulfed in flames. Then highway response stepping in, smashing the driver's side window. The Good Samaritans pulling Orbovich out of that window to safety. You could see the fear and the panic in his eyes. He was taken to an area hospital, surviving with minor injuries. It's 100% a miracle. If strangers had not come together to form this community to get this man out of the car, I don't think he would still be here today. And a lot of people calling these Good Samaritans heroes. One telling me he doesn't consider himself a hero, but it does feel good he could help. Diane? I oh, love that ending to the story. Eva Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, you've heard of spaceships before, but how about an Earth ship? On this Earth Day, Ginger Z gives us a first-hand look at what it's like to live in a totally sustainable home right after the break. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. I'm Alex Perche in East Palestine, Ohio, one year after that toxic train derailment. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Heating, cooling, and powering buildings creates more greenhouse gas emissions than anything else in the U.S. Construction and demolition also creates more than 500 million tons of debris each year. But things can be done differently. As part of our series, The Power of Us, ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z takes a look inside an earth ship in New Mexico, one of more than 100 so-called living vessels built into the earth, not connected to any water or electricity. Take a look. This is my routine in the morning. At first glance, Mike Reynolds' morning probably doesn't look much different than many of ours. This water was rain. But he doesn't live in a typical house. He lives in something different. This is an earth ship, a home built into the earth, made from trash, concrete, and dirt. It is fully self-sustaining. I imagine that everybody on the planet can wake up in the morning and be comfortable without fossil fuel. Everybody can grow food in their house, that everybody can have electricity from the sun and wind. These buildings do that. 
look closely at the magnificent architecture. It's mostly upcycled trash. That beer bottle there, that's not garbage. That's a glass bottle that will turn into a stained glass brick. They have timers to save energy on hot water. You've got a washer and dryer, all the niceties of you life. You've got a washer dryer, you got a cook stove, you got a refrigerator, hot and cold running water. It's just done smarter. Like the rainwater, used four times. So I'm using five gallons or you know three gallons of water to take a shower. That same three gallons of water waters my banana trees and my tomatoes. That same three gallons of water is recollected to flush the toilet. They have solar, but not for heat or AC. Earthships heat themselves with used tires. Each tire gets about four or five wheelbarrows of dirt pounded into them. And the sun comes in and it heats that mass. Mm -hmm. And then the tire retains it. And as the temperature in here were to drop, that heat would be released. Mm -hmm. We tested out the tire wall, living in an Earthship for three days. The house itself is 5,400 square feet, and 2,000 of it is dedicated to growing space. And in this house, there's two ponds in the greenhouse, mm -hmm. and we have tilapia out there. And then you could catch a fish, pick your citrus, wrap it in a banana leaf, and grill it out on the fire. Our Earthship has a wood-burning fire, but we did not keep the fire stoked. So we're going to go for the night without supplemental heat. Good morning. First night, down, and I slept pretty well, so I was definitely warm, and I guess that's what counts. An obvious part of living in an Earth ship is return things to nature. Leftover coffee going in the compost. But if there had to be one thing from Earth ships that we could apply to homes across America, what would be the most important? You can add a greenhouse on the south side of your house and that will heat those rooms that are near that. You can become aware of the fact that heat comes from that thing, and you can catch that heat. Back in New York, I'm taking Mike's advice. I love to garden, but our season in New York is really short. So it's not an earth ship, but there are plenty of these kind of smaller greenhouses that you can invest in and extend your season, be a little closer to earth. There are more than 100 earth ships near Taos, but Mike says we need more. I mean, the solutions are the way forward on this planet is going to have to be extreme. There are at least one Earth ship in each state, and so they work in other places. You know, the base model uh, that starts at $400,000 for a two-bedroom, two-bathroom, and it really is less sacrifice than you can imagine. We enjoyed it so thoroughly, so much so that when I got home, Diane, my husband, was like, we're not gonna really live in an airship, are we? And I was like, well, we might get close. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine Ben's face and your look incredibly serious thinking about it. Um, yes. But Ginger, can you give us a, a tour and show us how some of these key features yeah. work in practice? Yes, so, you know, it's so cold. It was freezing this morning and you're inside and you're like, okay, so the, the tire wall's working. There's a thermal mass, but they also utilize things like beautiful drapes to be insulation. So, you know, pretty can also be functional. And then living with your food, you know it's pesticide free. You know that you can enjoy it and live with your plants. You have washer dryer and the water from that and the water from your showers goes into the drain. From that drain, it is filtered and then goes into the planters, which are in every room. The plants then filter the water again, and then the water goes into the toilet before the toilet puts it out through a septic here into a black water area that they utilize for other plantings. It is so different, but yet so simple, and I feel like conventional building, Diane, should really take note, because something like that water efficiency could be used in many more places than just here in New Mexico. Well, and that's kind of my question, Ginger. As I watch this, I think, why don't all homes work that way? So I know Mike referenced the greenhouse. I love the idea. <laughs> of the glass cabinet, but are there more features of the Earthship that could be either added to traditional homes or built into new ones? 
Yes, I mean, the geothermal aspect of it, we used to do it. If you think of Laura Ingalls and Little House on the Prairie, there was a reason that we used to do that, but also just the orientation of a building. We've gotten so far away from using the sun and then blocking the sun when it should be that depending on where you live, we got more into like facing the street. Why do our front doors all face the way? Same way. Why do we have to do that rather than working with the sun and using it for what it is? And that's beyond just solar, right? Like that's just thermal mass and how things work like the physics of a house we have gotten not so smart about. And that's what Earthships remind us to do. So interesting and so beautiful at that. ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z. Such a fascinating story. Thank you, Ginger. You're welcome. Thank you. And you can see more of Ginger's reporting tonight on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, analysis, and architecture ideas. We'll be right back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's ray of sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. This is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo, and we want to get straight to our top story. Former President Trump is inside a New York courtroom as opening statements are underway in his historic criminal hush money trial. This is the first time ever prosecutors are presenting a criminal case against a former president before a jury. Opening statements will also reveal the clearest view yet of Trump's expected defense. Trump pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Sources tell us the district attorney's office plans to call former National Enquirer publisher and longtime friend of Donald Trump's David Pecker as its first witness. Let's bring in ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News senior reporter Catherine Falders, ABC News political director Rick Klein, and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Uh, John, what's the latest from inside the courtroom? Well, so far this has been the show of Judge Mershon. He's been going through, you know, the day's business. Of course, earlier we learned the court's going to wrap a little earlier because one of the 
the alternate jurors has a toothache and can't be there. Again, everybody has life happen. It's the way it goes. But one of the things that we have learned so far is that we got a ruling in the Sandoval proceedings, which basically regarded Donald Trump's potential testimony in this case, should he take the stand. And we've learned about the guardrails that the judge has put up for prosecutors and the fact that some of the previous cases that Donald Trump has lived through over the last couple months between the New York Attorney General, the E. Jean Carroll cases, that evidence in those cases could come up if Donald Trump opens the door on them and they start discussing them, which is obviously not good for mm. Donald Trump. Now, that doesn't mean that we know yet if he will or will he not take the stand, but nevertheless, just interesting process. Um, we have learned also that besides the fact the court's going to wrap early today, we've got a sense of where opening statements are going to be. Prosecutors going for just under an hour, the defense team about a half hour or so, and going to start to lay out the case, which is happening right now. And I think that, you know, as we start to get on the road here for the day, depending on how quickly they move, we could get to the first witness, which we understand will be David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer. Uh, Brian, I want to start with that ruling in terms of if Donald Trump takes a stand. How significant is it that the judge is saying that he can be asked about some of these other cases if he does choose to testify in his own defense? Yeah, so let's just be very clear. Sandoval hearings, that's what it's called, um, happen in every criminal case where someone has a, either prior bad acts, uh, open criminal cases, or criminal conviction. So it's not unique to this, this case. Mm. But it does, as John points out, kind of gives you those guardrails as to what the prosecutor can and cannot go into. But you can oftentimes go off those guardrails. So it's significant in the sense that it gives Donald Trump an idea as to what they can go into, how it may hurt his case, and ultimately whether or not his defense advises him that he should not take the stand, that they may be able to prove this case without him, uh, or sorry, not prove the case, but try to disprove the case without him, or that him taking the stand could hurt more than it could help. Uh, Rick, Trump's campaign is sending fundraising emails talking about him being locked away in court. How big of an impact could this case have on his campaign, and could it end up helping him politically? I'm curious if these fundraising appeals, because there have been so many of them, have the same kind of open rate, the same kind of response rate, the same kind of uh, uh, dollars brought in that some of the earlier appeals have had. Because he's been saying this for a long time, including when it really wasn't true, that he was forced into court. Sometimes he'd be showing up voluntarily. It is different this time. And it will dominate the news. It will dominate the campaign discussion for the foreseeable future. It limits, in some ways, what, what Trump can do. It also, though, gives him an opportunity, a platform to command the media environment, knowing that wall-to-wall -wall coverage is going to be around this. What is it going to look like when Joe Biden is out on the campaign trail later this week talking about abortion rights when you know that the former president is there in the courthouse? He now has that political strategy that is the same as his legal strategy of making this look like this is a political and legal persecution. Uh, and he's going to communicate to that to his followers, I think, very consistently as long as this trial lasts and then probably beyond. Uh, Catherine, as John mentioned, you know, sources say former National Security, uh, excuse me, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker is set to be the first witness the prosecution calls here. Now, the DA alleges that Pecker met with Trump shortly after he announced his presidential campaign and agreed to act as the eyes and ears of the campaign, looking out for negative stories about Donald Trump and killing them by, for example, paying people off. So what are you listening for there, assuming he does take the stand as expected? Well, look, I think it's exactly that. How do they expand uh, on that argument? What type of questions do they ask him? He also, Pecker, allegedly uh, directed a 2015 deal to pay 30000 to uh, the former Trump doorman, for example. How do they uh, expand on that? And then, of course, how does the Trump legal team cross-examine him? I'm told that one of the other lawyers, Emil Bove, will cross-examine Pecker when that time comes. As John said, if we see, we could possibly see Pecker on the stand today. Court is wrapping uh, a little bit early. But again, what arguments uh, do prosecutors get in, into there? How much of, as you mentioned, uh, the eyes and ears? Pecker, they allege Pecker acted as the eyes and ears in multiple meetings. How much uh, do they go into on that? Is there any new information? All of that is something to be looking out for. Obviously, he's central uh, to the catch and kill schemes that we've been talking about. So again, I think that he will be on the stand uh, for potentially uh, quite uh, maybe a couple days here. And, John, the judge said one of the seated jurors was concerned about media attention, different juror than the one with a toothache, yes. apparently. <laughs> um, so where are we now in terms of the jury? Well, let me just say one thing. Um, uh, literally, opening statements are beginning right now, so talking about that process moving forward. But as far as the jurors are concerned, hoping the toothache goes well, everybody is intact, meaning that that juror you mentioned, juror number nine, who talked about media attention, had a conversation with the judge, 
for now, Judge Marchand announced that Juror 9 would be staying with the case. So we still have the 12 jurors, still have the six alternates. But look, I do think the media attention thing is a really important part of this conversation because recall so many jurors, potential jurors that were questioned throughout last week. Reminder, used to three weeks, it lasted a week, just had a button that while we're here face to face with each mm -hmm. other. Diane missed that bet. I won, he lost. Anyway, but <laughs> just had to do that. But the reality is that, you know, for those jurors, so many of them said that they were concerned for their safety, right? How much attention Donald Trump brought to these proceedings. Mm -hmm. Many of them really having a tough reaction as they were going through some of the questioning by Donald Trump's attorneys and prosecutors, having to basically say, sometimes positive, sometimes negative things about Donald Trump with Donald Trump physically right there mm -hmm. staring them down in some cases. So I think for now, this is where we are. I'm actually curious if you agree with me. I would be very stunned if the 12 and 6, as it is right now, is the final group that ends up judging this case once we get to the final. Well, and Brian, I'll put that to you and also to elaborate a little bit more on that moment and what you made of it, where these jurors were asked, what did you, I mean, we all know that you know who this man is because he was our president, so we can't pretend like anybody doesn't know Donald Trump, so we want to know what you think about him. And they had to get up there, and some, one person called him selfish, another person said they like that he speaks his mind, and Donald Trump is there in the room. Room throughout all of this. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, process, especially like I imagine when you're Donald Trump, but that's the name of the game. I mean, I mean I, I've had it both for, for clients and myself. You kind of have to put yourself out there for the jury to really examine your case, your attorney, your defendant, mm. because you have to make sure that you get someone who's impartial and not going to hold anything against you, whether you're the, the former president, whether you're charged with a certain crime, however it may be. Um, but that's got to be difficult. But I think at least at this point, and to John's point, yeah, the, we, I've been wrong before. I'll probably be wrong again. But is there a possibility that we lose potential jurors in this case? That's why you have six alternates. Mm. And so, yeah, it could be a toothache. It could be a child care. It could be someone sick. It could be whatever it is. But that backstop of having six alternates, hopefully we get to 12 that can decide this case because you must have 12 jurors to, to, to deliberate. If it gets below that, that's a mistrial. Then the bigger question becomes, will the prosecutors retry this case if we get to that situation? Uh, Rick, how big are the stakes here for the former president? It's unprecedented in every way, and I think even former President Trump has to know that, that his entire campaign and uh, even beyond that, his freedom are at stake. Uh, it's hard to think of anything bigger than that. He could be sentenced to prison time as a result of this. He could also uh, see his campaign take a turn for the, for the worse. Um, he has pointed out that a lot of polls have shown him beating Joe Biden. Does it still look like that on the other side? Not just because of the tawdry details, and there will be lots of embarrassing details coming out over the last couple of weeks. Donald Trump's used to that. But the fact of a criminal conviction, we've seen it in public opinion polling, that even if people don't right now think that this case necessarily meets the bar uh, of criminality, they do think that voting for a convicted criminal is problematic. And there are Trump supporters who've told pollsters pretty, pretty, uh, pretty consistently, actually, that if he is convicted of a crime, they are less likely to vote for him and may not vote for him at all. So that's real uh, in, in his, his, his potential for return to office and, yeah, his actual freedom as, a, as, a, as an American citizen both at stake. And Rick, what happens if he's acquitted? Does this become a redemption story? How much does that help Donald Trump politically? I think that'd be rocket fuel for his campaign. It would play into so perfectly the narrative that he has crafted, often based on half-truths. But to have that, uh, to, to, to say, look, well, they, they tried to bring their best. He did it with impeachment the first time around, if you'll recall. Uh, made in The Mueller report, every time that they aim for him and they don't get it, that they don't take him out, he uses that as a rallying cry. And I think it would make this look like what he has said that it has been, which is a politically motivated effort to bring him down legally. Uh, and I think in a acquittal would be an, an absolute best case scenario for Donald Trump that would then, I think, propel him into an even stronger position than he is in now politically. All right, John Santucci, Catherine Falders, Rick Klein, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. And we will be following this trial along the, the, the whole day. Again, opening statements underway in the criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. We will continue to bring you updates right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, Columbia University is holding all classes remotely today as the university's president calls for a reset on campus. The move is part of increased safety measures as protests related to the Israel-Hamas war intensify around campus. One rabbi is now urging Jewish students to leave campus. ABC's Rihanna Nally has more.
Columbia University is boosting security ahead of the Passover holiday with more protests expected around campus. The school now adding 35 guards and more than 100 additional safety personnel. <laughs> Pro-Palestinian demonstrators have gathered at the school since last week, rallying against the Israel-Hamas war and at times using violent rhetoric. <laughs> Videos online show protesters promising to carry out massacres, similar to the Hamas attack of October 7th, chanting phrases like, we are Hamas. A rabbi associated with the university is now urging Jewish students to go home, saying Columbia University's public safety and the NYPD cannot guarantee Jewish students safety. New York's mayor says he's horrified by the hate speech, but says because Columbia is private property, the NYPD can't stay on campus unless the school requests it. Police made multiple arrests at a protest near campus Saturday, days after arresting more than 100 people on campus when the university's president asked law enforcement to clear out an encampment. The mass arrests and the suppression of students, I would say that's galvanized us. This is nothing compared to what people in Palestine are dealing with. People in Gaza, they are starving. They have lost everything. <laughs> Overseas, the Israeli military is vowing to carry out a ground offensive targeting militants in the southern Gaza city of Rafah, where airstrikes yesterday killed 22 people, including 18 children, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Meanwhile, Israeli leaders are criticizing an expected decision by the U.S. to withhold military aid from a unit of the Israeli military accused of human rights violations in the West Bank, an unprecedented move that could widen the rift between President Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Rihanna and Ali, thank you. And Reagan Meggie from our New York station, WABC, is near Columbia's campus. Joining me now for more. Uh, Reagan, what's the latest there on campus? Well, you know, the latest is that the president of the university, Dr. Manush Shafiq, had sent an email in the overnight hours telling the students that the classes today will be remote because of all of the protesting. And as I speak about that protesting behind me, I don't know if you can get a look at it, we, it appears that we have a group of pro-Israel protesters. Uh, there's an American flag that's divided into the Israel flag and the American flag, and there seems to be a peaceful congregation of people at this hour. Uh, this is important because we're expected to have some congressmen here later on this afternoon uh, talking about the anti-Semitism violence and the harassment among the Jewish students uh, allegedly on campus. So um, in addition to the virtual classes, uh, that's a way for the president to say the university just to have a reset day. As we know, sundown tonight begins the holiday Passover. Diane? So what are protesters demanding from the university? Yeah, so what basically they're demanding is for the uh, Columbia University to divest in any Israel-backed business. So um, things like they say divest its stocks, its funds, and an endowment from companies that they say profit from Israel's violations of international law and Palestinian human rights. And they said that they are vowing this. They're going to stay protesting on campus. In fact, they're allowed to go back onto the South Lawn and protest peacefully and they say they are sticking around until their demands are met. Greg and Meggie from our New York station WABC, thank you. Coming up, is sleeping on the street a crime? The Supreme Court is weighing that very question today why some major cities say fines are necessary. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David.
Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Here's some of the top stories we're watching today. For the first time in American history, a former president will be tried in criminal court. Opening statements are now underway as prosecutors lay out in detail their hush money case against former President Trump, and Trump's team gives a preview of their defense. Uh, former porn star Stormy Daniels will testify along with Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer, who wired her the alleged hush money. We'll be covering the very latest all day right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, a man is under arrest suspected of breaking into the home of Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass. Police say the 29-year-old smashed a window to get into the mayor's official residence early Sunday morning. The mayor was home at the time, but she and her family were not injured and nothing was taken. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has announced its newest inductees. The latest class includes Ozzy Osbourne, Mary J. Blas, A Tribe Called Quest, and Dave Matthews Band. Four of the eight inductees were on the ballot for the first time, including Cher, Foreigner, Cool and the Gang, and Peter Frampton. The induction ceremony will happen in October and stream later on Disney+. And this Earth Day, Hong Kong is taking the major step of banning single-use plastic items. Straws, utensils, and plates will no longer be an option in the city's restaurants starting today. According to Greenpeace, single-use plastic utensils are the second largest source of plastic waste in Hong Kong after single-use plastic bags. And the Supreme Court is expected to hear oral arguments on homelessness today. This after a lower court in Los Angeles found punishing unhoused people to be cruel, unusual, and unconstitutional. ABC senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer has more on what's at stake from Grants Pass, Oregon. On the banks of the Rogue River, tucked away under trees on the side of the road, even in center field of the local Little League ballpark, the homelessness epidemic is inescapable even in sleepy Grants Pass, Oregon. Population 40,000, roughly 600 call parks like this one home. Brandon, a 38-year-old Grants Pass native, says he has no choice. So the city came in and said, you can't camp right there on those wood chips. They, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, the officer said I was too close to the playground and I was too close to the, to the fence. Local law requires that he move his camp every 72 hours. The city had tried to ban camping in parks outright, but was blocked by a federal court for now. If I don't feel like I, just, I, I belong, I'm going to feel like an outsider and then I'm going to want to continue doing the same thing because there's no reason to, to thrive for anything different. There's no place to go. Helen Cruz knows the indignity no firsthand. Over five years living in parks before a nearby church took her in, she says she received more than $5,000 in camping-related fines. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here, and uh, still not enough to be able to rent a place. Their, their uh, terms of low-income housing here is $1,000 a month. And that's, that's not workable either, you know. So when the police come through and they do a sweep of this area, what do they do? What do they tell you? If you don't comply, you are trespassed and you could possibly go to jail. The city of Grants Pass is among a growing number of American communities passing laws to crack down on homeless encampments. A perfect storm of skyrocketing housing prices, sunsetting COVID relief programs, a mental health and drug abuse crisis, and an aging population without retirement savings has led to record numbers of unhoused people nationwide. For all intents and purposes, a lot of the behavior you see here today uh, is illegal. And then our community will ask, well, what are you doing about it, Chief? Chief Warren Hensman says his officers are caught in the middle. We have community members in Grants Pass that are afraid to come to their parks. We've had shootings in our parks. We've had fights in our parks. Chronic drug abuse in our parks. So, so much of our citizenry are not walking through our parks. In 2013, the city passed an ordinance banning anyone from using a blanket, pillow, or cardboard box for protection from the elements while sleeping in public. Local Representative Dwayne Yunker says it was intended to crack down on unsanitary conditions and crime. Critics of Grants Pass say the, the council has tried to criminalize homelessness. Is that what's going on here? We do have a responsibility to keep people safe. 
And that's the struggle, is how do we keep everybody safe? Is it safe to have a kid play in the park where there's a tent 20 feet away? I don't know what the people in the tent are doing. But with no public shelters inside city limits, a group of homeless residents alleged the new law was cruel and unusual punishment. They sued in federal court and won. We're fighting between what the law is telling us and what the people want us to do and trying to make everybody happy. That's a big, huge struggle for us city government. Criminalizing the, the victims of our failed housing policy is morally wrong and it's unconstitutional and that's essentially what the city's the city of Grants Pass has done by making it illegal for someone to exist while being homeless. I had a beautiful vegetable garden. I love to cook. Laura, a 55-year-old Grants Pass native and mother of three, says homelessness hit suddenly after her husband died in 2021 and health problems sent her to the hospital. So, um, Have you been ticketed by the city? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have over a dozen citations. And what are the citations for? Um, mostly for scattering rubbish. And that means that uh, anything outside of your eight foot by eight foot diameter limits is considered rubbish, trash. Her home is now a tent in this park. I needed well, a little bit of color out here. A single daffodil, one small sign, Laura is clinging to hope. There's those of us that are struggling and fighting and taking one step out as we're digging out of the hole. You have nowhere else to go. Yeah, yeah. But across the river... You've got 78 beds in this building. Mm -hmm. It's only half full, why is that? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. So this is what we call our 30-day dorm. Brian Boteller says the doors are open at the only private homeless shelter in town, the Grants Pass Gospel Rescue Mission. For over 40 years, it's provided warm beds and meals, but with religious requirements. How many times a day do they go so to chapel? Twice a day, our guys go to, go to chapel. They go to the chapel once in the morning, once in the evening. The Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Residents must also quit smoking, drinking, and drug use and give up their pets. The Ninth Circuit said that it's cruel and unusual punishment sure. on the part of Grants Pass to cite and fine some homeless folks for living in the park when there's right. nowhere else to go. Well, that's the part, that's the big question. Is there nowhere else to go or is there just nowhere else that they want to go? Boteller says so long as courts say Grants Pass cannot ban camping in public, more people will choose to stay on the streets. We've seen a drop in our residency and we've seen an increase in people in our parks and freeway underpasses and, and that kind of stuff in places where they ought not be. Cities from Phoenix to Los Angeles to Seattle have joined Grants Pass in appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court. These encampments in California are unacceptable. Elected officials from both parties urging the justices to make it easier for cities to clear tent encampments like these. It's not acceptable for anyone to call the streets or a park their home. And cities need to have these ordinances so that they can help to incentivize people to accept offers of help. That's what these laws do. The reality is um, the only thing that works is more permanent, affordable housing. This case is not gonna solve homelessness. If we prevail in this case, our homeless problem is still gonna be there. It just means that we can't criminalize people while they're homeless. For Helen Cruz and Brandon, a lot is on the line. We're just a small little community with a really big homeless problem and no place to put us. Devin Dwyer, thank you. Coming up, soaking up the sun and all its benefits, how spending time outdoors can help your health on this Earth Day. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this town. It was in Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. From the scene of that deadly missile strike. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. ABC News Live. We're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. ABC News. America's number one news source.
Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A new initiative from the National Park Service is encouraging doctors to write park prescriptions. Now, this comes as a number of medical programs are stressing the benefits of getting outside and moving. ABC News medical correspondent Dr. Darian Sutton has more on this Earth Day. Park Rx is a community health initiative that works to provide the prescription for wellness by getting more people outdoors. You cannot get a better opportunity to reinvigorate yourself, to reset yourself, and then getting outside in the outdoor, great outdoors and taking a walk and being in the national parks. Getting outside and exercising can help your health in a number of ways. Just simply getting exposure to sunlight can help you build up vitamin D, improving your immune health and your muscle function. Also, just simply being outside in green spaces can benefit your mental health. Walking and incorporating aerobic exercise can help keep your heart healthy and reduce stress. Dozens of programs across the country are now available to help increase outdoor activity. One of these programs, Walk with the Doc, encourages patients to go outside and walk. Walking is medicine, and for me, it's a form of medicine. And when I get outside and I start walking, it just feels freeing. Like, oh, the weight of the world starts to fall off of me when I have a chance to walk. How much walking do I need to do every week? Is there a specific amount, or is there too little, too much? What, what do I need to do? Important question. <laughs> it's 150 minutes a week, so 20, 25 minutes a day. Um, and if you miss a day, it's okay. Um, but key is just sticking with it. And I always think about this, you know, uh, walking versus running. Uh, you know, do I have to be extra, you know, exert myself beyond, or can I just simply walk? Yeah, walking really gets it done. Running gets it done a little faster, but you get all the benefits from walking and its lower impact. When I look across our medical system and the ability of doctors to use all the tools that they can at hand, our parks prescription program is probably a key to that. Being able to get and prescribe to people who are having stressful issues or who, who may need to do rehabilitation, getting them outside into the national parks or any park for that matter so that they can enjoy and get through recovery so that they can again reduce their stress level so that they can center and focus on their own personal well-being, you can't ask for a better program. Dr. Darian Sutton, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love you that. Me. I'm Mola Lange on the border of Lebanon and Israel. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live.
back to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo, and we want to get straight to our top story. Opening statements are underway in the historic criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. It's the first time ever prosecutors are presenting a criminal case against a former president before a jury. The prosecution is outlining its case, saying, quote, this is about a criminal conspiracy. Now, the judge emphasized that the burden of proof rests on the prosecutors, telling jurors they should presume Trump is innocent and, quote, if you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Sources tell us the district attorney's office plans to call former National Enquirer publisher and longtime friend of Donald Trump's David Pecker as its first witness. I want to bring in ABC News investigative reporter Olivia Rubin from outside the courthouse, along with ABC News editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News political director Rick Klein, and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for excuse me, for more. Olivia, what's the latest from inside the courtroom? Well, prosecutors are continuing to tick through their opening statements right now, laying out their version of the case. They started with a meeting between Donald Trump and David Pecker and Michael Cohen, one where they said they hatched this conspiracy where they were going to buy and bury stories. And then they are continuing to tick through each instance. They have talked about Stormy Daniels. They have talked about another uh, former Playboy model, Karen McDougal. They have talked about a doorman who also received a payment. And I will say, Diane, just before I came out here, prosecutors were going through the infamous Access Hollywood tape uh, in which Donald Trump was, of course, heard just days before the election talking about women and saying that he was bragging about sexual assault. So it's the prosecutor telling the jury that Donald Trump, while he is sitting just feet away, has been bragging about sexual assault. And again, Donald Trump is sort of forced to just sit there and listen to all this before it will be his team's chance to make their own openings. Brian, the prosecution is calling this a criminal conspiracy, saying that's what this case is about. So what do we, they have to prove to reach that bar of beyond reasonable doubt that the judge was very clear about with the jury today? Yeah, so the judge will ultimately, at the end of the trial, quote what we have is called the criminal justice, and or the jury instruction, sorry, and if I can remember it, at one point I had it memorized. Uh, a, a reasonable doubt is an honest doubt that a person would take based on the quantity and quality of the evidence. It's not a, an imaginary doubt, it's an actual doubt based on the evidence or the lack of the evidence, and that's just kind of it paraphrased. paraphrased. He will explain what the prosecution has to do to reach that level, and then ultimately let the jurors be the triers of fact. That he the judge is the trier of the law, the, the jurors will take the evidence and see if they have reached that level. Now, they don't have to technically prove a criminal conspiracy. He's not being charged with anything in that sense. But the criminal conspiracy lends itself towards the falsification of documents as well as the underlying crime. So he's going to have to prove multiple elements uh, of each one of those charges beyond a reasonable doubt. John, we're told that Trump hasn't made any eye contact and isn't making any eye contact with the jurors. He is going to be in this courtroom daily for weeks. What yeah. are you hearing from his inner circle in terms of how he's preparing and has already prepared for well, that? Well, I, I think what's interesting is that, and, and Olivia touched on this in some of her reporting uh, to, to us as she's running out of the courtroom, you know, a big part of what Donald Trump is having to do is sit there and listen to it. So we, we just learned that as Olivia talked about the Access Hollywood tape, I guess, Liv, I guess you missed this part, but they, because you ran out to come talk to us, but they just literally read the transcript of that tape. So Donald Trump having to sit there as they're reading that transcript. We all know those infamous words, when you're a star, you could do anything. I'm gonna stop the sentence there. But mm. the, the idea that Donald Trump can't react to any of this, right? Can't show any emotion to this. You know, he's apparently been, pay, and, and Olivia can speak better this than I can, he's apparently been, you know, writing notes, you know, banging his lawyer's arm. I mean, all of that is things that if our people can see it and they're reporting it, the jurors can see it, mm -hmm. right? And that's really going to be something that Donald Trump has to have a lot of self-control because this is just openings. So when it is the people that, you know, do get under his skin, when it is the Michael Cohens, the Stormy Daniels, and they have told Trump, Trump's lawyers and his other advisors have said, don't react. You know, one of the things that I've heard, Diane, recently is that they're trying to find ways to have people in the courtroom Donald Trump knows. So they've talked about, you know, having other senior advisors to his campaign, having longtime employees of the Trump Organization legal counsel there. People that, frankly, more than anything else, their presence 
could calm Donald Trump down, mm -hmm. just to see them, right? To have a face that you know, because he knows Todd Blanche and these lawyers a little bit, but not well enough that, you know, like you and I at this point, we can make eye contact with each other. <laughs> because and, we've and, been sitting at but, this desk right, together this for, for so long. long. And basically when I get those eyes from you, you're like, John, shut up, stop talking, <laughs> right? There's something about that, right? It, 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 it's the non-communicative language you have with somebody mm -hmm. when you have been around them for some time. And I think that's what they're trying to help Donald Trump with through this process. It's a pretty common practice. A lot of my clients I often say, bring your mom. Because I know if you act out, mom go look at you like, and then your client kind of gets back in order. So it, it's a common practice. It makes sense. Will we see the Trump family in court? So it's been discussed. Um, I, I've heard very mixed um, uh, reactions to this. So far, they haven't been there. You'll recall during the civil proceedings, the New York Attorney General's case, um, Eric and Don Jr. both showed up because they were required to testify. Eric Trump just showed up on days for support with dad. Um, I think it'll be interesting. You know, think about this. You know, while we went through the arraignment process, Eric Trump went with his father to several of the arraignments post those indictments last year. Um, but one of the things I do hear consistently is that it, it's Though this case is a business financial case, because it's so much about Donald Trump's personal life, there's a bit of an embarrassment that he doesn't even want his family to hear some of these things mm. in open court. So I think it remains to be seen. Uh, Rick, what does this all do politically? On the one hand, Trump is in this courtroom, which means he's not on the campaign trail right now. On the other hand, he's making headlines. So he's center of the press, right, getting all this coverage. What does this all do for his campaign, and particularly this idea that he, you know, he can't react in the way he probably would like to in the way we're used to seeing him. Yeah, look, when he is the dominant news story, he's typically winning. But I think things might be a little bit different uh, in, in, the coming, in the coming days and weeks for a couple of reasons. One is, these are just tawdry details. To have the Access Hollywood tape read out to the, to the jurors, read out to the public, reminding everyone of, of one of the absolute low points of his time in public life, um, the details are going to come out about this alleged affair and the hush money payments and, and all of this. It is just it's just kind of gross and not good for anyone. Now, Trump may be the exception to that rule, as we've seen in the past. The other thing is, he wants this campaign to not be about him, oddly. He wants it to be about Joe Biden. And when he's in the courtroom, it's about him and about his behavior. And it's going to remind voters, potentially, of what they didn't like about him. So I do think that this might be a little bit of the exception to the rule of Trump dominance, that uh, this is a case where he doesn't necessarily want to be the center of the action. He's going to turn it around. He's going to try to turn it around and talk about how this is uh, an attempt to get him. And, the, you know, be talking about gag orders and about politically motivated prosecutions, all of which he can do to some extent, just to whatever extent is, isn't reined in by those, uh, by those partial gag orders. Uh, but he, he's not really fighting this entirely on his own terms. No matter what he says outside the courtroom, a lot of the days and a lot of the headlines are going to be about some really awful details of his, of his personal life, some of which are in dispute, but many of which actually aren't. And Olivia, how is Trump doing with those instructions from his legal team to hold back those reactions? He's not someone, you know, he is someone known for his very animated facial expressions and his verbal reactions to things, sometimes even when he's in theory not supposed to have them. So how's that going so far as, as the prosecution lays out, in some cases, some pretty tawdry details about his, his life and allegations against him? Well, we're already starting to see some of that reaction, Diane. Remember, in the overflow room, there's sort of a camera directly on Donald Trump's face. So we're seeing his reaction to every single word from the prosecutors. And what has been drawing some reaction from him specifically is that Access Hollywood tape when the prosecutor said that Trump bragged about his uh, uh, sexual assault. I could see him shake his head, uh, purse his lips when, you know, the prosecutor brought up Karen McDougal. He could he was shuffling with some papers and grabbing onto a pen and he sort of fidgeting in his seat a little bit because there's not much more that he can do, tilting his head, leaning back and forth, talking to his lawyers. But it's the shaking of the head, Diane, that I've seen so far twice this morning, once during uh, the bragging about sexual assault claim and once during oh, essentially one of the opening remarks of the opening statement when uh, Matthew Colangelo said that Donald Trump engaged in a conspiracy to uh, unlawfully influence the 2016 election so that he could win. That drew the first head shake from Donald Trump, and that's really the most that he can do here. But I do think, you know, John brought up something really interesting, which is that the jurors are going to be watching him, and that was at issue in an earlier E. Jean Carroll trial. Remember, 
He was muttering under his breath. He stormed out of the courtroom at one point, and the jury watched all of that. And the uh, attorneys in that case encouraged the jury to factor in his courtroom behavior in their verdict. So he is under a microscope here, not just from the press, but from the jurors as well. And it will be interesting to see how he can react uh, throughout the next six to eight weeks. And Brian, the judge has ruled that Trump can be questioned on some of these previous cases if he takes the stand in his own defense. How significant is that? It's very significant because it gives the defense a kind of a roadmap as to, all right, this is what we want on direct examination. This is how we can probably push forward our case and push back on on the prosecution's case, but is it gonna be a situation where we take one step forward and five steps back? Because if Donald Trump was questioned on these issues that seems to pertain to this catch and kill uh, scheme, and let's say he testifies beautifully and doesn't open the door to anything and he's calm, cool, and collected and answers with short, beautiful answers, then yeah, there's still harm there, but it's also Donald Trump. What's the likelihood of him answering that way? So you also have to predict the likelihood of him opening the door to far worse. So it, to me, it, it could possibly be one step forward and 10 back. I, I've, I would say don't do it, Donald Trump, if I was attorney. But as Brian Buckmeyer, ABC legal contributor, I say, please, take the stand. <laughs> because there'll be a lot more to talk because about. Because I'm, 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 I'm hoping for a second child and him taking the stand just way oh, more boy. <laughs> opportunity to talk about the case. But legally, I would say don't do it. Like, do, like it's not smart. But I think he'll keep us in business for a long time if he does. All right, we'll see. Olivia Rubin, John Santucci, Rick Klein, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you. And we will be following this trial all day long. We'll, of course, bring you updates right here on ABC News Live with those opening statements underway in the criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. We'll have more of the day's top stories right after the break. Stay with us. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Opening statements are underway in the historic criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. It's the first time ever prosecutors are presenting a criminal case against a former president before a jury. The prosecution is outlining its case, saying, quote, this is about a criminal conspiracy. The judge, meanwhile, emphasized that the burden of proof rests on the prosecutors, telling jurors they should presume Trump is innocent and, quote, if you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. Trump has pleaded 
not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. So let's get an update now from ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci. Uh, John, what's the latest here? So for the moment, we're going through basically the process of the day, right? So we've seen opening statements from prosecutors where they've really been outlining what their case is going to be. And they've talked about how this was not a one-off thing with Donald Trump. He was known to do this. They've also talked about certain attitudes and behaviors of Donald Trump. And one of the things that we knew would come up at some point, but, you know, it's coming right out of the gate early, is that infamous Access Hollywood tape, the one that came out just weeks before the 2016 presidential election, in which Donald Trump's heard on audio speaking about a woman, talking about how when you're a star, they can let you do anything. I think most people at home are familiar with that. But the reality is, Prosecutors are trying to build this idea that Donald Trump and the way he acted, he behaved as if the law did not apply to him. And clearly, based on where he is today, that is the argument they need to hit home because they're all here because they believe Donald Trump broke the law and thus a 34-count criminal indictment is against him. All right, John Santucci, thank you. And we will be following this trial all day long. Again, opening statements underway in that criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. We'll keep you updated right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, House Speaker Mike Johnson appears to be gaining new support from across the aisle after putting his job on the line to push through a $95 billion foreign aid package. Some hard-right Republicans opposed to the package are threatening to force a vote to remove Johnson as Speaker of the House. Now a top Republican and progressive Democrat are praising the Speaker, suggesting he'll be able to hold on to his job even if it does come to a vote. Now that massive foreign aid package is headed to the Senate, and it also includes a bill that could potentially ban TikTok in the U.S. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang joins me now from Capitol Hill for more on that. So, uh, Selena, talk to me about the TikTok bill that's part of this package. It gives Chinese-owned ByteDance a year to sell TikTok or face a nationwide ban. How significant is that, and how could that impact the many concrete, uh, content creators and more than 170 million TikTok users? Yeah, Diane, so this has been gaining a lot of momentum in Congress over national security concerns of TikTok with fears that American data, private data, could end up in the hands of the Chinese government. That is something that TikTok vehemently denies. They say their data is secure, and that has never happened. Now, as you say, this legislation would give TikTok about a year to try and find a buyer for ByteDance to try and find a buyer for TikTok. Otherwise, it would face a ban in the U.S. But look, it's a long road to get there. This will face legal challenges. TikTok says they're going to fight this in the court, saying it violates the First Amendment. And on top of that, Diane, it would be very hard to find a buyer. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars here. There are not many companies, not many buyers who can afford that. And on top of that, there could be these anti-monopoly concerns. So even if TikTok is banned in all of this goes through, Diane, there is still a way for people to technically try and access the app, for instance, through virtual private networks. When I was living in China, where a whole slew of apps are banned, including, ironically, TikTok and Facebook, Google, Instagram, etc., people could technically still access these banned apps through virtual private networks. So this will be a long road to get there. But even when it does get there, there could be ways around it. Now, the Senate is expected to take this up tomorrow. The president has already said he'll sign it quickly if it reaches his desk. So what happens to TikTok if it is passed? Yeah, exactly. So I was just walking through what might happen here. So it would take aim at these app stores. So this means that the app store for Google or Apple, if they host the TikTok app after it's banned, well, that means they could be penalized. But again, it could take a very long time to get there. Again, there's this year-long window they have. On top of that, there's the intense lobbying effort. There is the legal challenges, actually finding a buyer. And Diane, also interestingly, there are some fascinating political dynamics here. President Biden has said he supports this legislation. But meanwhile, his campaign is actively using TikTok to try and reach those young voters. And TikTok is, of course, reminding Congress that millions of businesses would be devastated if TikTok were banned. All right, senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, thank you. And the Supreme Court is hearing one of the most significant cases on homelessness ever to reach the justices. Today, the High Court will consider a California ruling that found fining people for sleeping on the streets amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. ABC News senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer has more on the case. Devin? 
Diane, it's the biggest case on homelessness to reach the Supreme Court in more than 40 years. That issue is whether cities can penalize homeless people who sleep outside when they have nowhere else to go. The city of Grants Pass, Oregon, passed an ordinance prohibiting uh, public camping subject to a citation or a fine. A federal appeals court said that amounts to cruel and unusual punishment because the city has no public uh, shelters for those people. The city is now appealing to the justices, asking them them, uh, to be able to enforce the law, which they say would protect public safety. Of course, all of this could have sweeping implications for cities nationwide. They're all dealing now with a surge in homeless encampments. A decision in that case expected by June. But it's not the only big case this week, Diane. On Wednesday, the Supreme Court will, for the first time since overturning Roe v.ersus Wade, take up the scope of Idaho's abortion ban. And on Thursday, the court will hear a case on presidential immunity and whether Donald Trump can face criminal prosecution for his efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Uh, a big week at the court, Diane. Uh, and again, those decisions coming by the end of June, Diane. Watching those closely, senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer, thank you. And let's bring in ABC News legal contributor, former FBI agent Asha Rangappa, for more on this and some of the other major cases expected before the Supreme Court. Asha, this homelessness case is the biggest case in, on this issue in more than 40 years, as Devin said. So what kind of implications could this have depending on the court's ruling? Well, Diane, this can have implications on a number of similar kinds of laws that have been passed over the uh, throughout the country. Now, the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, also prohibits excessive fines. And that's what's central here, that the city is fining people for, quote unquote, camping in within the city. And those fines can reach thousands of dollars. But really, I think the heart of this case is whether the city is criminalizing conduct or the status of the people as homeless. And there's a 1962 Supreme Court case which said that you can't prohibit people based on their, or you can't criminalize people based on their status. For example, for being a drug user, even though you can criminalize their conduct, like buying and selling drugs. And the challengers here say, look, these people have no other alternative, so they're effectively being criminalized for being homeless. Of course, the city is saying, we're just prohibiting camping. Um, and so one thing that this might turn on is whether there needs to be an individualized inquiry into each person's situation to see whether they're doing this voluntarily or not. But this could have major implications for a number of cities. Now, Asha, on Wednesday, the court will consider an abortion ban in Idaho and whether hospitals have to provide access to the procedure when a woman's health is at risk. What sticks out to you in terms of how this case made it to the Supreme Court and what are you watching for now? Well, I think that we're in a situation where we're going to see the impact of Dobbs um, in all of these different uh, abortion restrictions throughout the country. Um, so I think that what I'm looking for is really the line of questioning that the justices are going to have uh, in terms of how they are going to, you know, I don't want to say split the baby, but kind of uh, draw some lines um, in uh, their opening of allowing states to create all of these blanket restrictions. All right, ABC News legal contributor Asha Rangappa. Asha, thank you. We'll be right back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 
our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Mazatlan, Mexico, I'm Matt Rivers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping... Make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. Welcome back to ABC News Live. The defense is now up in the opening statements in the trial against former President Trump. The historic hush money trial is the first time ever prosecutors are presenting a criminal case against a former president before a jury. The prosecution has outlined it, their case, calling it a criminal conspiracy and election fraud. The judge emphasized to the jury that the burden of proof rests on the prosecutors telling jurors they should presume Trump is innocent and, quote, if you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. And Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Let's get an update now from ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci. John, the defense is up now, so the prosecution has now laid out their case. What do you make of it so far? So let's talk first about the prosecution. So prosecutors really went through basically all the hot button issues that can and will come up throughout this week's long trial. They talked about Access Hollywood. They talked about Michael Cohen, which is the reason that this case has all gone underway. And in one of the things that they did quite well is say, listen, we know Michael Cohen is a criminal, but Michael Cohen did these things at behest of his boss, who at the time was Donald Trump, and a conversations and dialogue that began leading up to the 2016 campaign, which is why prosecutors are saying this whole case boils down to election interference. Now, as soon as prosecutors concluded their nearly hour-long presentation, defense attorney Todd Blanche, Diane, got right up, according to our team, to the podium and said President Trump is innocent. And one of the things he said that was actually quite interesting, and I think, again, in part playing to the audience of one, Todd Blanche said, in court, I'm going to refer to him as President Trump because he earned that title. That's a big distinction between the prosecutors and the defense, right? Because so often they've just referred to him as Donald Trump, Mr. Trump. But you see the defense side trying to, again, insert the politics mm. into that. It's very subtle, it's little, but nevertheless important. One of the other things they talked about as part of their opening statements, and they're still going through it, is attacking Michael Cohen. They're going to do that repeatedly, trying to destroy the credibility of all the prosecutor's witnesses. Now, the assistant district attorney got up there and said this was election fraud, pure and simple. How do you expect the defense to counter that. Well, one of the things they're going to say, and we talked about this a little earlier today, is that these were business transactions. This is something that infamous, famous people do all the time. They have the stories or things that are embarrassing. They make people sign NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. In their eyes, it's a routine business practice, and you cover those up so they don't get out as saying they're legal fees or legal consultations or whatever you want to code them as. The problem, though, is that most people are not running to be the leader of the free world, which is exactly what Donald Trump was doing when this happened. And part of what prosecutors are going to do to counter that argument is say this happened repeatedly 
during the 2016 election. It happened with Stormy Daniels, who is this case is about. It happened with Karen McDougal, another woman that Donald Trump had a relationship with. And it happened with a former doorman that also knew some alleged damaging information about the former president. So that is how this is different than other times. All right. John Santucci, well, I know you're keeping updated. Rapid. <laughs> Sources in the courtroom constantly getting those messages. We appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Diane. And we, of course, will continue to have coverage of this historic case all day against opening statements are underway in that historic criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. We'll have more on that right after the break. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag is not okay, is it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You Watch do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. Let's get straight to our top story. The defense is now turning in op giving opening statements in the historic criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. Uh, the prosecution outlined its case, saying this is about a criminal conspiracy. The judge, meanwhile, emphasized that the burden of proof rests on the prosecutors, telling jurors they should presume Trump is innocent and, quote, if you're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find the defendant guilty. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election, sources tell the district attorney's office plans to call former National Enquirer publisher and a longtime friend of Trump, David Pecker, as its first witness. So let's bring in ABC News editorial producer John Santucci, senior reporter Catherine Falders, legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. John, Todd Blanche, Trump's mm -hmm. attorney, is yep. now giving the defense as part of these opening statements. What sticks out to you so far from what we've heard in the courtroom to what the prosecution said and now Todd's response? So I think this idea that right away, and not too surprising, but nevertheless still striking to hear these words, Donald Trump is innocent, President Trump is innocent, was what Todd Blanche said in court, according to our team. It, it just gets right to the heart of the, you know, they've got to very quickly start drawing lines here into this case. Um, you know, one of the things that they're going to be starting to do as we learn more, and Catherine could speak better this through, through her reporting than I can, is that, you know, they're going to move aggressively, Team Trump, to start attacking some of the witnesses here in their opening statements. And in part, because A, that's what you do, but also because prosecutors during their opening statements sort of got ahead of it, right? Saying that, you know, we know Michael Cohen's a criminal. You're going to hear about this. But the reality is that Michael Cohen at the time was Donald Trump's employee was a part of Team Trump, was a member of the legal team, did these things at Donald Trump's behest and carried out a crime at his direction. Uh, Catherine, the prosecution in its opening statements also told the jury, you're going to be hearing a lot about Michael Cohen. Why the prep there? 
Uh, well, look, Michael Cohen, as John was mentioning, is a key witness here. He's perhaps the only witness that can testify to Trump's intent here. But prosecutors already know what the defense is going to do, which is really to undermine Michael Cohen's credibility. And they got ahead of that, prosecutors, a little bit in their opening statement. And I'm quoting here, uh, the prosecutor said the defense, quote, will go to great lengths to convince the jury that Cohen's not credible. They also said they acknowledge that he lied, for example. They say that his testimony will be backed up by testimony from other witnesses. Uh, but they do say that he has a criminal record, that he lied to protect the boss. And that is going to be central to the defense's strategy here. Is this the only witness that you have who could possibly speak to this? And if it is, well, he lied previously. So how can you possibly find him credible? He will be a key witness. He will be central. You'll be hearing a lot about him throughout the opening statements, throughout the witness testimony, and as this trial goes on. Bren, the prosecution called this a criminal conspiracy, saying that's what's at the heart of this case. They called it election fraud, pure and simple. What do they now have to do in order to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt? So 34 different counts, and it's a, a little bit difficult to, to describe, but they don't actually have to prove that this is a criminal conspiracy or election fraud beyond a reasonable doubt. What they have to prove is that that is why uh, Donald Trump led himself to falsifying business records in the first degree. The elements of those crimes, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And the elements of that crime is that he committed the crime of falsifying business record by deleting, omitting, altering, whatever the long list of it is in that penal law code, uh, documents in his business records, and that he did so with the intent of fraud and that includes an intent to commit a crime uh, or another crime specifically or aid and abet in that crime. And improving it beyond a reasonable doubt, that's being the highest standard we have in this country in any court, they have to basically show that it all but sure that he committed these crimes. Hmm. John, what are you hearing in terms of Trump's demeanor in the courtroom? How is he handling all of this, particularly with the details? Some of these allegations, pretty tawdry, coming out in court while he has to sit there. Well, well just, just if I can make one quick pivot, just this line from Todd Blanche. It, just, it literally just caught my attention as we're talking. Todd Blanche, as he's going through his opening statements, says that, quote, there is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. That's just such a very striking line, given everything that Donald Trump is accused of not just in this courtroom but in other proceedings right now especially on the federal level and down in fulton county georgia related to another election mm -hmm. but ba back to your question i apologize but it just caught my eye no, that's fine. um you know i think that donald trump right now is having a very tough time controlling himself you know olivia rubin had the best description earlier about donald trump shaking his head i can tell you as somebody that has seen donald trump shake his head because he's gotten mad at me once or 20 times in my life it's not a very subtle thing, right? Donald Trump is not one to be subtle ever in his life. So Donald Trump having any type of reaction, right? You know, shaking his head, writing notes, hitting his lawyer, all of which our team is seeing, mm -hmm. that means the jurors are seeing it too. And Donald Trump really does need to have discipline in these moments because if he's just reacting like this to prosecutors speaking about him, we know based off the fact that we've already seen this in other courtrooms, Diane, Michael Cohen has, and Donald Trump have a horrible relationship now. They were best of friends at one point, inseparable. Michael Cohen once said that he would take a bullet for Donald Trump, described himself as Trump's pit bull. Donald Trump having to sit there as the once loyal pit bull is going to attack and destroy everything that Donald Trump has worked to build is going to be something that Donald Trump is not, I know, not going to be able to sit there stone-faced for. But he has to find a way to because any reaction, any vibe, body language alone could impact it. Uh, Brian, how careful uh, do Trump's attorneys have to be here in what they say in this case, given he is facing several other criminal cases as well? I mean, I'm playing catch up from what you're just reading. They have to be very careful, but it doesn't seem like they are being careful. I, I mean, when, when you look at a, a criminal defense, right, what I've learned and what I've practiced myself is you attack the elements of the crime. You, you say, okay, there was no intent to defraud. What is Donald Trump defrauding by writing his own personal documents? That's one way of going about it. You could say the, the star witness you have is, is not credible. You can't trust this person based on the evidence that they're coming forward with. You could say the investigation was sloppy based on the prosecutor or law enforcement who was involved. But this doesn't seem like a careful defense of an individual. This seems to just be the reiteration of what Donald Trump has said on, on the campaign trail outside, of course. It seems less of a legal defense and more of a, can you believe they're doing this? And so I'm trying to parse through it as I'm reading it that, to say, 
they should be careful, but I'm not quite seeing it just yet. But can I ask you a question? If you, if you don't mind, we're just all reading these notes. I mean, this might as well be the John I mean, Santucci well, show at this point, well, so I've, go for it. <laughs> I know you don't mean that as a joke, guys. I'm going to watch myself. But I, I do think one of the things they're making this argument here, because we're both reading the same feed from our team, they're trying to say here that Michael Cohen was paid $130,000 for Stormy Daniels, but in the same time frame total, he was paid out $420,000 because he was the attorney, and the attorney was doing multiple acts of legal work. This was all part of legal work. Does that... You, you know, yeah. Yeah, but John, and they also say that Bland reportedly iterated that Cohen was truly his attorney, that even his email signature said that he's his attorney. When I email you to be like, hey, do you want to go to the Central Park with our kids together? I'm not doing legal work there. Right. And, and if I buy popcorn for our kids and you pay me back, that's not legal work. Your email signature and the way that you operate, no, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Brian, there is another line, though, that I wanted to ask you about. And uh, Todd Blanche said, you know, he's not just our former president. He's not just the Donald Trump that you see on TV. He's a man. He's a father. Mm. He's a husband. How much of that is going to come into this case. The defense trying to remind the jury that despite the Donald Trump that you know, he has a family to go home to after this. He's a human being. It's a very big part. It's a way of persuading people in an argument. You, you think of it uh, from the standpoint of you humanize your client, you argue the logical arguments, and you also argue the ethical arguments. And we learned it in law school. It's Aristotle's ways of persuasion. And that's a thing that we all do. You, if you can humanize the character, and even he says, would a frugal businessman that is yeah. Donald Trump pay back this in this way? If you can make it that the personality of the individual doesn't match that of the crime, it's a very strong position to take and a very a strong argument. That, I think, is more loyal than what I'm seeing the other aspects of this opening statement. Uh, Catherine, we're hearing that David Pecker will be the first witness called by the prosecution. He was the publisher of the National Enquirer and a longtime friend of Donald Trump's. What are you watching for there? Well, I think a lot, of course, how prosecutors bring him in. They say he was the eyes and ears to, you know, multiple meetings uh, and, and payments, for example. One of our colleagues, Diane, actually uh, reminded us, too, about what former President Trump has said about Pecker in the past. And there's some of these uh, tweets where Trump has called, he said, this guy's a personal friend of mine uh, multiple times and has called out his magazine. He said, Time magazine should have named David Pecker of American media to be its top guy, but they are not smart enough uh, to do that. That's what he said about Time magazine in 2013. So a lot of Trump's previous comments here, I'm curious, obviously, how uh, the defense cross-examines him, Trump's reaction. Of course, we're talking about Trump's reaction, his body language while he's sitting inside that courtroom, uh, what happens there, and, and if any of his previous comments about uh, Pecker are brought up at all. I think that he's a fascinating witness for lots of reasons. Who knows, um, looking at the time, and I know court isn't in session for much longer, who knows if they will get to him today, but he's likely... Uh, to be a topic of conversation this whole week as he is on the stand, and, and the defense will probably cross-examine him later this week, Diane. Yeah, court expected to be cut short because one of the jurors has a toothache and has to go to the dentist. So another reminder, all real people involved here, and anything can happen. John Santucci, Catherine Falders, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. And we will be following this trial all day long. Opening statements underway right now in that historic hush money trial against former President Trump. We'll keep you updated right here on ABC News Live. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. In rolling for this tornado tore through this town. From Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. From the scene of that deadly missile strike. ABC News Live everywhere. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah! 2024 campaign trail here at 10 Downing Street. Wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember...
that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. I'll make a dollar line. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. You guys don't know what happened that day. The day that my son died. 911. The cut fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. Did that told us to complete you. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Welcome back to ABC News Live. The defense is now up in the opening statements against former President Trump. The historic hush money trial is the first time ever prosecutors are presenting a criminal case against a former president before a jury. Now, the prosecution outlined its case, saying this is about a criminal conspiracy and calling it election fraud. And Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. And his defense started their opening statements with a very clear statement that Donald Trump is innocent. Let's get the latest now from ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci. Uh, John, what do you make of what we're seeing in opening statements so far? Well, so far, defense attorney Todd Blanche, according to our team, a little more of a relaxed approach compared to prosecutors, uh, saying at one point, quote, there is nothing illegal about entering into a non-disclosure agreement, of course, referring to the agreement that Donald Trump, Michael Cohen entered with, along with David Pecker into that agreement with Stormy Daniels to catch and kill her story. Um, what they also have talked about a uh, great length is that how Donald Trump didn't get into the minutia of his company. Though he was the head, the president of the Trump Organization before President of the United States, that so much of the bookkeeping and all of those you know, little details that other people got into, Donald Trump did not. He was the boss. He was all the way at the top of the food chain. So any idea of how an expense or things were labeled as far as legal services to Michael Cohen in the log of the business was not something Donald Trump, according to them, was privy to. Uh, so, John, how, how much of a back and forth are we going to see here in terms of the prosecution trying to prove what they say is election fraud and Todd Blanche saying, you know, this is just another NDA like a lot of people use? It's going to be a lot of this, right? Because what Donald Trump's team has to prepare for is that so much of their case is going to be tearing down the witnesses that come in to say, no, this was because of an election. We had conversations months before Stormy Daniels that, hey, we know there's issues Donald Trump has, damaging stories that could impact the election. So let's get David Pecker involved to catch them, kill them, pay these people off, and make the stories go away. Now, on the flip side, as I just spoke about, that is where the Trump defense has to be, look, it's a normal business procedure. We have done this countless times before. It was a normal day in the office. All right, and I know David Picker is expected to be the first yep. witness called by the prosecution. We'll be watching that, but of course that'll come after opening statements. John Santucci, thank you. And we will be following this trial all day long as the defense is now giving their side of opening statements in that criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. We'll keep you updated right here on ABC News Live. Coming up, you've heard of spaceships before, but how about an Earth ship? On this Earth Day, Ginger Z is giving us a first-hand look at what it's like to live in a totally sustainable home right after the break.
what does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Heating, cooling, and powering buildings creates more greenhouse gas emissions than anything else in the U.S. Construction and demolition also creates more than 500 million tons of debris each year. But things can be done differently. As part of our series, The Power of Us, ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z takes a look inside an Earth ship in New Mexico, one of more than 100 so-called living vessels built into the Earth, not connected to any water or electricity. Take a look. This is my routine in the morning. At first glance, Mike Reynolds' morning probably doesn't look much different than many of ours. This water was rain. But he doesn't live in a typical house. He lives in something different. This is an Earth ship. A home built into the earth, made from trash, concrete, and dirt. It is fully self-sustaining. I imagine that everybody on the planet can wake up in the morning and be comfortable without fossil fuel. Everybody can grow food in their house, that everybody can have electricity from the sun and wind. These buildings do that. Look closely at the magnificent architecture. It's mostly upcycled trash. That beer bottle there, that's not garbage. That's a glass bottle that will turn into a stained glass brick. They have timers to save energy on hot water. You've got a washer and dryer, all the niceties of you life. You've got a washer and dryer, you've got a cook stove, you've got a refrigerator, hot and cold running water. It's just done smarter, like the rainwater used four times. So I'm using five gallons or you know three gallons of water to take a shower. That same three gallons of water waters my banana trees and my tomatoes. That same three gallons of water is recollected 
to flush the toilet. They have solar, but not for heat or AC. Earthships heat themselves with used tires. Each tire gets about four or five wheelbarrows of dirt pounded into them. And the sun comes in and it heats that mass. Mm -hmm. And then the tire retains it. And as the temperature in here were to drop, that heat would be released. Mm -hmm. We tested out the tire wall, living in an Earthship for three days. The house itself is 5,400 square feet, and 2,000 of it is dedicated to growing space. And in this house, there's two ponds in the greenhouse, mm -hmm. and we have tilapia out there. And then you could catch a fish, pick your citrus, wrap it in a banana leaf, and grill it out on the fire. Our Earthship has a wood-burning fire, but we did not keep the fire stoked. So we're going to go for the night without supplemental heat. Good morning. First night, down, and I slept pretty well, so I was definitely warm, and I guess that's what counts. An obvious part of living in an Earthship is return things to nature. Leftover coffee going in the compost. But if there had to be one thing from Earthships that we could apply to homes across America, what would be the most important? You can add a greenhouse on the south side of your house and that will heat those rooms that are near that. You can become aware of the fact that heat comes from that thing, and you can catch that heat. Back in New York, I'm taking Mike's advice. I love to garden, but our season in New York is really short. So it's not an earth ship, but there are plenty of these kind of smaller greenhouses that you can invest in and extend your season, be a little closer to earth. There are more than 100 earth ships near Taos, but Mike says we need more. I mean, the solutions are the way forward on this planet is going to have to be extreme. There are at least one Earthship in each state, and so they work in other places. You know, the base model uh, that starts at $400,000 for a two-bedroom, two-bathroom, and it really is less sacrifice than you can imagine. We enjoyed it so thoroughly, so much so that when I got home, Diane, my husband, was like, we're not going to really live in an Earthship, are we? And I was like, well, we might get close. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine Ben's face and your look incredibly serious thinking about it. Um, yes. But Ginger, can you give us a, a tour and show us how some of these key features yeah. work in practice? Yes. So, you know, it's so cold. It was freezing this morning and you're inside and you're like, okay, so the, the tire wall's working. There's a thermal mass, but they also utilize things like beautiful drapes to be insulation. So, you know, pretty can also be functional. And then living with your food, you know, it's pesticide free. You know that you can enjoy it and live with your plants. You have washer dryer and the water from that and the water from your showers goes into the drain. From that drain, it is filtered and then goes into the planters, which are in every room. The plants then filter the water again, and then the water goes into the toilet before the toilet puts it out through a septic here into a black water area that they utilize for other plantings. It is so different, but yet so simple, and I feel like conventional building, Diane, should really take note because something like that water efficiency could be used in many more places than just here in New Mexico. Well, and that's kind of my question, Ginger, as I watch this, I think, why don't all homes work that way? So I know Mike referenced the greenhouse. I love the idea <laughs> of the glass cabinet. But are there more features of the Earthship that could be either added to traditional homes or built into new ones? Yes, I mean, the geothermal aspect of it, we used to do it. If you think of Laura Ingalls and Little House on the Prairie, there was a reason that we used to do that, but also just the orientation of a building. We have gotten so far away from using the sun and then blocking the sun when it should be that depending on where you live, we got more into like facing the street. Why do our front doors all face the way? Same way. Why do we have to do that rather than working with the sun and using it for what it is? And that's beyond just solar, right? Like that's just thermal mass and how things work. Work, like the physics of a house we have gotten not so smart about. And that's what Earthships remind us to do. So interesting and so beautiful at that. ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z. Such a fascinating story. Thank you, Ginger. You're welcome. Thank you. And you can see more of Ginger's reporting tonight on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, analysis, and architecture ideas. We'll be right back.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. I'm Wade Johnson reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from the... Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Macedo, let's get straight to our top story. Opening statements have just ended in the historic criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. Trump's attorney Todd Blanche started his statement by bluntly telling the jury the former president is innocent, later adding, quote, there's nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. The prosecution says the case is about a criminal conspiracy and, quote, election fraud pure and simple. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Let's bring in ABC News editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News political director Rick Klein, and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for for more on this. Uh, John, what's the latest from the courtroom? Well, waiting, quite actually, because we went on a quick little break after opening statements were completed by both prosecutors and defense, Diane. The day is getting cut short because of a personal matter involving one of the alternate jurors. So we've only got 30 minutes left of today's proceedings. So in theory, they could get started with their first witness being David Pecker by prosecutors. We're waiting to see um, if that actually does happen. So far, I think the biggest takeaways um, from opening statements made by both the prosecutors and Donald Trump's defense team, um, you know, boils down to two different arguments, right? From the prosecutor's standpoint, this is election interference. The behavior of Donald Trump, you know, is something that was well known, both NDAs and the way he he spoke about women. They referenced the infamous Access Hollywood tape that came out just weeks before the 2016 election. And on the flip side of things, um, it, it's it's the pro the Trump legal team that's making this argument of look, this is normal business procedure. NDAs, everybody uses them. Second. Donald Trump and Michael Cohen had a long-standing relationship as his attorney. He was advised by his attorney. He was paid back for that and other services he did for Donald Trump as an attorney. So I think the other thing that we're going to hear a lot of throughout all of these proceedings from both sides is two words, Michael Cohen. Uh, and let's go to that, Brian, because the defense didn't waste any time here talking about Michael Cohen, Trump's former attorney who made this alleged hush money payment, saying toward the end of opening statements, Michael Cohen is obsessed with Donald Trump. He cannot be trusted. The prosecution also, in their opening statements, there's a former President Trump live uh, walking back into that courtroom. Uh, Brian, it, the prosecution also prepped the jury here saying you're going to hear a lot about Michael Cohen. What do you make about that and the level 
of focus on Michael Cohen just in these opening statements. So this is what I think. I think both sides are zeroing in on an element, a very important element of this crime, when with the intent to defraud. And that's going to be a big aspect here because of all the witnesses, Michael Cohen is the one that I believe can focus in on the intent aspect. He can talk about what Donald Trump allegedly sent to him as to why he was implementing this catch and kill program. And if Michael Cohen okay. cannot be believed, then the whole case falls apart. And we're listening to one of he former President Trump's attorneys speaking today. now outside the courtroom. Let's he listen. He should not even be here today because he did nothing wrong. It is the epitome of a witch hunt. I just left where a judge asked us whether our cash, cash bond, cash sitting in. Ms. James wanted to argue and say that our cash somehow isn't green enough. We wasted time. The judge made a comment saying he thought that money market accounts could go down under the amount. He doesn't even understand basic principles of finance. But this was the man that decided that we owed money and my client committed fraud. We are going to attack every single one. One hour, the attorney general and that judge realized quickly that they had no idea what they were talking about. We came to an agreement that everything would be the same. We would modify terms, and that was it. This is where your taxpayer dollars are going, America. Right here. Witch hunt after witch hunt. President Trump's company was worth more in that case than it is now. And now what? We're here because of something that happened when he was in the White House that wasn't even wrong. It was not wrong. You hire lawyers to solve problems, so you solve those problems, you pay them. That's it. This is a joke. It's an affront to the American Constitution. It's an affront to our judicial system. And it's an affront to every lawyer that cares about their license, that cares about what is right and wrong. I am sick of coming in front of the press and saying this, but you have to because you people need to understand what is going on. God forbid you put an accounting thing in for legal counsel. It's legal counsel. And now our taxpayer dollars, my time, our attorney's fees. Former President Trump's attorney there, Alina Haba, uh, talking outside the courtroom where opening statements have just wrapped in the hush money trial against the former president. Uh, we heard Haba there talking about a different a uh, case against the former president also playing out in New York today, talking about that civil fraud suit and questions now about the bond that former President Trump posted in that case. Uh, John, I, I want to bring in and let's go over to our editorial producer, John Santucci, yeah. just to sort of catch up what's happening, because it's interesting to have these two cases playing out just a block away from the, the, each other. There are literally two things happening at the same time, Diane, which is just remarkable right now in court. So first, let's start what's happening in that criminal courtroom with less than a half hour to go in today's proceedings. Prosecutors have just called their first witness, David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, to the stand, the one who they say was working with Donald Trump and Michael Cohen to build out the catch and kill scheme. Mm -hmm. So that's really going to start to build their case with very little time. So obviously he's going to come back to the stand tomorrow. But nevertheless, it just shows the speed to which Judge Mershon is moving these proceedings with the fact that openings are done. We're already on the first witness for prosecutors. So that's the criminal case. On the New York Attorney General's case, which was also, as you noted, happening today, there was an argument by prosecutor, uh, I'm sorry, attorneys for the New York Attorney General that there were some concern and issues with the bond company that eventually stepped up and met Donald Trump at the $175 million bond he had to put up in that case. Now, it seems as though for now, Donald Trump's legal team was successful in stopping the bleeding in that case. They met several conditions that the New York Attorney General's team wanted to basically have stipulations as this goes forward. So that's sort of a thing that for the moment we have to sort of see if those conditions are met. The judge gave them several days to do so. My honest interpretation of that, I feel like that's going to basically go their way for now. Now we have to remember that that's bond for now. Donald Trump is still on the hook for the entire nearly half a billion dollar ruling that came down from that judge earlier this year. Of course that ruling is being appealed by Donald Trump, so not yet clear when he'd actually have to pay up if the order is stayed, so we'll have to wait and see there. All right, and Brian, I want to take us back now to the criminal hush money trial that we've been following all morning. Opening statements are now done. The prosecution just called David Pecker to the witness stand. He's the publisher of the National Choir, a longtime friend of former President Trump, and accused in this catch and kill scheme essentially of agreeing to be eyes and ears for Donald Trump once he decided to run for office to seek out negative stories against the president, against the former president, then candidate Trump, and essentially make them go away, often by paying people off. How much does this testimony 
weigh into the larger case at hand here? It's the it's what we call legally the foundation, and from there you build. That I am the one who, with Donald Trump, if you're believing in testimony, built the foundation of this catch and kill scheme. And then from there, you're just building up from the proverbial home of, okay, there's the foundation. Okay, what do we do? We caught this story, and then they're going to go into the details of this one story, and then how they are able to then kill that story based on payments. And then ultimately, they'll come to the Stormy Daniels story, and they'll do the same thing, and they'll just keep showing how this catch and kill scheme uh, worked throughout this process. Then they'll get to the actual crime that the, the prosecutors are trying to prove in this case, mm -hmm. that being the cover-up, that here is the, the scheme, here is the cover-up, this is, and hopefully we'll see an underlying crime as to why it's a, it's a felony, and an explanation as to how these charges fit, and then that will be the prosecutor trying to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. You, you sort of touched on my next question, but why is it so important for them to show that David Pecker is alleged to have been involved in, in a, a payment to Karen McDougal, a payment to a doorman who had some disparaging information against former President Trump that ended up uh, apparently not panning out. Mm -hmm. Why do they need to show that since those instances are not at the heart of this case, which is the payment to Stormy Daniels? It's not necessarily that they need to, but it definitely strengthens their case that much more. Uh, they could go straight to it and be a very boring case of here are Stormy Daniels, here is Michael Cohen, here are the elements of the crime, and then done. But their ability to to have prosecutorial discretion and to prosecute a case in the manner in which they uh, want in the way that the law allows them to, it's build this whole scheme, show how this whole entity, this enterprise operated, and so that it creates a less of an ability for the defense to pull coals in. Because if they just came forward with just Stormy Daniels' story, mm -hmm. a defense attorney like myself would come and be like, well, no, this is just a run-of-the-mill payoff. There was no scheme. There was no multiple instances of this happening, and then this is just a legal expense. And so I think for the prosecutor, they're trying to build an ironclad case with the multiple uh, catch-and-kill schemes that they're saying Donald Trump participated in. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick, the judge also ruled today that if Trump does decide to take the stand here, that he can be asked about previous cases. So that leaves him a bit more vulnerable than maybe previously thought if he does choose to take the stand. It's something attorneys may advise him against because of that. But politically, what does he have to consider in this decision of whether or not to testify in his own defense? Well, first, I never thought he was going to take the stand in this case. He has said, um, he said to reporters about a week and a half ago that he'd be glad to do it. I remember him saying the same about the Mueller probe. And, like, look, I, I think he, he, he answers yes to that. Maybe he personally would like to, but as Brian and others have been pointing out all morning, it would be a bad uh, legal move to, to take the stand. I'd also argue that it's a bad political move because you have a big potential. To, uh, you're not on camera. You have a big potential of getting yourself in further legal jeopardy, of contradicting something that's said outside. Just and his facial expressions would be, would be analyzed without him having having the benefit of, uh, of having them broadcast all over the place, he can go outside and talk as much as he wants, and he will continue to do that and has continued to do that. So I think this makes it a little less likely that, uh, that something that was not likely to happen uh, would, ever, would ever come to pass. I don't think he's going to take the stand. And, John, what are you hearing about uh, Trump's demeanor inside the courtroom so far? And how do you think Trump's team is going to feel about day one so far? Well, well so, so far from the demeanor, um, a lot of passing notes is what our team is, is reporting right now. Um, leaning in, you know, tapping his lawyers. Obviously, we talked earlier about shaking his head. What I do think is interesting and talks a little bit about what we were discussing earlier when you were asking me about family or others joining, mm -hmm. um, it seems as though the legal team that was arguing the New York Attorney General's case, which was just a few blocks away from where they are right now, has joined Donald Trump in courtroom. We saw Alina Haba, obviously another member of his legal team that was working on that case. I'm told that Alan Garten, who's chief counsel to the Trump Organization, is now in there with them. And that plays into that conversation the three of us were having a little earlier. Those are people that are a little more familiar to Donald Trump. Alan Garten has worked for Donald Trump for nearly two decades. Uh, Alina Haba has been with him for the last several years. There are a little more familiar faces that I think in those moments of trying to keep him calm, because especially right now, this is really important in the sense that David Pecker was a longtime friend of Donald Trump's, wasn't a business associate, wasn't somebody you randomly saw when you went to go play golf out in Bedminster. This is someone that they've had a long time friendship. To think that someone that is your friend, that helped you out, is getting up there on a stand to divulge all about your personal life, these are all going to be very difficult witnesses for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. let's be clear. But this is one, it's not like Michael Cohen right, where somebody has been so outward publicly facing attacking you, Pecker has not said a thing about Donald Trump in the last eight plus years. Today he's going to say a lot. Uh, Brian, what do you think are the next steps here? 
So the next steps, based on the schedule, I think they're done at like 12.30 today. So Pecker's going to be on the stand. I don't think his direct examination is going to end. And so he'll ultimately have to come back uh, tomorrow. The direct examination ends sometimes tomorrow morning, afternoon, then cross-examination. And then it's up to the prosecution to pick their next witness. And from my understanding, they'll probably go in that similar direction of they go from the foundation, they build up. So whoever Pecker then tapped in terms of getting that next story and how they caught that story, a witness will be able to testify to that. And then the next witness or the same witness will be able to talk about how that story was killed and ultimately paid and then logged. And then we'll go from one story to the next and ultimately go to Sterling Daniels and Michael Cohen to try to tie this all together. The big thing for me, though, is how these cross-examinations going to go because we can kind of gauge where the direct examinations are going to yeah. go. How is the defense going to poke the holes here? And we've already got a bit of a roadmap from the opening statements. Well, I was going to ask you that. What do you think the opening statements revealed in terms of where that is going? Uh, well, we understand what democracy is in the eyes of Donald Trump, and that is influencing, or at least his attorneys, probably more accurate to say, and that is the ability to influence an election. But also right. it comes down to credibility, which I think is a major aspect of this case. Will you believe Stormy Daniels, uh, who got paid for her silence, who has a potential book deal and other financial incentives, and I'm sure the defense will weave that into a narrative as to why not to believe them. Yep. And then Michael Cohen as well. There is a very clear uh, guideline here, and defense, we, there's a, a jury charge. It's, it's Latin. It's, it basically translates to false in one thing, false in all things. And if you can get Michael Cohen up there and prove that he was false in one thing and get a jury to decide that he could throw out his entire testimony, it's a big win for Donald Trump, and I don't think the win here is an acquittal. I think the win here is a hung jury, and that would be massive for Donald Trump if he could do that. I don't think it's that far off. John, I see you shaking your head. Well, I think this the one point. Or nodding, that, I should. And, say. No, nodding. I, Donald Trump shook his head. I know, <laughs> but you know, I think the, the the point that Brian made, which is important, and it's something that prosecutors just said in court, is that you mentioned Stormy Daniels and her book. Michael Cohen wrote a book. Michael Cohen is a podcast. And one of the things that the defense team is going to say is that, and, and they say this in court already in their opening, is that Michael Cohen is obsessed with Donald Trump. His livelihood is built on tearing Donald Trump down. And they do have enough you know, things that Michael Cohen has said and done, published a book, podcast, et cetera, that would support that, right? He's also been a part of multiple legal cases involving the former president. I mean, he was, you know, today they were going through motions on it, but he was called to testify as part of the New York Attorney General's case. Here he is again. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side of that, if you're a prosecutor, it's because he was his lawyer. He was involved in everything. I mean, Donald Trump would call Michael Cohen the fixer, right? Something needed fixing that was a little not within a courtroom bounds. Call Michael. He'll deal with it. I mean, the amount of times I heard Donald Trump say, oh, just call Michael. He'll fix it. That's the relationship they had. The problem is that where we got to today is that part of that relationship crossed the line. Rick, how much do voters care about any of this? It's unclear. I mean, look, uh, we, we haven't seen it play out in as public a fashion as it has so far. We've seen polling suggest that people don't seem to think that the circumstances around the Stormy Daniels hush money case, that the, 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 the central tenets of this criminal case are necessarily criminal. But we have seen people say that if Donald Trump's convicted, they're less likely to vote for him. So both things can be true, and we'll have to see how it plays out. I don't think we can underestimate what it means to have wall-to-wall -wall coverage that examines Donald Trump's personal life in, in, uh, in, in in, in minute and often very awkward detail. I don't think we can underestimate what it means for Donald Trump's own activities, his own actions outside the courtroom uh, as a result of this. It's given him a new platform, for instance, to, to repeat false claims about the last election. Uh, and I also don't think that we can underestimate what it means simply to have him in a courtroom for this much time, not being in control of his surroundings. This is not what we're used to with Donald Trump. This is a different kind of news cycle that he's dominating. It is not happening on his own terms. Brian, David Pecker's on the stand now. What do you think prosecutors need to hear from him or are trying to get out of him? Those initial conversations. What we need to do is get a glimpse of the prosecutor. Uh, the prosecutor needs to get a glimpse into Donald Trump's mindset at that time when that agreement was, was, was built. What's the purpose of this catch and kill scheme? If I'm a defense attorney, I would say, hey, I'm running for public office. I'm Donald Trump. I'm a multimillionaire. I'm trying to protect my family from negative news. Are, they, are the defense going to be able to kind of shift that narrative towards that on cross-examination? Or the prosecutor's going to be able to hold firm and say, like, no, this was completely about bad press and winning the election. This was about killing stories. This was about trying to defraud the public. The theme that underlines um, why this is being done is going to be massive for either side to win. All right, John Santucci, Rick Klein, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all. And we will Thanks. be following this trial all day long. We'll bring you updates right here on ABC News Live. We'll be right back. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here's to Good Mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping... Make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not okay, ain't it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You Watch do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. House Speaker Mike Johnson appears to be gaining new support from across the aisle after putting his job on the line to push through a $95 billion foreign aid package. Some hard right Republicans opposed to the package are threatening to force a vote to remove Johnson as Speaker of the House. Now a top Republican and progressive Democrat are praising the Speaker, suggesting he'll be able to hold on to his job even if it does come to a vote. Now that massive foreign aid package is headed to the Senate and it also includes a bill that could potentially ban TikTok in the U.S. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang joins me now from Capitol Hill for more on that. So, uh, Selena, talk to me about the TikTok bill that's part of this package. It gives Chinese-owned ByteDance a year to sell TikTok or face a nationwide ban. How significant is that, and how could that impact the many concrete, uh, content creators and more than 170 million TikTok users? Yeah, Diane, so this has been gaining a lot of momentum in Congress over national security concerns of TikTok with fears that American data, private data, could end up in the hands of the Chinese government. That is something that TikTok vehemently denies. They say their data is secure, and that has never happened. Now, as you say, this legislation would give TikTok about a year to try and find a buyer 
for ByteDance to try and find a buyer for TikTok. Otherwise, it would face a ban in the U.S. But look, it's a long road to get there. This will face legal challenges. TikTok says they're going to fight this in the court, saying it violates the First Amendment. And on top of that, Diane, it would be very hard to find a buyer. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars here. There are not many companies, not many buyers who can afford that. And on top of that, there could be these anti-monopoly concerns. So even if TikTok is banned and all of this goes through, Diane, there is still a way for people to technically try and access the app, for instance, through virtual private networks. When I was living in China, where a whole slew of apps are banned, including, ironically, TikTok and Facebook, Google, Instagram, etc., people could technically still access these banned apps through virtual private networks. So this will be a long road to get there. But even when it does get there, there could be ways around it. Now, the Senate is expected to take this up tomorrow. The president has already said he'll sign it quickly if it reaches his desk. So what happens to TikTok if it is passed? Yeah, exactly. So I was just walking through what might happen here. So it would take aim at these app stores. So this means that the app store for Google or Apple, if they host the TikTok app after it's banned, well, that means they could be penalized. But again, it could take a very long time to get there. Again, there's this year-long window they have. On top of that, there's the intense lobbying effort. There is the legal challenges, actually finding a buyer. And Diane, also interestingly, there are some fascinating political dynamics here. President Biden has said he supports this legislation. But meanwhile, his campaign is actively using TikTok to try and reach those young voters. And TikTok is, of course, reminding Congress that millions of businesses would be devastated if TikTok were banned. All right, Senior White House Correspondent Selena Wang, thank you. And the Supreme Court is hearing one of the most significant cases on homelessness ever to reach the justices. Today, the High Court will consider a California ruling that found fining people for sleeping on the streets amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. ABC News senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer has more on the case. Devin? Diane, it's the biggest case on homelessness to reach the Supreme Court in more than 40 years. At issue is whether cities can penalize homeless people who sleep outside when they have nowhere else to go. The city of Grants Pass, Oregon, passed an ordinance prohibiting uh, public camping subject to a citation or a fine. A federal appeals court said that amounts to cruel and unusual punishment because the city has no public uh, shelters for those people. The city is now appealing to the justices, asking them uh, to be able to enforce the law, which they say would protect public safety. Of course, all of this could have sweeping implications for cities nationwide. They're all dealing now with a surge in homeless encampments. A decision in that case expected by June, but it's not the only big case this week, Diane. On Wednesday, the Supreme Court will, for the first time since overturning Roe v.ersus Wade, take up the scope of Idaho's abortion ban. And on Thursday, the court will hear a case on presidential immunity and whether Donald Trump can face criminal prosecution for his efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Uh, a big week at the court, Diane. Uh, and again, those decisions coming by the end of June, Diane. Watching those closely, senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer, thank you. We'll be right back. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know you are. You I do. I you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's ray of sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because you know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. <laughs> Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The truck fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. That told us to complete complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a care, in it? How important it made to USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here, and we got you. Macedo, let's get straight to our top story. Prosecutors have called former National Enquirer editor David Pecker as their first witness in the historic criminal hush money trial against former President Trump. Trump's attorney Todd Blanche started his opening statement today, bluntly telling the jury the former president is innocent, later adding there's nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. The prosecution says the case is about a criminal conspiracy and election fraud, pure and simple. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Let's bring in ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky now outside the courthouse, along with senior investigative correspondent 
excuse me, ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl, Senior Reporter Catherine Falders, Political Director Rick Klein, and former Manhattan Prosecutor Jeremy Saland. Uh, Aaron, I want to start with you. What was it like inside a court today? What did you make of Trump's demeanor? Former President Trump is seated at the defense table, and for most of the day, Diane, he was sort of just hunched in his chair. At, at varying periods, he had his eyes closed. Uh, whether he was uh, paying strict attention to the proceedings, we're not sure. But he did occasionally seem to shake his head ever so slightly no, as if to say when, when prosecutors were saying some unflattering things about him and his alleged participation in what they called this criminal scheme to undermine the 2016 election by concealing the true nature of the hush payment to Stormy Daniels. Uh, when the first witness was called, David Pecker, this is somebody, you know, Pecker said that, that Trump used to be a personal friend. Trump once said that he would make, meaning Pecker, a great editor-in-chief of Time magazine. Th these, these two men were close, and as Pecker took the stand, uh, Trump uh, sort of folded his arms and leaned forward on the defense table with a rather unhappy look on his face. Uh, John Carl, prosecution, uh, the prosecution called David Pecker as their first witness, as expected. Why is he so critical to this case? Well, he establishes the prosecution's case that this was about politics. This was about influencing uh, the 2016 election. Uh, the pivotal moment, as you heard in the opening statements, was a meeting at Trump Tower that David Pecker, Michael Cohen, and Donald Trump had in August of 2015. This is just shortly after uh, Donald Trump has announced his presidential campaign. And they talk about ways that David Pecker can help that campaign using his publication, the National Enquirer, both to push negative stories about Trump's opponents, but also uh, to do this so-called catch-and-kill scheme to uh, uh, suck up stories uh, that would be negative and embarrassing to Donald Trump and to get the people pushing those stories uh, to sign non-disclosure agreements, again, to help Donald Trump. Because allegedly, this case, the key thing for this case is the allegation uh, that the payoff to Storm Stormy Daniels was meant specifically uh, to influence the campaign. Uh, Santucci, Pecker just stepped off the witness stand, yeah. so they're wrapped for the day now. Yeah. What do you make of day one, hearing the, uh, the opening statements and the first witness called, one, just the timing, how quickly this yeah. is moving, but also what you heard in court today? Well, I think, as we talked about earlier, I think as far as prosecutors are concerned, they're going to do everything in their power to make this a case about election interference. That, you know, this was a conversation, dialogue, and an act that happened repeatedly over the course of the 2016 election. And even though, you know, they're saying it's legal fees, they knew exactly what they were doing here. Now, on the flip side for the defense, we knew this was going to happen, but right out of the gate, Donald Trump's legal team came out and took out Michael Cohen, did everything they could to try to bring him down, saying that Michael Cohen is obsessed with Donald Trump, that everything financial in Michael Cohen's life right now is related to Donald Trump and tearing him down. He wrote a book about him, he has a podcast about him. This is everything that Michael Cohen's living off of. So thus, in their opinion, he's doing this because the ulterior motive is to enrich Michael Cohen. Cohen. Take all of that aside. I think seeing David Pecker on the stand, Aaron talked a little bit about the body language and the demeanor. Um, our Olivia Rubin repeatedly w w was texting me notes saying, you know, just he's shaking his head a lot. He's writing notes a lot. He's, you know, you know, visibly angry a lot. Because again, David Pecker and Donald Trump are different than Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels in that Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen have spoken out repeatedly about Donald Trump. That is very clear how they feel about Donald Trump. David Pecker is an actual longtime friend of decades. He has not said a word about any of this for nearly a decade since it happened. So today, and obviously now continuing tomorrow because court is wrapped, David Pecker for the first time is going to disclose all about that relationship, about that friendship. And it goes beyond just this payment. It goes into so many other activities around Donald Trump's life. Well, and Jeremy, I want to go to you with, with that point because the state says that Pecker here was not acting as a publisher. They say he was acting as a co-conspirator. What do you make of those words? And could Pecker be in danger of, of charges coming his way? Start backwards forward. I, I don't think that Pecker has any exposure on this because otherwise he wouldn't be testifying and saying the things that he is that, listen, I was involved in this scheme and this scam. It's too much for him on the line to, to, to say that and admit to it. But yes, 
He is part of this conspiracy, and that's so critical for the prosecution to bring out because who is going to know directly what happened? Who's going to be involved in the, the sort of how it all played out from the beginning to the end? What was their intent? How did they actually fulfill their goal? How did Michael Cohen get involved? That person is David Pecker. He's the one who starts this whole thing in motion in terms of the prosecution. So he is also not a person, as was just said, that really gets a galvanized Donald Trump, generally speaking, because he hasn't spoken out against Trump to the same capacity. He doesn't have as much to gain like Michael Cohen or Stormy Daniels. So he's a great person to start. I would not expect that he would have exposure. Otherwise, he wouldn't be testifying. And yes, this is a criminal conspiracy. Let's dumb this down and make it as simple as we can. And Pecker does apparently have a non-prosecution agreement, but he's just one of several key witnesses expected in this case. John, we're also expecting to hear from Stormy Daniels. We're expecting to hear from Michael Cohen. But the big focus today seemed to be on Michael Cohen. We heard his name mentioned several times by the prosecution, and he was a big focus of the opening statements by the defense, saying Michael Cohen is obsessed with Donald Trump. He cannot be trusted. What do you make of that? Because Michael Cohen is central to the prosecution's case. It's Michael Cohen's testimony that the payments that he received were not for legal fees. They were for this catch-and-kill scheme. This was the, the payoff, uh, I'm sorry, the payoff, the hush money to Stormy Daniels. Uh, and, and really, that's the only, at least that I've seen, direct evidence that the payments were made not for the reasons that they appeared in those ledgers, in, those, in the paperwork, yeah. not for what Donald Trump has said, but they were made specifically uh, 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 so that he would, to reimburse him for the payments to, uh, to Stormy Daniels. By the way, can we take a step back? This is the first trial in the history of the American Republic, criminal trial of a former president, let alone one that is currently running for president. And the three key witnesses in this case are an adult film star, a lawyer uh, who has been, uh, who has literally served jail time for lying under oath, and the top executive at the National Enquirer. I mean, this is uh, hardly a shining moment for American democracy that we've come to a point where you have, you know, the, the, the uh, National Enquirer, porn star, uh, convicted liar at the center of an historic first trial of a former president. I don't know how that reflects, where that will play out, but that is certainly something to take note of. If only there was a camera that we could see it all play out. <laughs> now, Rick, I want to take that point to you, you know, what do you think this moment, not not necessarily the whole trial itself, but just the fact that we're here at all, what is this, how does this play out in history? I don't know that there's any way to know it without knowing how it ends in six months with the election. You know, there's a world in which uh, Donald Trump, this all plays out, he is acquitted or uh, otherwise the prosecution is discredited and he uses it to bolster his re-election efforts or his efforts to, to, to come back to the White House. There's a world where this uh, portends uh, the beginning of a, of a spiral where support bleeds away from him for any combination of reasons. We're not going to know the historical question, Diana, I think, until we know what happens with this case and then what happens with the election. But John is right. I mean, this is, this is a wild set of circumstances. It's incredibly unpredictable. And it's also unpredictable for Trump himself, a man who is so used to being in control of every situation, here has to listen, try to have a poker face, uh, try to restrain some of his own impulses inside and outside the courthouse, knowing that those implications affect his freedom, his potential freedom, whether he's convicted or not, whether he serves in jail, and of course his political future, his prospects around winning another term in the White House. Now, Catherine, tomorrow the judge says he'll hold a hearing about Trump's alleged violations of the gag order against him. What are you watching for there? Yeah, so this hearing will happen in the morning before Pecker takes the stand again at 11 o'clock. Now, this hearing came about because prosecutors alleged that Trump had violated the gag order in three of his social media posts on True Social. Since they brought that up last week, at the beginning of last week, later in the week, prosecutors said uh, that he violated it, allegedly violated it, seven more times since then. So that is likely to be a topic of conversation, obviously, at the hearing tomorrow. The judge says that he will deal with those alleged seven additional violations then, but this is certainly going to remain a topic of conversation throughout this trial. There's obviously a camera in the hallway. Trump's lawyers are sometimes hesitant to have him speak in front of the camera but for fears that he will violate the gag order. Um, 
he does talk, however. He does usually going in and out of court. So this will certainly be a narrative that will occur throughout the rest of the trial. Trump is obviously uh, believes that this gag order shouldn't be in place. He's upset that he can't talk about witnesses, but the witnesses can talk about them. So we will certainly hear more about that in the morning before Pecker takes the stand again. And Aaron, we heard a little bit from the president today, but we also heard from his attorney in another case, Alina Haba, as that civil fraud suit played out just a few blocks away. How careful do the attorneys here have to be, primarily Donald Trump's attorneys, in what they say in this criminal hush money case, given the other cases that he is still facing? The civil fraud case is, is over, and, and uh, Trump's attorneys acquiesced to a couple of demands by the New York Attorney General's office to, uh, to, to, to better secure the $175 million bond that, that he posted. Uh, but Trump faces criminal exposure in three other cases. Uh, whether anything said here could influence those, I, I would imagine that Special Counsel Jack Smith and uh, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis have, have eyes and ears on, on what goes on here. Uh, but, but really, what we're talking about here occurred almost a, a decade ago, before Trump was even president and a little bit into his first term. And from Pecker, starting probably tomorrow when he returns to the witness stand, we're going to hear uh, about other unflattering episodes in Trump's life, when a doorman accused him of fathering a love child, when a Playboy model accused him of a sexual tryst. These, these are things Trump denies, but they are both things that prosecutors say the National Enquirer acquired the rights to and then buried so that people wouldn't find out about them. Rick, what does the timing here do for Trump politically? The fact that this case centers on an affair in 2006, a payment made before the 2016 election. Now we're months away from the 2024 election. Does it help Trump to be able to make that argument that, that this is all political? Well, the timing is either his best friend or his worst enemy. The timing is actually key to the criminal case that's been brought. Because it was about an alleged effort to influence the election, that's what, what allows this to become a felony, right? That's what allows the prosecutors to say, this was not just a private transaction. This was done with the intent to deceive and ultimately to try to, to change the election results. We already heard the readout of the Access Hollywood uh, uh, tapes to, to try to make that point about how vulnerable he was politically at that moment, why there was such an incentive for him to uh, to, to engage in, a, in the hush money scheme and the alleged, uh, the alleged scheme that, that the prosecutors say was criminal. The way that it's his uh, best friend, though, is that this is happening six months before an election. He says it could have happened a decade ago, and he's not wrong about that. And there's former President Trump leaving the courtroom. Let's listen. This is a case that nobody wanted to bring, including Alvin Bragg. It was just at the last minute they decided to do it. It's a case that, uh, if you're looking back, it goes back many, many years, 2015, maybe before that. And it's a case as to bookkeeping, which is a very minor thing in terms of the law, in terms of all the violent crime that's going on outside as we, as we speak, right outside as we speak. But this is a case where you pay a lawyer, he's a lawyer, and they call it a legal expense. That's the exact term they use legal expense in the books. And another thing that wasn't even said was we never even deducted it as a tax deduction. So that takes a whole of answer. Most people want to deduct everything. We never even took it as a tax deduction. But they call the payment to a lawyer a legal expense in the books. They didn't call it construction. They didn't say you're building a building. It called a payment to a lawyer because, as you know, Cone uh, is a lawyer, represented a lot of people over the years. Now, I'm not the only one. And wasn't very good in a lot of ways in terms of his representation. But he represented a lot of people. But he puts in an invoice or whatever, a bill, and they pay and they call it a legal expense. I got indicted for that. What else would you call it? Actually, nobody's been able to say what you're supposed to call it. If a lawyer puts in a bill, or an invoice, and you pay the bill, and in the book, it's a little line that's a very small little line. I don't know if you could even write more than two words. It's not like you could tell a life story. They marked it down to a legal expense. This is what I got indicted over. Think of it. I got indicted. I'm the leading candidate. I'm beating Biden. I'm beating the Republicans now. I have the nomination. 
And this is what they try and take me off the trail for. That checks being paid to a lawyer. He is a lawyer, or was a lawyer. And also the things he got in trouble for were things that had nothing to do with me. He got in trouble, he went to jail. This had nothing to do with me. This had to do with the taxi cab company that he owned, which is just something he owned, and medallions and borrowing money and a lot of things, but it had nothing to do with me. He represented a lot of people over the years. But they take this payment and they call it a legal expense, and you heard it today for the first time. This is what I got indicted over. This is what took me off and takes me off the campaign trail, because I should be in Georgia now. I should be in Florida now. I should be in a lot of different places right now campaigning, and I'm sitting here. And this will go on for a long time. It's very unfair. The judge is conflicted, as you know. It's very unfair what's going on. And I should be allowed to campaign. And whoever heard of this? You got indicted for that? People in the court just said to me, I can't believe it. This is the case. So we did nothing wrong. The other thing is, if this were such a great case, why didn't the Southern District bring it, who looked at it, turned it down? Why didn't uh, numerous other agencies and law enforcement groups look at it? Because it was shown to everybody. And very importantly, why didn't the federal elections do anything about it? Because this is federal, it's not state. They're trying to make it a state case, whatever. And it's not state, it has nothing to do, it's never happened before, I believe, it never happened before. This has never happened before, when the state tries to insert itself in federal elections. Never, nobody's ever seen it. But you know, federal elections took a total pass on it. They said essentially nothing was done wrong, or they would have done something about it. They're tough, they would have done something about it. But they said nothing, and they said, we're going to take a pass. Because they couldn't even believe it. Actually, if you read their, their letter, they couldn't even believe it. it. They were incredulous. And yet, Bragg mixed it up. Now, with Bragg, if you look, when he first came in, he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. Now, when are they going to look at Pomerantz or what Pomerantz did? Because that's bad stuff. And when are they going to look at all the lies that Cohen uh, did in the last trial? He got caught lying in the last trial. So he got caught lying, pure lying. And when are they going to look at that? Now we'll go to another subject because just a few blocks away, as you know, they had a trial on the $175 million. That's Letitia James. It's all coming out of the White House, by the way. And that's in front of Judge Ngoran. And the judge really didn't know anything. He didn't know about collateral security. He said, supposing it goes down, well, it doesn't go down because it's cash. I put up $175 million in cash, and we have a bonding company do it. And he challenged the bonding company that maybe the bonding company was no good. Well, they're good, and they also have $175 million of collateral, my collateral. But the judge didn't know anything about it. He didn't know what the $175 million cash meant. He had no idea what anything meant. And he had no idea what he did in the trial. And he charged me hundreds of millions of dollars on something where I'm totally innocent. But if you look at what happened today, Judge Angoran should not have done that trial. should have gone to the business division where they have complex business trials. But actually, it should have never been brought. Because I didn't overestimate. Because, you know, they say I overestimate. If you look at As the former numbers, president, underestimated. we're listening to former President Trump uh, after day one of the uh, post-jury selection portion of his criminal trial uh, for alleged hush money payments. The prosecution called their first witness after opening statements today, and now we're hearing from former President Trump about that case and another one playing out uh, just down the street. I want to bring in our chief White House, our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, for a little bit more on, on a few things the president said here, John, because we heard former President Trump saying that nobody wanted to bring this case against him, talking about how this case dates back many, many years, that it all centers on this small bookkeeping thing. And then he said something we've heard before. This is all coming out of the White House. Yeah, and, and let me say again, and we should reassert every time we hear this, there is no evidence for that whatsoever. Joe Biden, the Biden White House, 
the Biden Justice Department have absolutely nothing to do with this case and nothing to do with the uh, criminal, the, 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 the civil fraud case against his company, the other one that he's talking about. These are New York cases. The Manhattan District Attorney, the New York Attorney General have nothing to do with Joe Biden or the Biden administration. But I, I think what's notable is, is we have expected and it's been signaled by, uh, by the former president's political advisors that he would use the opportunity that he has uh, every day uh, because he's stuck in this courtroom to come out and to have the platform. Uh, you know, the cable news networks carry it. We carried part of it. Um, and, and, and to use that basically as his campaign platform. I, I don't know that this works for him. I mean, he, he sounds like he is um, complaining, grievance about, you know, the, the, the sometimes esoteric details of these cases against him. And once again, he looks like a guy who is a criminal defendant, because actually he is a criminal defendant, who is complaining that the system is working against him, which is what criminal defendants often do. He doesn't look like a commanding presence, a guy that is uh, the uh, Republican candidate for president of the United States. Uh, Jeremy, he also is facing a gag order, and they're supposed to be hearing about that tomorrow. Among other people, he is not supposed to disparage Michael Cohen, one of the key witnesses in this case. And we heard him today talking about how Michael Cohen was a bad attorney for him and, and sort of getting into that ground. Is he at risk here? And what happens if he is found to have violated this gag order? Because he has posted on social media many times now about Michael Cohen. Donald Trump's always at risk. And it sort of, not sort of, it in fact shocks me that despite there being an agenda in terms of politics and, and his campaign, that a criminal defense attorney or criminal defense attorneys, he's got a team, is sitting by and allowing him to rant and rant like a Charlie Brown cartoon and just go on and on, running the risk of, just as you said, potentially violating that gag order. And if there is another violation, the people will make that application to the court. There would be a potential hearing because it's not in the presence of the judge. It can be pursued as something as a civil or criminal. Here it would be criminal, meaning that they would want to punish him up to $1,000 if true, and then potentially up to 30 days in jail, which likely would never happen. But more he does this, the more he also runs the risk of saying something that the prosecution could potentially even use in their case in chief, meaning their direct case against Donald Trump. So it really bewilders me. I get the agenda here, the politics, but you have a criminal defendant with a potential felony that does not go away whether he sees a day in jail or not. It is permanent, no expungement. And there he is going and going and going. Someone really needs to get control of him if they have the courage, but evidently they don't. And I want to go back to Aaron Katursky, who's outside that courthouse, because, Aaron, we heard Trump talking about, you know, this is a bookkeeping issue, a little line, he said, where he paid an attorney to deal with an issue and listed it as a legal expense. He says, end of story. What do you make of that compared to what we heard in court today? Well, certainly prosecutors have a different view. They believe that this payment, the reimbursement payment to Michael Cohen after he had wired hush money to Stormy Daniels was done in such a way that was meant to undermine the election so voters before the 2016 vote didn't find out about it. But uh, to, to Jeremy and, and Jonathan Carl's point, one of the things that Trump has just done in the hallway is potentially undermine an argument that his defense attorney was making in opening statements. Defense attorney Todd Blanche said during his opening statement that President Trump had nothing to do with the invoice, with the check being generated, or an entry on the ledger. And in fact, there was Donald Trump now speaking about the minutia of how this payment, reimbursement payment to Michael Cohen was logged each and every month, how it appeared on the invoices, how it appeared on the checks and the ledger. And, and that is what prosecutors uh, say constituted the crime here and why they put Trump uh, at the center of an alleged scheme. Uh, John Santucci, how important is that to hear Aaron saying that what Trump just said outside the courtroom contradicts his own attorney's opening statement? Extremely, because here we go again. And the reason I make that point is look at what Donald Trump did during the New York Attorney General's case. He would go outside of court, make comments to cameras, and there were multiple instances that in that case, the judge and attorneys for the New York Attorney General's case would say, he just said this, he made this comment. In, in particular, the judge in that case, if you were 
recall, Donald Trump was also under a gag order, was attacking the clerk in that case. Donald Trump, during those proceedings, one of the days he showed up, attacked the clerk. Donald Trump was called to the stand by the judge and said, what did you just say? What were you doing out there? So to think that prosecutors or the judge himself are not listening to Donald Trump's words right now, I think he's going to have to learn that the hard way. All right, Aaron Katursky, John Carl, Catherine Falders, Jeremy Saland, thank you all. And we will be following this trial all day long. We'll bring you updates as we get them right here on ABC News Live. Keep it here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping... Make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. <laughs> Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a care, in it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here, and we got you. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. In rolling for this tornado tore through this town. From Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. From the scene of that deadly missile strike. ABC News Live everywhere. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! On the 2024 campaign trail. Here at 10 Downing Street. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. Breaking news first on ABC News Live, unprecedented. The first day of court wrapping up just moments ago in the first ever criminal trial for a former president. The witness we heard from today and how lawyers for Donald Trump are mounting a defense. 
punishing the homeless, the Supreme Court weighing whether cities can ticket the homeless, the debate over constitutional rights versus cruel and unusual treatment of those who live on the streets. Plus, safety, security, and suspensions at Columbia University. What's being done to protect students and what demonstrators are demanding following those anti-Israel protests? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, history happening before our eyes. Court wrapping up just a short time ago in the first ever criminal trial against a former president of the United States. Presidents have been impeached. They've resigned. They've been voted out of office. But for the first time ever, former President Donald Trump is facing a jury of his peers in criminal court. It's all stemming from those charges related to a payment to a porn star, hoping to hide an alleged affair with Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Prosecutors and defense attorneys now starting to lay out their cases. The state already calling the first witness to the stand, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, who they say was part of a scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about Trump. Letting us off this afternoon, our senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky, who has been inside that courtroom, along with our chief Washington correspondent John Carl and Jeremy Saland, criminal defense attorney and former Manhattan prosecutor Aaron, take us inside the courtroom and what we heard from both sides today. Opening statements laid out how each side is going to approach this historic case, Kira. The prosecution and assistant district attorney Matthew Colangelo saying this case is about a criminal conspiracy and a cover-up. He said the defendant, Donald Trump, orchestrated a criminal scheme to corrupt the 2016 election. And then he tried to take the jury through it talking about the history of the National Enquirer, being Donald Trump's friend before the election in 2016, buying up unflattering stories and then burying them to make sure they were never in print. Stories like his supposed love child that a doorman was talking about or a, a Playboy model's allegation of a, of a sexual tryst and then Stormy Daniels and her claim of a sexual encounter with Donald Trump. All things that he denies, but that, according to prosecutors, he did not want voters to know about as he was running for president in 2016. The defense said that Donald Trump is innocent and committed no crimes, and then talked about the way that this hush payment to Stormy Daniels was logged, saying it was just a legal expense because Michael Cohen was, after all, his lawyer. All right, John, we've been here before with all these characters, their allegations, their books, the checks, the bank accounts, all the salacious details. But it may well be the only one of four prosecutions of Trump to go to trial before the 2024 election. And that could change everything here. I mean, and what a seedy and unseemly uh, trial to be the historic first trial of a former president featuring all that you just described, uh, the lead witness uh, being none other than the head of the National Enquirer, the former head of the National Enquirer, which, uh, you know, uh, look at, look at, let's remember what the National Enquirer is and what it did even just in the 2016 election. Apart from this, the National Enquirer was the publication that broke the story uh, that Ted Cruz's father was linked to the Kennedy assassination. Of course, you know, absolutely bogus story, but designed to help uh, Donald Trump. Uh, you know, in some ways, this is, it, it's never good to be on trial for a, uh, uh, an alleged felony, uh, but of all of the legal trouble Donald Trump faces, uh, the, the classified documents case, uh, the January 6th federal investigation, uh, the election interference uh, case in Georgia, it's this one that goes first and might be the only one. Uh, that's something, should be something of a relief uh, to Donald Trump because this is uh, hardly as compelling a case as the other ones. So, Jeremy, let me follow up on that. I mean, this is no longer just a mere hush money case, but D.A. Alvin Bragg has described this as an election interference case, saying that Trump's alleged scheme here to pay off Daniels was geared toward depriving the voter of crucial information about a candidate before they even cast a vote. Is that a strong or weak argument in your eyes? And, and just follow up on what John said about, of all cases, start with this one. Well, well, in no particular order, let me just say that when Jack Smith presented his cases, he had those speaking indictments that really laid out the foundation and the narrative of what was happening and the allegations and what ultimately they intended to, to prove. That didn't happen here. 
But this never was a hush money case. That just sounds for salacious. It sounds sexy. It involves a porn star. So that's why it's sort of been labeled this. That that hush money, if you will, is almost like the vehicle to perpetrate the alleged crime of, of falsifying business records and the reason why the falsifying business records occurred. And then to your point about, you know, is this really an effort to circumvent or impact the election? Well, that's what raises this from that misdemeanor of just making the alterations and the changes with the intent to defraud to the felony. So, Aaron, let's talk about the first witness, David Pecker, once again, longtime friend of Trump. You know, as you mentioned, ex-publisher of the National Enquirer for years, uh, we, we've covered or the stories. We've covered the cover up and how Trump wanted to get rid of these damaging stories about his behavior before the 26th campaign. But why have David Pecker as the first witness? He is the narrator who can take the jury inside this alleged scheme to buy up damaging stories about Trump and then bury them. And prosecutors are, are, are trying to frame this as depriving voters before the 2016 election of information about Donald Trump that they might wanted to have known. And that's why they consider this case to be sort of the original election interference case. When Pecker took the witness stand, he flashed a big smile, uh, and, and it was solving, uh, kind of belying the gravity of the moment of a former American president on trial. He cackled loudly into a microphone when the prosecutor was asking him about some of his phone numbers, and he couldn't quite remember them. Uh, so he is going to be a, a man that, that the jury is going to get to know well. He'll return to the witness stand for more substantive testimony tomorrow. And, John, what do we see as more substantive? You know, what can the prosecution hope to learn it more in addition to just this attempt to pull off dirty tricks, you know, before the campaign? Well, I, I think that what, what I'm kind of listening for from David Pecker is, is a description of something we already know about, but to hear it in Pecker's words, his testimony, it's, it's the meeting that took place in Trump Tower in August of 2015. So uh, in terms of the timeline, remember, this is uh, not long after Donald Trump has announced that he is running for president. You had the first debate uh, was in August of 2015, and Trump found himself suddenly leading in all of the polls. And there is a meeting that takes place between three people, uh, Donald Trump, Michael Cohen, and David Pecker, uh, that outlines the ways in which Pecker could use the national National Enquirer to help Donald Trump. Part of that was this so-called catch and kill scheme, which ultimately leads you uh, to Stormy Daniels. All right, gentlemen, Aaron, uh, John, Jeremy, thank you so much. We'll continue the conversation for days to come. to the Middle East crisis now and the man who was the symbol of the failure to prevent the deadliest attack in Israel's history Netanyahu's head of military intelligence has now resigned that major general the highest ranking Israeli official to step down since the Hamas led attack back on October 7th his resignation rather happening as a special State Department panel here in our nation's capital is also recommending to sanction Israeli military units linked to human rights abuses for more, let's bring in our senior national policy reporter, Ann Flaherty. So, Ann, the U.S. is set to make a decision soon on whether to withhold the military aid to these Israeli units that are accused of, of torture. Where is this intel coming from, and what more do we know? Yeah, Kara, so Secretary Blinken addressed this at a press conference last Friday when he was asked about uh, reports that these uh, IDF units, these Israeli Defense Forces, ha uh, have been accused of human rights abuses. And of course, in the U.S., there is a law, it's called the Leahy Act, that says we can't use federal money that would actually provide weapons or training to military units overseas that have been accused of gross human rights violations. So uh, Blinken said simply, this has been on our radar, we're looking at this, and I expect to make a determination in coming days. So, you know, Israel has already responded to this. Netanyahu says absolutely not and called it a low uh, for the country, said this is not the time to do it. So what happens now overall to intelligence gathering as Netanyahu's key guy is now out? 
Yeah, you know, it was really a stunner, a 38-year veteran of the Israeli Defense Forces, um, having all of that experience, but of course being blamed for the October 7th attack from Hamas, not seeing it, that huge breach in intelligence. Um, I, I think it's showing that, you know, the, that investigation might be coming to an end. They know uh, who to blame. He's, he says simply, you know, I will live with this for the rest of my life. Uh, but all of this puts pressure on Netanyahu, who has not accepted blame for the October 7th attack attack. So all eyes on him. All right. And Flaherty, thanks so much. So after putting his job on the line to push through a $95 billion foreign aid package, House Speaker Mike Johnson appears to be gaining new bipartisan support. The Senate is now set to vote on that massive foreign aid package later this week that also includes that bill that could potentially ban TikTok here in the U.S. Our senior White House correspondent Selena Wang is on Capitol Hill with the latest for us. So Selena, let's talk about this moment for Speaker Johnson. Why did he completely change his stance on Ukraine aid? Yeah, Kara, this is a total transformation for Mike Johnson. Remember, he had gone from being staunchly opposed to any more aid to Ukraine to then putting his own job on the line to try and get that massive foreign aid package passed. So as you say, the big question here is why the dramatic turnaround? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one is the pressure campaign that was from President Biden, as well as other congressional leaders and world leaders for that matter. Secondly, he also had received classified intelligence briefings, including from the CIA director, painting the dire picture in Ukraine the stakes that we're talking about here, and that also played a role in shifting his position. Then thirdly, he's a devout Christian, and Congressman McCall said that he prayed. He prayed for guidance on what to do here. So as you say, the Senate is now going to take this up. They're expected to take it up tomorrow, and given the bipartisan support here, this could really speed its way through Congress, and President Biden says he's ready to sign this as soon as possible. All right, well, the Senate is expected uh, to vote on this foreign aid package tomorrow, as you mentioned. Let's talk about what happens to TikTok as well, if indeed it passes. Yeah, so this is interesting. This has been gaining a lot of bipartisan uh, momentum here, and this would essentially give ByteDance, which is TikTok's Chinese parent, about a year to sell the app, find a buyer, or it would face a ban in the U.S. But it's not really that simple, Kira, because it will definitely face legal challenges. TikTok said they're going to fight this hard in court. They are going to say that this violates the First Amendment, that this devastates millions of small businesses that rely on the platform. Then on top of that, you also have the fact that the Chinese government could block the sale as well. So there's still a long road ahead for this. And interesting political dynamics here as well. President Biden says he's in support of this legislation, but his campaign is actively using using TikTok to try and reach young voters. All right, Selena Wang at the Capitol for us. Selena, thank you. And for the first time in decades, the Supreme Court is hearing a major case involving homelessness. The justices are weighing whether cities can fine unhoused people for sleeping outside. Advocates say this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. And it comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. Right now, California has the largest homeless population in the country. And Governor Gavin Newsom says he means business and is calling for accountability. It's about people's lives. People are dying on our watch. People are dying on the streets. And we all have a responsibility to do better, all of us, not just the states, not about blaming folks, pointing fingers anymore, all of us. Accountability, drive accountability, get out there. Let's get this stuff fixed, Let's clean up our streets, save people's lives. Let's bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, out in front of the Supreme Court there. Devin, let's talk about how we got here and the arguments that the justices are actually hearing today. A historic case today, Kira, the biggest case on homelessness in more than 40 years. It came from the city of Grants Pass, Oregon, one of many in this country that have passed ordinances trying to crack down on homelessness and homeless encampments. Grants Pass, as you said, passed a law a few years ago saying it would be a crime to sleep in public if you didn't have a home to use a blanket, that police could ticket you, cite you, and eventually, if you kept violating it, put you in jail. Uh, a group of homeless people in that community I was out there, uh, brought this legal challenge. They said it violates the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, because the city of Grants Pass has no homeless shelters, public shelters for these people uh, and places to go. A federal appeals court agreed with them, Kira, and today here at the Supreme Court, arguments just concluded a short time ago, more than two hours uh, of debate over this very complicated issue of homelessness in America. It's on the rise at record levels, especially on the West Coast. What can cities do about it? Can they 
they pass laws that penalize people who are sleeping on the streets. Uh, a very tricky case today, Kira, and the justices really were grappling with that. Well, you always humanize these stories for us, Devin. Tell us about this woman that you met in Oregon who's struggling with homelessness and what she thinks about this case. One of the interesting things about Grants Pass Cure is that so many of the 600 or so homeless people in that community are natives of Grants Pass. They grew up there, they lived there. Uh, one of those people was Helen Cruz. She had lived for five years, she told me, in a local city park next to the Little League field until a church took her in. And during that time, she said she was uh, faced with $5,000 in fines. And here's what she had to say about that experience. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here. And uh, still not enough to be able to rent a place. Their, their uh, terms of low-income housing here is $1,000 a month. And that's, that's not workable either, you know. Now, Helen Cruz had two jobs at the time, Kira. She said she was doing her best, simply could not afford the rent there in Grant, Grants Pass, much less the fines that she was getting from the city. She was one of the uh, supporters of this case. She hopes that the city will back down from this enforcement opportunity and simply invest more uh, in affordable housing up and down the West Coast and in Grants Pass. But the city today, uh, Kira, telling the justices that laws like these are so important for public public safety uh, and cranking down on encampments. The justices seem really torn. We'll have to see how they come out in the next couple of months, Kira. Right, and if there's bigger implications for other states as well, we'll follow it closely. Devin, thank you so much. You bet. And we, we may be well into spring, but it sure doesn't feel like it for much of the country. Millions of Americans are feeling some pretty frigid temperatures, and a new threat of severe weather is on the way. Our meteorologist, Samara Theodore, is tracking the forecast. Samara, are we ever going to see a true start to spring? <laughs> I know. I'm trying to see what I can do uh, here. But, you know, I always say that spring is really the battle between summer and winter, and right now it looks like winter's winning a little bit. So here's a look. Another shot of frosty air. This is the... Uh, temperature trend for the next couple of mornings, okay? So that means you're waking up, you're headed outside around 6 a.m. Tuesday morning, Chicago 50s, but by Wednesday dropping down to the 30s. Look how the chill is spreading eastward. Boston, 32 degrees Thursday morning. Burlington, below freezing Thursday morning, down into the 20s. As a result, we've seen this shift for frost and freeze alerts shift a little bit farther eastward. I know earlier this morning we had it in a lot of places like uh, the Midwest and to the Great Lakes. Well, tomorrow morning we anticipate the freeze and frost alerts to be happening towards uh, eastern Kentucky, right on into parts of Virginia, Maryland, and up into Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, out west, they have been dealing with their own chill, right? So this morning, pretty chilly, but look what's happening. We're getting a pretty big warm-up out west. And just to think that in Denver, we just came off of all that snowfall, and now they will be waking up, or going home, should I say, to temperatures in the upper 70s this afternoon, near about 80 degrees in, in uh, Trinidad, Colorado there. And a lot of that heat helping to fuel some storms later this week. It's a quiet start to our week now, but that's going to change. Severe weather is riding through the heartland by the end of the week. Here we're going to show you uh, where you can anticipate that on Thursday from Great Bend down to western Oklahoma. And then on Friday, that shifts farther east. There we could see large hill, damaging winds, and a few tornadoes. Kira? All right. Appreciate it, Samara. Thank you. And coming up, safety, security, and suspensions at Columbia University. What's being done to protect students following those anti-Israel protests? Next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Now to the security, safety, even suspensions that happened at Columbia University. Classes are taking place remotely today as part of increased safety measures. After those anti-Israel protests on campus, police say at least 100 people have been arrested so far. The university's president calling for a reset there on school grounds ahead of the first night of Passover, which begins tonight. Our Stephanie Ramos is on the story for us. So, Steph, these were not peaceful protests. I mean, students were arrested and even suspended. That's right, Kira. And, and I'm outside Columbia University right now. You can see there are demonstrators here, pro-Palestinian demonstrators, pro-Israel demonstrators. The friction is worsening here at the school. There are a lot of shouting matches. There is some conflict. The NYPD is standing ready to ready to interact if they need to. We we know that they're across the street right now. Uh, it seems like though it seems as though they are wearing riot gear helmets have got the baton uh, but they are not involved just yet right now it's just two groups kind of going at each other uh, but we know what we saw last week pro-palestinian demonstrators pitching tents on the campus refusing to leave the university uh, unless the university met their demands which included uh, divesting from companies with ties to israel the school called the police as you mentioned at least a hundred people were uh, arrested uh, but that did not deter other groups we know that pro-palestinian demonstrators not affiliated with the university also uh, joined some protests over the weekend, Kira. All right, so let's talk about additional security measures uh, that the school, the NYPD is now taking. And since classes are happening remotely, um, have you seen any staff, teachers getting involved? Uh, not that I know of, and if they are, it, it's hard to tell if they are staff, if they are teachers, professors. We know that there are a lot of different groups kind of kind of joining in and in, 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 in these demonstrations. Uh, what we do know, that, and as you mentioned, this is the first night of Passover. We know that NYPD officials have said because it is a, ho a Jewish holiday, it may be a catalyst for acts of violence or extremist group to take advantage. Uh, so they are keeping a close eye on that. But this university has said that they, they don't want to so much involve the police. They want to step up and double up on the campus public safety officers that they have before uh, calling the police again, which is what they did last week, and has not deterred groups from coming back to the campus to protest. Kira. All right, Stephanie Ramos, uh, Ramos for us there. We'll continue to stay in close touch with you, especially as these protests are ongoing. Coming up, country superstar Luke Bryan had a pretty memorable performance in Man Vancouver this weekend. Uh, you'll see why next. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail. David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I watch do. you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. 
Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness. And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Joint Base Andrews, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Some of the top headlines we're following this hour on ABC News Live. Three California police officers are charged with manslaughter two years after a man died from being restrained. Police first said that Mario Gonzalez died from meth use, but a second autopsy indicated a death from asphyxiation. Body cam video actually shows officers cuffing him face down following that struggle. The case comes as a new DA is revisiting previously cleared cases of police shootings and in custody deaths. Longtime Associated Press correspondent Terry Anderson has passed away at the age of 76. Anderson is most famously known as one of America's longest held hostages after he was held captive by militants in Lebanon for almost seven years while on assignment back in the 80s. His daughter says that he died following complications from heart surgery. Country superstar Luke Bryan had a pretty memorable performance in Vancouver over the weekend. The American Idol judge, yep, took a little tumble there after slipping mid-song after a cell phone was tossed up on stage. Brian says, hey, I'm all right. He even joked about it as he got back up and replayed the moment on the fan's cell phone. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops. Neither do we. More live news right after the break. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source.
Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, history happening right before our eyes. Court wrapping just a short time ago in the first ever criminal trial against a former president of the United States. Presidents have been impeached, they've resigned, they've been voted out of office, but for the first time ever, former President Donald Trump is facing a jury of his peers in criminal court. It's all stemming from those charges related to a payment to a porn star, hoping to hide an alleged affair with Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Prosecutors and defense attorneys now starting to lay out their cases. The state already calling the first witness to the stand, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, who they say was part of a scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about Trump. We have team coverage. Our senior reporter, Captain Falders, and attorney Jerry Goldfeder, senior counsel at Cozen O'Connor and director of Fordham Law School's Voting Rights and Democracy Project. Kathleen, let's start with you. How did court go today? Well, it was short, Kira. There was a juror who had an emergency dental appointment, so uh, they wrapped about an hour ago. But look, I, I think the, one of the most significant things, at least so far, we've heard opening statements, and as you mentioned, a brief bit of Pecker taking the witness stand. Uh, it's the focus on Michael Cohen here, and that's what prosecutors focused on in their opening statements. Uh, the defense team, Trump's defense, is going to paint Michael Cohen, Trump's former lawyer and fixer, as a not credible witness here. He can't be trusted, the defense team uh, will say and has said during the opening, and that's because he has a criminal record. He has been uh, accused of lying. Uh, the prosecutors tried to get ahead of that and said that you'll hear a lot about Cohen, that they believe he can still be credible as it relates to this payment uh, to Stormy Daniels that Trump allegedly uh, was involved in and directed. So I think that's at least the takeaway so far from today. We didn't get very far. Opening statements, the first witness on the witness stand only for uh, a number of minutes, really. Uh, but I think going down uh, the road in this trial, Michael Cohen, which uh, we assume, by the way, that he will be called to testify, he will be called to testify, he will be central to the storyline here. All right, so Jerry, Trump's defense attorney said uh, there is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. So what are your thoughts on the approach so far here? Well, there's nothing wrong with trying to influence an election as long as it's lawful. <laughs> the allegations here, the charges here, is that uh, there were crimes committed in order to influence the election, crimes committed in order to prevent the American people from knowing the truth about his affair and his falsifying business records. That's what this is about. The prosecutor laid it out very nicely in opening statements, and uh, Trump's lawyers tries to um, uh, uh, suggest that that's not the case, that uh, there's nothing to be seen by the jury. Um, we'll see exactly how the prosecutor makes the case, and we'll see what the defense uh, tries to uh, suggest otherwise. And I think that as the witnesses come to testify, the jurors are going to get a pretty clear idea. And by the way, that's the reason why they, I think that they're starting off with Pecker, because um, it's true that Cohn has a history of lying, and what they want to show is that these events that Cohn is going to testify about, these events can be corroborated by all sorts of other witnesses, including Pecker. So we're going to see the prosecution lay out its case, showing that there were all sorts of false invoices, false checks, falsifying of business records to the intent of committing or concealing another crime. And those other crimes, including tax fraud, um, relate to um, uh, election fraud, federal election laws and state election laws having been violated, having been violated. And, and we'll see if they can prove that case. Well, that's, let me follow up with you on that, Jerry, because although, yes, you know, Michael Cohen uh, has, has told a few tales in his life, as has the former president, by the way. But when it comes to just going back to the very beginning of the, the Stormy Daniels uh, saga, um, we, we saw the checks signed by Trump. I mean, Michael Cohen went into detail about the bank accounts and the LLC and all these things that were set up. So it's, I mean, doesn't Michael Cohen have something here on his side? I mean, yes, popped for lying, but also the documents don't necessarily lie. He appears to have truth on his side. There's documentary evidence, just as you say. There are checks, there are false invoices, but he also has other witnesses on his side, just in case uh, the, the, the jury feels that, 
well, Cohn has lied in the past and we're not sure if we should believe him. There's all sorts of other people and documents that corroborate uh, what he is going to testify to, which of course demonstrates that the prosecution's case is valid. So, Catherine, why do you think David Becker was on the stand only for a short bit of time? Well, I think Jerry's right in the sense also in terms of why he testified is that they want to paint this picture of Trump's character. They want to give more credibility to these instances uh, that occurred that they're going to be talking about. In terms of the short period of time, look, I thought they might punt it until tomorrow. They might, uh, given that they had to get out of court pretty early. Um, but they wanted to call him. The judge has made clear that he doesn't want any delays in, in this trial at all. They're moving at a pretty fast pace. So you will see David Pecker on the stand tomorrow. Now, he won't be on the stand until 11 a.m. That's because the judge is going to have a hearing to begin on, on the gag order and alleged violations that uh, of the gag order by a former President Trump, which might include something that he actually just said moments ago outside of court. I'm sure that will come up where he talked about Cohen. Uh, we will kick off the day with that hearing and move into Pecker a couple hours later, Kira. Overall, Jerry, what do you think about this case? I mean, clearly it's not just about hush money. It, it, it's about election interference. But strong case, weak case, um, because we've known all the characters and the details and the allegations and the, all the salacious stuff for years when this first broke, what, six years ago, um, when Michael Cohen's uh, office got raided. And then from there, it's just kind of been a domino effect um, uh, of what we've been able reason, to learn. The reason this case wasn't brought uh, originally uh, when it occurred is because the Trump Justice Department made sure that it wasn't made sure that the prosecutors, the federal prosecutors, didn't uh, bring this case. So now we have it. And it appears to be, um, well, old news, uh, election interference 2016. But it's very important. And by the way, it's not so different than the election interference uh, that he attempted to uh, uh, pull off in 2020. It takes a different form, but it's the same uh, uh, modus operandi by Trump. Uh, uh, he appears to have not learned anything from uh, all the accusations that have been made by federal prosecutors and state prosecutors. He continues to go outside the courtroom and make statements about the witnesses that are not true, to make statements about the process that are not true. This is a straight uh, prosecution by a straight shooting district attorney in Manhattan. If he didn't think that there were serious charges, he wouldn't have brought the case. And the, really, the case comes down to, no matter what uh, Trump's lawyers say, it comes down to election interference, falsifying business records, covering up this hush money uh, operation in order to uh, impact uh, the, the election. And I think we're going to uh, have the district attorney show that bit by bit, witness by witness, document by document. But it'll be up to the jurors to make uh, the decision as to whether or not the district attorney has proved the case. You know, and that, that brings up an interesting point. Um, Catherine, just listening to Jerry, it, it, it will bring up his past and, and all these witnesses, whether it's Stormy Daniels or Karen McDougal or the Access Hollywood tape, mm -hmm. which I guess there will only be a transcript. The tape will not be heard in court. Is that right? And if, if that's the case, it's still all very embarrassing um, situations here for the former president. And I'm sure every member of that jury is going to be looking at him to see if he's squirming or getting angry or starting to sweat or rolling his eyes. Because if he doesn't get that jury to fall in love with him, um, he's hosed. <laughs> yeah, Kira, no, I, I think you're exactly right. The body language from him will be fascinating to watch. And probably critical as the jurors are, are looking at him. And you mentioned that Access Hollywood tape, that infamous Access Hollywood tape that we've heard so many times. You're right, it can't be played in court. Um, 
it's interesting because it was one of the first things that during the opening statements today that prosecutors read. They actually read uh, a portion of that transcript, which a judge uh, allowed them to do. So certainly Trump was sitting there and, and heard that, even though he has uh, heard the tape multiple times. His words will uh, be introduced uh, in this case, as they were this morning. So yes, I, I can imagine that, as you say, it's embarrassing to hear these details. They've been reported on, but they haven't uh, been said during a trial, the first criminal trial. Certainly, he will be hearing a lot more of this in the coming weeks. All right, Catherine, thanks. Jerry Goldfeder, thank you, too. It's great to have you on board. Let's head over to the Middle East crisis now. And the man who was the symbol of the failure to prevent the deadliest attack in Israel's history, Netanyahu's head of military intelligence, has now resigned. That major general, the highest-ranking Israeli official, to step down since the Hamas-led attack back on October 7th. His resignation, rather, happening as a special State Department panel here in our nation's capital is also recommending to sanction Israeli military units linked to human rights abuses. For more, let's bring in our senior national policy reporter, Ann Flaherty. So, Ann, the U.S. is set to make a decision soon on whether to withhold the military aid to these Israeli units that are accused of, of torture. Where is this intel coming from and what more do we know? Yeah, Kara, so Secretary Blinken addressed this at a press conference last Friday when he was asked about uh, reports that these IDF units, these Israeli Defense Forces, ha uh, have been accused of human rights abuses. And of course, in the U.S., there is a law, it's called the Leahy Act, that says we can't use federal money that would actually provide weapons or training to military units overseas that have been accused of gross human rights violations. So uh, Blinken said simply, this has been on our radar, we're looking at this, and I expect to make a determination in coming days. So, you know, Israel has already responded to this. Netanyahu says absolutely not and called it a low uh, for the country, said this is not the time to do it. So what happens now overall to intelligence, ga intelligence gathering is Netanyahu's key guy is now out. Yeah, you know, it was really a stunner, a 38-year veteran of the Israeli Defense Forces um, having all of that experience, but of course being blamed for the October 7th attack from Hamas, not seeing it, that huge breach in intelligence. Um, I, I think it's showing that, you know, th th that investigation might be coming to an end. They know uh, who to blame. He's, he says simply, you know, I will live with this for the rest of my life. Uh, but all of this puts pressure on Netanyahu, who has not accepted blame for the October 7th attack. So all eyes on him. All right. And Flaherty, thanks so much. So after putting his job on the line to push through a $95 billion foreign aid package, House Speaker Mike Johnson appears to be gaining new bipartisan support. The Senate is now set to vote on that massive foreign aid package later this week that also includes that bill that could potentially ban TikTok here in the U.S. Our senior White House correspondent Selena Wang is on Capitol Hill with the latest for us. So Selena, let's talk about this moment for Speaker Johnson. Why did he completely change his stance on Ukraine aid? Yeah, Kara, this is a total transformation for Mike Johnson. Remember, he had gone from being staunchly opposed to any more aid to Ukraine to then putting his own job on the line to try and get that massive foreign aid package passed. So as you say, the big question here is why the dramatic turnaround? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one is the pressure campaign that was from President Biden as well as other congressional leaders and world leaders for that matter. Secondly, he also had received classified intelligence briefings, including from the CIA director, painting the dire picture in Ukraine the stakes that we're talking about here, and that also played a role in shifting his position. Then thirdly, he's a devout Christian, and Congressman McCall said that he prayed. He prayed for guidance on what to do here. So as you say, the Senate is now going to take this up. They're expected to take it up tomorrow, and given the bipartisan support here, this could really speed its way through Congress, and President Biden says he's ready to sign this as soon as possible. All right, well, the Senate is expected uh, to vote on this foreign aid package tomorrow, as you mentioned. Let's talk about what happens to TikTok as well, if indeed it passes. Yeah, so this is interesting. This has been gaining a lot of bipartisan uh, momentum here, and this would essentially give 
ByteDance, which is TikTok's Chinese parent, about a year to sell the app, find a buyer, or it would face a ban in the U.S. But it's not really that simple, Kira, because it will definitely face legal challenges. TikTok said they're going to fight this hard in court. They are going to say that this violates the First Amendment, that this devastates millions of small businesses that rely on the platform. Then on top of that, you also have the fact that the Chinese government could block the sale as well. So there's still a long road ahead for this. And interesting political dynamics here as well. President Biden says he's in support of this legislation, but his campaign is actively using TikTok to try and reach young voters. All right, Selena Wang at the Capitol for us. Selena, thank you. And for the first time in decades, the Supreme Court is hearing a major case involving homelessness. The justices are weighing whether cities can fine unhoused people for sleeping outside. Advocates say this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. And it comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. Right now, California has the largest homeless population in the country. And Governor Gavin Newsom says he means business and is calling for accountability. It's about people's lives. People are dying on our watch. People are dying on the streets. And we all have a responsibility to do better. All of us. Not just the states. Not about blaming folks, pointing fingers anymore. All of us. Accountability. Drive accountability. Get out there. Let's get this stuff fixed. Let's clean up our streets. Save people's lives. Let's bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, out in front of the Supreme Court there. Devin, let's talk about how we got here and the arguments that the justices are actually hearing today. A historic case today, Kira, the biggest case on homelessness in more than 40 years. It came from the city of Grants Pass, Oregon, one of many in this country that have passed ordinances trying to crack down on homelessness and homeless encampments. Grants Pass, as you said, passed a law a few years ago saying it would be a crime to sleep in public if you didn't have a home to use a blanket, that police could ticket you, cite you, and eventually, if you kept violating it, put you in jail. Uh, a group of homeless people in that community I was out there, uh, brought this legal challenge. They said it violates the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, because the city of Grants Pass has no homeless shelters, public shelters for these people uh, and places to go. A federal appeals court agreed with them, Kira, and today here at the Supreme Court, arguments just concluded a short time ago, more than two hours uh, of debate over this very complicated issue of homelessness in America. It's on the rise at record levels, especially on the West Coast. What can cities do about it? Can they pass laws that penalize people who are sleeping on the streets. A, a very tricky case today, Kira, and the justices really were grappling with that. Well, you always humanize these stories for us, Devin. Tell us about this woman that you met in Oregon who's struggling with homelessness and what she thinks about this case. One of the interesting things about Grants Pass, Kira, is that so many of the 600 or so homeless people in that community are natives of Grants Pass. They grew up there, they lived there. Uh, one of those people was Helen Cruz. She had lived for five years, she told me, in a local city park next to the Little League field until a church took her in. And during that time, she said she was uh, faced with $5,000 in fines. And here's what she had to say about that experience. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here. And uh, still not enough to be able to rent a place. Their, their uh, terms of low-income housing here is $1,000 a month. And that's, that's not workable either, you know. Now, Helen Cruz had two jobs at the time, Kira. She said she was doing her best, simply could not afford the rent there in Grand, Grand, Grants Pass, much less the fines that she was getting from the city. She was one of the uh, supporters of this case. She hopes that the city will back down from this enforcement opportunity and simply invest more uh, in affordable housing up and down the West Coast and in Grants Pass. But the city today, uh, Kira, telling the justices that laws like these are so important for public safety uh, and cranking down on encampments. The justices seem really torn. We'll have to see how they come out in the next couple of months, Kira. Right. And if there's bigger implications for other states as well, we'll follow it closely. Devin, thank you so much. You bet. And we, we may be well into spring, but it sure doesn't feel like it for much of the country. Millions of Americans are feeling some pretty frigid temperatures and a new threat of severe weather is on the way. Our meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking the forecast. Samara, are we ever good to see a true start to spring? <laughs> I know. I'm trying to see what I could do uh, here. But, you know, I always say that spring is really the battle between summer and winter. And right now it looks like winter is winning a little bit. So here's a look, another shot of frosty air. This is the uh, 
temperature trend for the next couple of mornings, okay? So that means you're waking up, you're headed outside around 6 a.m. Tuesday morning, Chicago 50s, but by Wednesday dropping down in the 30s. Look how the chill is spreading eastward. Boston, 32 degrees Thursday morning. Burlington, below freezing Thursday morning, down into the 20s. As a result, we've seen this shift for frost and freeze alerts shift a little bit farther eastward. I know earlier this morning we had it in a lot of places like uh, the Midwest and to the Great Lakes. Well, tomorrow morning we anticipate the freeze and frost alerts to be happening towards uh, eastern Kentucky, right on into parts of Virginia, Maryland, and up into Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, out west, they have been dealing with their own chill, right? So this morning, pretty chilly, but look what's happening. We're getting a pretty big warm-up out west. And just to think that in Denver, we just came off of all that snowfall, and now they will be waking up or going home, should I say, to temperatures in the upper 70s this afternoon, near about 80 degrees in, in uh, Trinidad, Colorado there. And a lot of that heat helping to fuel some storms later this week. It's a quiet start to our week now, but that's going to change. Severe weather is riding through the heartland by the end of the week. Here we're going to show you uh, where you can anticipate that on Thursday from Great Bend down to western Oklahoma. And then on Friday, that shifts farther east. There we could see large hill, damaging winds, and a few tornadoes. Kira? All right. Appreciate it, Samara. Thank you. And coming up, safety, security, and suspensions at Columbia University. What's being done to protect students following those anti-Israel protests? Next. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Now to the security, safety, even suspensions that happened at Columbia University. Classes are taking place remotely today as part of increased safety measures after those anti-Israel protests on campus. Police say at least 100 people have been arrested so far. The university's president calling for a reset there on school grounds ahead of the first night of Passover, which begins tonight. Our Stephanie Ramos is on the story for us. So, Steph, these were not peaceful protests. I mean, students were arrested and even suspended. That's right, Kira. And, and I'm outside Columbia University right now. You can see there are demonstrators here, pro-Palestinian demonstrators, pro-Israel demonstrators. The friction is worsening here at the school. There are a lot of shouting matches. There is some conflict. The NYPD is standing ready to ready to interact if they need to. We we know that they're across the street right now. Uh, it seems like though it seems as though they are wearing 
riot gear, helmets, they've got the baton, uh, but they are not involved just yet right now. It's just two groups kind of going at each other. Uh, but we know what we saw last week, pro-Palestinian demonstrators pitching tents on the campus, refusing to leave the university uh, unless the university met their demands, which included uh, divesting from companies with ties to Israel. The school called the police. As you mentioned, at least 100 people were uh, arrested, uh, but that did not deter other groups. We know that pro-Palestinian demonstrators not affiliated with the university also uh, joined some protests over the weekend, Kira. All right, so let's talk about additional security measures uh, that the school, the NYPD is now taking. And since classes are happening remotely, um, have you seen any staff, teachers getting involved? Uh, not that I know of, and if they are, it, it's hard to tell if they are staff, if they are teachers, professors. We know that there are a lot of different groups kind of kind of joining in and in, 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 in these demonstrations. Uh, what we do know, that, and as you mentioned, this is the first night of Passover. We know that NYPD officials have said because it is a, ho a Jewish holiday, it may be a catalyst for acts of violence or extremist group to take advantage. Uh, so they are keeping a close eye on that. But this university has said that they, they don't want to so much involve the police. They want to step up and double up on the campus public safety officers that they have before uh, calling the police again, which is what they did last week, and has not deterred groups from coming back to the campus to protest. Kira. All right, Stephanie Ramos, uh, Ramos for us there. We'll continue to stay in close touch with you, especially as these protests are ongoing. Coming up, country superstar Luke Bryan had a pretty memorable performance in Man Vancouver this weekend. Uh, you'll see why next. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Some of the top headlines we're following this hour on ABC News Live. Three California police officers are charged with manslaughter two years after a man died from being restrained. Police first said that Mario Gonzalez died from meth use, but a second autopsy indicated a death from asphyxiation. Body cam video actually shows officers cuffing him face down following that struggle. The case comes as a new DA is revisiting previously cleared cases of police shootings and in custody deaths. Longtime Associated Press correspondent Terry Anderson has passed away at the age of 76. Anderson is most famously known as one of America's longest held hostages after he was held captive by militants in Lebanon for almost seven years while on assignment back in the 80s. His daughter says that he died following complications from heart surgery. Country superstar Luke Bryan had a pretty memorable performance in Vancouver over the weekend. The American Idol judge, yep, took a little tumble there after slipping mid-song after a cell phone was tossed up on stage. Brian says, hey, I'm all right. He even joked about it as he got back up and replayed the moment on the fan's cell phone. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops. Neither do we. More live news right after the break. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the aftermath of Hurricane Adelia, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here, and we got gotcha. you. Right now on ABC News Live, unprecedented. The first day of court wrapping up today in the first ever criminal trial for a former president. The witness we heard from and how lawyers for Donald Trump are mounting a defense. Safety, security, and suspensions at Columbia University. What's being done to protect students and what demonstrators are demanding following those anti-Israel protests. And TikTok for TikTok. The historic move by the House that could see the app banned in the U.S. What's next and the impact that this could have on the app's 170 million users. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, it's history happening right before our eyes. Court wrapping just a short time ago in the first ever criminal trial against a former president of the United States. Presidents have been impeached. They've resigned. They've been voted out of office. But for the first time ever, former President Donald Trump is facing a jury of his peers in criminal court. It's all stemming from those charges related to a payment to a porn star, hoping to hide an alleged affair with Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Prosecutors and defense attorneys he's now starting to lay out their cases and the state already calling the first witness to the stand former national Enquirer publisher david pecker who they say was part of that scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about trump leading us off our investigative reporter olivia rubin attorney jerry goldfeder senior counsel at cozen o'connor and director of the fordham law school's voting rights for democracy project olivia let's start with you a lot of salacious details brought up in court how did trump handle it some really brutal moments, Kira. I think zoning in on the moment when prosecutors in their opening statements brought up the infamous Access Hollywood tape. They read portions of the transcript to the jury. They said that Donald Trump was uh, bragging about committing sexual assault. And Donald Trump just had to sit there and listen. And I will say, just watching that camera that's directly on his face, you could tell it was difficult. It was one of the few moments when prosecutors brought up this tape that you could see Donald Trump shaking his head. He pursed his lips. He was fidgeting in his seat a little bit, shuffling with papers. At one point, he grabbed a pen, clearly sort of, you know, trying to figure out what to do in that moment where, remember, he can't really do much. He can't talk. He can't chime in. He can't say anything. And so for that time, it's really just about sitting there and listening. And I do think that his attorneys, when they uh, got up for their turn, his attorney, Todd Blanche, tried to humanize him a bit uh, to counter against these ideas of him as the president, of him in power of him, you know, in the Access Hollywood tape. And Todd Blanche, his attorney, said to the jury, you know, he's not just the former president. He's not just the man that you've seen on TV with The Apprentice. And what Todd said was, he's a man, he is a husband, and he is a father. And it was a really striking line that I think was going to be tried to use to counter some of these really salacious, these really uh, raunchy details that are going to be laid out in front of the jury for the next six to eight weeks. So, Jerry, what do you make of former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker as the first witness called by the prosecution? Why set the tone here with Trump's longtime friend and protector of damaging stories? Well, I think Pecker is important because uh, the defense is going to try to devalue the testimony of Michael Cohn. And other witnesses like David Pecker will corroborate what the uh, district attorney has to say in its charges. Uh, about this uh, cover-up. And there are documents that will show that as well. You know, it's interesting. Uh, he may be a husband and a father, uh, but I I'm not sure that that's a great defense because after all, if if I were a juror sitting there and I would and I was told, well, he's just an ordinary guy, he's a husband and, is a, fa and a father, look what he did. And there's no getting away from what he did. 
And the Access Hollywood tape, even though they're not going to hear the tape, they're going to hear the transcript. They've heard part of it already. And when they hear that, they're going to say, well, what kind of husband was this? What kind of father was this? And, and, and the Access Hollywood tape uh, shows what kind of person he was and why they were so crazed about covering up uh, the Stormy Daniels, because it was right before the election and right after the Access Hollywood tape uh, came out. So that's what really motivated them to uh, have this hush money scheme and cover it up and falsify business records that the jury is going to hear all those details about. So I'm not so sure that the defense was so smart by tr trying to portray him as just an ordinary guy. The jurors may say, mm, not such a good husband. So, Olivia, what else is the prosecution hoping to learn uh, from David Pecker besides uh, Trump's attempt here to just pull off these dirty tricks before 2016 campaign? And then all the way to the election day, really, he was scrambling. Well, David Pecker is sort of a key uh, aspect, and if you think of the link of what uh, occurred here in terms of the payments, because remember, Donald Trump didn't pay Stormy Daniels directly. It was uh, Michael Cohen and David Pecker who worked together to buy the story. Michael Cohen made the payments. Donald Trump paid Michael Cohen. So what prosecutors need to do is they need to lay out this link for the jury so they can understand the flow of the money, because what this case is actually about on on the charges is the flow of the money. It is not about the affair. It is not about, you know, Access Hollywood. It is the falsification of business records and the payments. So the jurors need to understand exactly where money changed hands. And they also sort of framed it as this bigger story that David Pecker is at the center of because the charges are related to the payments of Stormy Daniels. But what prosecutors say is it was just one piece of a broader scheme where uh, Karen McDougal was paid off, where Adorn man for Trump Tower was also paid off and that it all started with this one meeting with Michael Cohen, Donald Trump and David Pecker. And that's how they opened their case today. So they opened their case as David Pecker, the central man at the center of what happened here. All right, Livia Rubin, Jerry Goldfeder, thank you both so much. And you can pretty much assume that Trump's trial is a reality show that he never really wanted. And at this point, he can't delay it any further either, even though he'd love to. It's the only one of four prosecutions of Trump to go to trial before the election this year. And a lot is on the line. Former special counsel to the Trump White House, Ty Cobb, joins me now. Uh, Ty, great to see you again. I guess overall question here, what do you think about this particular case being the one to hang history on? I think it's unfortunate. It's nice to be with you again, Kara. Um, I think it's unfortunate that this is the first case because uh, the two most serious cases, obviously, are the two federal cases where he uh, ran rampant over the Constitution and uh, uh, attempted uh, to uh, obstruct the, uh, you know, uh, transfer of power. Um, so I think those. I think those are the most serious cases. I think this is probably the least serious case. On the other hand. It presents him in a personally very abhorrent way. Um, sordid affair with Stormy Daniels, um, you know, payments to Karen McDougal for a long um, standing affair, uh, David Pecker and the, you know, catch and kill stories, and of course, Michael Cohen. And, you know, the, the, the difficulty with some of the uh, attacks on Cohen, uh, all of which are valid, by the way, but the difficulty with those attacks is you got to remember that Cohen was. Trump's, you know, asset. Trump, Cohen was Trump's friend. Cohen was Trump's uh, consigliore. So um, yes, Cohen is a bad guy, but Trump knew that and hired him for that purpose. Point well made. It's sort of like Trump's misogyny is on trial here in New York when you, you start to hear about everything so far that's been presented, like with David Pecker. I mean, what did you make of that? His longtime friend helped, you know, protect him uh, from from damaging stories. He was head of the National Enquirer. Why start with David Pecker, you think? Well, I think you want to start with, you know, somebody who can put um, you know, some meat on the bones. Um, and you want to probably take the person that is most credible from that group, certainly in the, you know, David Cohen, Stormy Daniels, David Pecker, Troika, 
Uh, David Pecker is the most credible person uh, just because he had a longstanding business career. He's more nimble uh, on the stand than uh, the other two will be. And, and he's more sophisticated in terms of, you know, uh, going back and forth with uh, advocates and um, aggressors on the other side. So I think, um, you know, he's going to be he's going to be as good as it gets, frankly, for the prosecution. And uh, starting with him makes makes perfect sense, particularly where they can get the broad outlines of the alleged scheme. Now, I think, you know, the um, most interesting issue with Pecker is the extent to which he's going to be able to tie uh, any of this conduct to actual concerns about the election. Uh, because keep in mind, this, this is a misdemeanor bookkeeping trial uh, that has got a hook into um, uh, trying to avoid other crimes, those crimes being campaign finance laws. And it's the tie to the campaign finance laws that is essential for the government in order to get a felony conviction. Definitely. I mean, a simple record keeping case made much more complicated by the felony um, charge. So let me ask you, you know, you were the defense attorney who represented the Trump White House during the special counsel, uh, Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. I, I'm just curious if you were still having to represent Trump. Do you think you could defend him in a case like this? I mean, I'm throwing spaghetti at the wall here and just seeing what you're going to say. Would you be able to defend him? How would you take this case on? So I think there is a good defense, and I think that um, Todd Blanche is, and you know his uh, co-counsel are you know, well-suited to present that defense. I think, though, that Trump has really hampered this case by insisting on continue to lie about uh, not having had the sexual tryst with uh, Stormy Daniels and not having had the affair with uh, Ms. McDougal. I think those lies um, make it very, very difficult uh, to cross-examine those witnesses because it's not going to, it's not going to be, it's not going to be the issue of, you know, uh, did it, did, you know, why did you do this? It's going to be, did it happen at all? And it's, it's clear that it happened. Ty Cobb, great to have you. And of course, uh, you were right there uh, through through many of the the allegations, uh, truths, and uh, and uh, twisted situations that we all had to cover. And I just appreciate you um, bringing more light onto this for us. Great to see you. Great to be with you. Thank you. Now to the Middle East crisis and the man who was the symbol of the failure to prevent the deadliest attack in Israel's history. Netanyahu's head of military intelligence has resigned. The major general is the highest ranking Israeli official to step down since the Hamas led attack back on October 7th. This resignation happening as a special State Department panel here in our nation's capital is also recommending to sanction Israeli military units linked to human rights abuses. Let's bring in our foreign correspondent, Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, along with our senior national policy reporter, Ann Flaherty. So Tom, let's just talk about, about the resignation, first of all, uh, of this major general. Um, do you think he is the sole person responsible for, for the lack of intelligence uh, that led to that Hamas attack back on October 7th? Or do you think he's just taking the fall for the prime minister? Well, he's certainly not the sole person responsible for that intelligence failure, uh, Kira. I mean, he's definitely one of the top people in charge at the time. I mean, he, as you said, he headed up military intelligence. He's still in charge at the moment, but he is going to resign. And he's the first senior military officer to, to resign in connection with those intelligence failures of the dead, for the deadliest terror attack in Israeli history. I mean, in his resignation letter, he effectively says that the intelligence directorate of the IDF simply didn't live up to the task. And he says he'll carry that black day uh, with him for forever. But uh, just to remind people, you know, the Israeli intelligence had a document which they codenamed the Jericho Wall. And effectively, they had that about a year before the attack actually happened. And it was, in effect, a blueprint of Hamas's plan. It, it really was a sort of premonition of the actual tactics that Hamas ended up uh, using, deploying to get over the border fence, to storm into southern Israel and to massacre 1,200 people and take hundreds of hostages. Uh, there were other intelli uh, intelligence failures too, unusual uh, SIM card cell phone activity in the hours running up to it, warnings from surveillance officers, mainly female surveillance officers, down on the Gaza border uh, to their superiors, which were ultimately ignored. So there's a massive, massive intelligence failure. And although he's the first person to resign, the first mi senior military officer, I don't think he'll be the last.
So, and the U.S. is set now to make this decision on whether to withhold military aid to Israeli units that have been accused of human rights abuse. What more do we know about exactly what they're being accused uh, of doing? Yeah, Karen, this would be a big deal if this happens. We heard from Secretary Blinken saying that he was considering it, and we've seen reporting that there was one unit in particular, an IDF battalion, accused of torture operating in the West Bank. This is prior to October 7th, which I think is an important thing to note. Uh, but there have been questions about how this battalion has handled itself. Now, under U.S. law, we're not allowed to give federal money to military units that are accused of gross human rights violations. So the question is whether or not uh, this has triggered this this law, which is called the Leahy Act. Uh, Blinken says he's looking at it. He's going to make a determination in coming days. We know he's speaking right now, but uh, we're not expecting to hear any news on that today. We do expect it later this week, Kira. All right. And thank you, Tom. Appreciate you. So for the first time in decades back at here at home, the Supreme Court is hearing a major case involving homelessness. The justices are weighing whether cities can actually fine unhoused people for sleeping outside. Advocates say this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. It comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. And our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, has been following this story from the very beginning. Um, Devin, just kind of lay out what the arguments are that the justices are hearing today. A fascinating case, Kira, uh, about a problem a lot of cities are confronting, especially on the West Coast, as you mentioned. What can cities do to try to incentivize homeless people to take advantage of resources, possibly shelters that are in their community, and get off the streets, clear out public parks and public sidewalks? The city of Grants Pass, Oregon, in this case, passed a law a few years ago saying it was a crime for anyone to sleep outside with a blanket in an effort to try to get homeless people out of their city parks off Little League fields. Uh, but the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Kira, said that that would be cruel and unusual punishment because Grants Pass does not have any public uh, homeless shelters. And today, uh, just a short time ago, the justices here at the Supreme Court concluded more than two and a half hours of arguments over this very question. Is it cruel and unusual? And I got to say, Kira, the conservative majority here was very sympathetic to the city. They no doubt were acknowledging the difficulties of homelessness and those that people uh, have living in the streets, but they seem to suggest that cities have to retain some ability, even if it means giving out a ticket or a citation, to try to get some of these encampments cleared out, Kira. So you actually spoke with a number of people there in Grant, pa in Grant Pass, including the executive director of the only private homeless shelter in town. And I want to point out, only private homeless shelter in town. What did he tell you, and why isn't there more support for those that are struggling? There is one shelter in Grants Pass, Cura. It's a Christian shelter. They require you, if you stay there, to go to church to give up drinking, smoking, drugs, and your pets if you have them. And a lot of homeless people in that community I talked to struggled with those addictions or had pets or simply didn't want to worship. And so they didn't go to the shelter. But that's one of the questions in this case. How involuntary is homelessness? Well, here's what the director of that shelter had to say. Take a listen. The Ninth Circuit said that it's cruel and unusual punishment sure. on the part of Grants Pass to cite and fine some homeless folks for living in the park when there's right. nowhere else to go. Well, that's the part, that's the big question. Is there nowhere else to go or is there just nowhere else that they want to go? And so we heard that argument again today repeatedly here at the court, Kira. It was picked up by the conservatives. Uh, they didn't really buy this idea that homelessness is entirely involuntary. And so perhaps cities like Grants Pass, and we heard it today, can in fact lawfully enforce laws like these to nudge people along, Kira. We'll see what the court says at the end of June when they issue their decision. We'll follow it. Devin, thank you. Back. And coming up, time's up for TikTok how a new bill that's headed for the Senate could lead to a complete ban of the social media platform. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. 
traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Now to the security, safety, even suspensions that happened at Columbia University. Classes are taking place remotely today as part of increased safety measures after those anti-Israel protests on campus. Police say at least 100 people have been arrested so far. The university's president calling for a reset there on school grounds ahead of the first night of Passover, which begins tonight. Our Stephanie Ramos is on the story for us. So, Steph, these were not peaceful protests. I mean, students were arrested and even suspended. That's right, Kira. And, and I'm outside Columbia University right now. You can see there are demonstrators here, pro-Palestinian demonstrators, pro-Israel demonstrators. The friction is worsening here at the school. There are a lot of shouting matches. There is some conflict. The NYPD is standing ready to ready to interact if they need to. We we know that they're across the street right now. Uh, it seems like though it seems as though they are wearing riot gear, helmets, have got the baton, uh, but they are not involved just yet right now it's just the two groups kind of going at each other uh, but we know what we saw last week pro-palestinian demonstrators pitching tents on the campus refusing to leave the university uh, unless the university met their demands which included uh, divesting from companies with ties to israel the uh, school called the police as you mentioned at least a hundred people were uh, arrested uh, but that did not deter other groups we know that pro-palestinian demonstrators not affiliated with the university also uh, joined some protests over the weekend, Kira. All right, so let's talk about additional security measures uh, that the school, the NYPD is now taking. And since classes are happening remotely, um, have you seen any staff, teachers getting involved? Uh, not that I know of, and if they are, it, it's hard to tell if they are staff, if they are teachers, professors. We know that there are a lot of different groups kind of kind of joining in and in, 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 in these demonstrations. Uh, what we do know, that, and as you mentioned, this is the first night of Passover. We know that NYPD officials have said because it is a, hol a Jewish holiday, it may be a catalyst for acts of violence or extremist group to take advantage. Uh, so they are keeping a close eye on that. But this university has said that they, they don't want to so much involve the police. They want to step up and double up on the campus public safety officers that they have before uh, calling the police again, which is what they did last week, and has not deterred groups from coming back to the campus to protest. Kira. All right, Stephanie Ramos, uh, Ramos for us there. We'll continue to stay in close touch with you, especially as these protests are ongoing. So the massive foreign aid package before the Senate includes a bill that could potentially ban TikTok in the U.S. That bill giving Chinese-owned ByteDance one year to divest TikTok or face a nationwide ban. Janae Norman has more on what it could mean for content creators and more than 170 million TikTok users. Today I'm saying my final goodbye to TikTok. The clock could be ticking for popular app TikTok. 
Breaking news right now, the House of Representatives has officially passed another TikTok ban. Over the weekend, the House of Representatives passing legislation that could see the app banned in the U.S. if Chinese owner ByteDance doesn't sell within a year. The two options are sell to a U.S. owner or cease operating in the U.S. An unprecedented move that sparked serious concerns for some content creators. I'm happier than I have ever been. And it is because this app has opened the door for me to figure out how I can make a difference in the world. There are over 170 million users on TikTok in the U.S. Many, like content creator Jennifer Gay, have found financial security from the platform. Suddenly my voice mattered and I had a purpose and I started living boldly. 100% of my livelihood is connected to TikTok. The TikTok ban is a response to top intelligence and lawmakers' concerns that user data could become compromised. A TikTok spokesperson calling the move unfortunate, telling ABC News the bill would trample the free speech rights of 170 million Americans, devastate 7 million businesses, and shutter a platform that contributes $24 billion to the U.S. economy annually. I don't think it's going to pass First Amendment scrutiny because I think there are less restrictive alternatives. We could have uh, made it a, a crime to transfer Americans' data to an adversarial foreign nation or foreign state interference. Bill has now passed the House and it is on the fast track to becoming actual law. The Senate is expected to take up the legislation tomorrow and if passed, President Biden has already indicated he will quickly sign it into law. But... Not so fast. Experts say don't expect the app to go away anytime soon. It's not like the app is going to delete off your phone right away. It could be months. It could be years of, of waiting through regulatory and legal hurdles to actually get this done. All right, Tanae, thank you. And coming up, it sparked 90s nostalgia for fans around the world. A surprise Spice Girls reunion would we'll take you inside the party next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I'm Rob Marciano in Tampa, Florida, reporting in Hurricane Adalia. Wherever the weather may take you, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Some other top headlines we're following for you this hour on ABC News Live. Toxic smoke blanketing India's capital after a massive landfill fire. That blaze in the outskirts of Delhi, and it's carrying fumes across the city. Residents saying that they're having difficulty breathing and that the size of the trash mound is actually being compared to 40 football fields wide, 200 feet high. 
Firefighters are working to contain the fire as authorities investigate the cause. Police say they've arrested a man who broke into L.A. Mayor Karen Bass's home. Bass was reportedly there at the time of the incident. It's unknown if she had an interaction with the suspect, but no injuries were reported. Mayor Bass says she's grateful for the response of the LAPD. And stop right now and enjoy this impromptu Spice Girls reunion that took place at Victoria Beckham's 50th birthday bash over the weekend. Oh yeah, the Fisum treated uh, guests at the star-studded event to a recreation of the dance from the music video for their 1997 hit, Stop, and Beckham, a.k.a. Posh Spice, called it the best night ever. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. A lot more news on the other side. We'll be right back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You Watch do. you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, history happening before our eyes. Court wrapping just a short time ago in the first ever criminal trial against a former president of the United States. Presidents have been impeached. They've resigned. They've been voted out of office. But for the first time ever, former President Donald Trump is facing a jury of his peers in criminal court. It's all stemming from charges related to that payment to a porn star, hoping to hide an alleged affair with Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Prosecutors and defense attorneys now starting to lay out their cases. The state already calling the first witness to the stand, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, who they say was part of that scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about Trump. Let's bring in our investigative reporter, Olivia Rubin, just outside court there, senior reporter Catherine Falders, and Tim Jansen, criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor. Olivia, big day for both sides, actually, uh, and the first chance to present uh, the cases or each side to the jury. What stood out to you? Well, I think a lot of uh, Donald Trump's attorney, Todd Blanche's arguments were really fascinating. And that's always what's so interesting about opening statements on the day of a trial, because it's really the first time you hear the defense's case in earnest. And something we saw from Donald Trump's team today was a really interesting strategy, which was essentially, Kira, blame Michael Cohen. And Todd Blanche spent a lot of time of his opening statement in front of that jury, setting up the scene of who Michael Cohen was. He called him a criminal, someone who is obsessed obsessed with Donald Trump, someone who wanted to stop at nothing to make sure that he ended up in jail. And essentially what he said was that Michael Cohen was a criminal long before he even worked for Donald Trump and that he just wanted to work with him and get close to him. But Donald Trump did not know that he was hiring a criminal. And why that's so important is because it was Michael Cohen's invoices every single month in 2017 for the repayments that are really at heart uh, in this case here. So what the team is trying to do is essentially say, hey, it's Michael Cohen who made the invoices. He put it as legal fees. He's the one that, you know, uh, has essentially 
essentially started a lot of this and they, it was a lot of blame shifting onto him, which I think we could have expected to see, but it was fascinating to see how much time Todd Blanche actually spent setting up, uh, attacking the credibility of Michael Cohen. So Catherine, why choose David Pecker as the first witness here? Well, you heard Olivia just talk about the credibility of Michael Cohen, of course, something that the defense will attack and something the prosecutors acknowledge. So I think in calling Pecker, he's another witness here to what's alleged to be his role in brokering this payment, for example. They're going to also discuss a meeting that occurred in 2015 between Pecker, Trump, and Cohen, where Pecker allegedly agreed to use his media empire to help defend Trump's presidential campaign. So he's a witness who prosecutors hope can add more credibility to what you will potentially hear from Michael Cohen, his former lawyer and fixer, Trump's former lawyer and fixer, later on in the trial. All right, Tim, prosecutors alleging that Trump committed election fraud, that the hush money payments were not spin or communication strategies, but a coordinated conspiracy to influence the 2016 election. What's your thought? Do they have a case to back this up? Well, they're trying to buttress Michael Cohen because they have to. He's got zero credibility. The problem they have with this is NDAs are legal, catch and kill is, is legal. The only thing they're claiming is illegal was he tried to influence the election by mischaracterizing the invoices as legal fees. Well, who did that? Michael Cohen did that. And you know, if you really get down to, they have to prove intent by President Trump. Well, so what happens? These records, if the records were done properly, right, and they put in there paying hush money, those records would not have been released till after the election. So what would his intent have been to uh, uh, steal the election by hiding this? Um, and you look at Michael Cohen's payments. He got $420,000 in legal fees after that. Um, Trump wouldn't have been paying. He doesn't like to pay. Uh, I think the state's going to have a hard time because they have to rely on Cohen. They don't want to, and they're gonna introduce all this other stuff like Pecker, um, and he all he does, he's just you know a vegetable when you got the meat of the case is gonna be Michael Cohen, what he did, his vindictive and vendetta against Trump. He's a horrible witness, everyone knows it, and we'll see what the jury believes anything he says. So bottom line, you're saying you would never let Trump take the stand if you were representing him. <laughs> that, well, the problem you have, the judge has already ruled for impeachment purposes, a lot of bad things are going to come in, some that are questionable, some are probably proper, but a jury can decide to convict them just on those events and not what's charged in this indictment. Well, Catherine, then we've got the Access Hollywood tapes being brought back into the fold once again, in which talk talks about how easily it is to sexually assault women. I mean, he still became president even after those tapes were exposed. So could it be any different this time around? Kira, it's a good question. So many people have heard that tape for years and years now. Now, I say heard. Uh, it won't be heard in court. Trump's words are allowed to be read aloud from that tape. That's what the judge ruled. They've already been read aloud in that courtroom earlier today and before the jury. Uh, I think it's too early to tell whether this specifically has any effect uh, down the road, if it's specifically the Access Hollywood tape with voters, if it's if, for example, Trump is convicted, if that has more of an effect. We'll, we'll just have to see what the polls ultimately show. But surely it's part of the conversation again. And as you've noted, it's something that he doesn't particularly like out there. He knew that this was quite a problem during his campaign when it first came out. So we'll see how he reacts to that after court. It did seem that um, Trump wasn't particularly happy, potentially violated that gag order again. So I'm not sure that he loves sitting there hearing all of this evidence come out and be uh, at least discussed before the jury. So just to follow up on in light of all that, how salacious this case is, Tim, um, would it be smart for Trump to take the stand? There's talk about it. There's there's lawyers in a panic that have been talking about it. Would it be a good strategy or could it be just a complete nightmare? I think it would be really bad optics. I think it's fraught with problems. And the image of a former president sitting on the stand defending himself is going to lower his standard that they don't want to do. You heard in the opening, they're trying to build him as a regular person. They're calling this President Trump because he was elected. Putting him on the stand and fighting these allegations when it doesn't seem that the evidence is going to require it. 
if they and the state carries a burden. And if they can't prove intent or he had anything to do with those invoices at, or had knowledge how they were invoiced, they were not going to be able to meet the standard. And court, Olivia, is set to resume with David Pecker once again back on the stand tomorrow. What can we expect? Well, prosecutors, when they first got up in front of the jury this morning, laid David Pecker at the center of their story. They opened to the jury with essentially this meeting between Pecker, Michael Cohen, and Trump, where they said they made this agreement that they were going to buy stories and kill them, and Trump was going to pay Michael Cohen back. So we didn't hear anything uh, about that from him today. He was only on the stand for about 30 minutes. So it's going to be up to them to get into sort of the meat of that testimony when he resumes tomorrow. But I would say, Kira, David Pecker is back on the stand at 11 a.m., but Donald Trump is back in court at 9.30 a.m. because the judge is holding that hearing on the potential gag order violations. Remember, prosecutors say he violated the gag order at least 10 times. Some of those posts by attacking witness Michael Cohen, what his lawyers did in front of the jury today. So we'll see what, uh, you know, the judge ends up doing about that. But it's fascinating how they're, you know, attacking Michael Cohen's credibility in front of the jury today. And tomorrow, Donald Trump Trump will be uh, heard as the reasons why he shouldn't be held in contempt for doing the same thing, which he cannot do per the gag order. All right, Catherine, Olivia, Tim, thank you all so much. Now to the Middle East crisis and the man who was the symbol of the failure to prevent the deadliest attack in Israel's history, Netanyahu, head of military intelligence, has resigned. The major general is the highest ranking Israeli official to step down since the Hamas-led attack back on October 7th. This resignation, happening as a special State Department panel here in our nation's capital, is also recommending to sanction Israeli military units linked to human rights abuses. Let's bring in our foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, along with our senior national national policy reporter and Flaherty. So Tom, let's just talk about, about the resignation, first of all, uh, of this major general. Um, do you think he is the sole person responsible for, for the lack of intelligence uh, that led to that Hamas attack back on October 7th? Or do you think he's just taking the fall for the prime minister? Well, he's certainly not the sole person responsible for that intelligence failure, uh, Kira. I mean, he's definitely one of the top people in charge at the time. I mean, he, as you said, he headed up military intelligence. He's still in charge at the moment, but he is going to resign. And he's the first senior military officer to, to resign in connection with those intelligence failures of the dead, for the deadliest terror attack in Israeli history. I mean, in his resignation letter, he effectively says that the intelligence directorate of the IDF uh, simply didn't live up to the task. And he says he'll carry that black day uh, with him for forever. But uh, just to remind people, you look, the Israeli intelligence had a document which they codenamed the Jericho Wall. And effectively, they had that about a year before the attack actually happened. And it was, in effect, a blueprint of Hamas's plan. It, it really was a sort of premonition of the actual tactics that Hamas ended up uh, using, deploying to get over the border fence, to storm into southern Israel, and to massacre 1,200 people and take hundreds of hostages. Uh, there were other intelli intelligence failures too, unusual uh, SIM card cell phone activity in the hours running up to it, warnings from surveillance officers, mainly female surveillance officers, down on the Gaza border uh, to their superiors, which were ultimately ignored. So there's a massive, massive intelligence failure, and although he's the first person to resign, the first mil senior military officer, I don't think he'll be the last. So, Anne, the U.S. is set now to make this decision on whether to withhold military aid to Israeli units that have been accused of human rights abuse. What more do we know about exactly what they're being accused uh, of doing? Yeah, Karen, this would be a big deal if this happens. We heard from Secretary Blinken saying that he was considering it, and we've seen reporting that there was one unit in particular, an IDF battalion, accused of torture operating in the West Bank. This is prior to October 7th, which I think is an important thing to note. Uh, but there have been questions about how this battalion has handled itself. Now, under U.S. law, we're not allowed to give federal money to military units that are accused of gross human rights violations. So the question is whether or not uh, this has triggered this this law, which is called the Leahy Act. Uh, Blinken says he's looking at it. He's going to make a determination in coming days. We know he's speaking right now, but uh, we're not expecting to hear any news on that today. We do expect it later this week, Kira. All right. And thank you, Tom. Appreciate you.
So for the first time in decades back at here at home, the Supreme Court is hearing a major case involving homelessness. The justices are weighing whether cities can actually fine unhoused people for sleeping outside. Advocates say this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. It comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. And our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, has been following this story from the very beginning. Um, Devin, just kind of lay out what the arguments are that the justices are hearing today. A fascinating case, Kira, uh, about a problem a lot of cities are confronting, especially on the West Coast, as you mentioned. What can cities do to try to incentivize homeless people to take advantage of resources, possibly shelters that are in their community, and get off the streets, clear out public parks and public sidewalks? The city of Grants Pass, Oregon, in this case, passed a law a few years ago saying it was a crime for anyone to sleep outside with a blanket in an effort to try to get homeless people out of their city parks off Little League fields, uh, but the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals Cura said that that would be cruel and unusual punishment because Grants Pass does not have any public uh, homeless shelters. And today, uh, just a short time ago, the justices here at the Supreme Court concluded more than two and a half hours of arguments over this very question. Is it cruel and unusual? And I got to say, Kira, the conservative majority here was very sympathetic to the city. They no doubt were acknowledging the difficulties of homelessness and those that people uh, have living in the streets, but they seem to suggest that cities have to retain some ability, even if it means giving out a ticket or a citation, to try to get some of these encampments cleared out, Kira. So you actually spoke with a number of people there in Grant, pa in Grant Pass, including the executive director of the only private homeless shelter in town. And I want to point out, only private homeless shelter in town. What did he tell you, and why isn't there more support for those that are struggling? There is one shelter in Grants Pass, Cura. It's a Christian shelter. They require you, if you stay there, to go to church to give up drinking, smoking, drugs, and your pets if you have them. And a lot of homeless people in that community I talked to struggled with those addictions or had pets or simply didn't want to worship. And so they didn't go to the shelter. But that's one of the questions in this case. How involuntary is homelessness? Well, here's what the director of that shelter had to say. Take a listen. The Ninth Circuit said that it's cruel and unusual punishment sure. on the part of Grants Pass to cite and fine some homeless folks for living in the park when there's right. nowhere else to go. Well, that's the part, that's the big question. Is there nowhere else to go? Or is there just nowhere else that they want to go? And so we heard that argument again today repeatedly here at the court, Kira. It was picked up by the conservatives. Uh, they didn't really buy this idea that homelessness is entirely involuntary. And so perhaps cities like Grants Pass, and we heard it today, can in fact lawfully enforce laws like these to nudge people along, Kira. We'll see what the court says at the end of June when they issue their decision. We'll follow it. Devin, thank you. And coming up, time's up for TikTok. How a new bill that's headed for the Senate could lead to a complete ban of the social media platform. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I watch do. you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! <laughs> For our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Now to the security, safety, even suspensions that happened at Columbia University. Classes are taking place remotely today as part of increased safety measures. After those anti-Israel protests on campus, police say at least 100 people have been arrested so far. The university's president calling for a reset there on school grounds ahead of the first night of Passover, which begins tonight. Our Stephanie Ramos is on the story for us. So, Steph, these were not peaceful protests. I mean, students were arrested and even suspended. That's right, Kira. And, and I'm outside Columbia University right now. You can see there are demonstrators here, pro-Palestinian demonstrators, pro-Israel demonstrators. The friction is worsening here at the school. There are a lot of shouting matches. There is some conflict. The NYPD is standing ready to ready to interact if they need to. We we know that they're across the street right now. Uh, it seems like though it seems as though they are wearing riot gear, helmets. They've got the baton, uh, but they are not involved just yet. Right now, it's just the two groups kind of going at each other. Uh, but we know what we saw last week, pro-Palestinian demonstrators pitching tents on the campus, refusing to leave the university uh, unless the university met their demands, which included uh, divesting from companies with ties to Israel. The school called the police. As you mentioned, at least 100 people were uh, arrested. Uh, but that did not deter other groups. We know that pro-Palestinian demonstrators not affiliated with the university also uh, joined some protests over the weekend, Kira. All right, so let's talk about additional security measures uh, that the school, the NYPD is now taking. And since classes are happening remotely, um, have you seen any staff, teachers getting involved? Uh, not that I know of, and if they are, it's hard to tell if they are staff, if they are teachers, professors. We know that there are a lot of different groups kind of kind of joining in and in, 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 in these demonstrations. Uh, what we do know, that, and as you mentioned, this is the first night of Passover. We know that NYPD officials have said because it is a, ho a Jewish holiday, it may be a catalyst for acts of violence or extremist group to take advantage. Uh, so they are keeping a close eye on that. But this university has said that they, they don't want to so much involve the police. They want to step up and double up on the campus public safety officers that they have before uh, calling the police again, which is what they did last week, and has not deterred groups from coming back to the campus to protest. Kira. All right, Stephanie Ramos, uh, Ramos for us there. We'll continue to stay in close touch with you, especially as these protests are ongoing. So the massive foreign aid package before the Senate includes a bill that could potentially ban TikTok in the U.S., that bill giving Chinese-owned Bite dance one year to divest TikTok or face a nationwide ban. Janae Norman has more on what it could mean for content creators and more than 170 million TikTok users. Today I'm saying my final goodbye to TikTok. The clock could be ticking for a popular app, TikTok. Breaking news right now, the House of Representatives has officially passed another TikTok ban. Over the weekend, the House of Representatives passing legislation that could see the app banned in the U.S. if Chinese owner ByteDance doesn't sell within a year. The two options are sell to a U.S. owner or cease operating in the U.S. An unprecedented move that sparked serious concerns for some content creators. I'm happier than I have ever been. And it is because this app has opened the door for me to figure out how I can make a difference in the world. There are over 170 million users on TikTok in the U.S. Many, like content creator Jennifer Gay, have found financial security from the platform. 
Suddenly my voice mattered and I had a purpose and I started living boldly. 100% of my livelihood is connected to TikTok. The TikTok ban is a response to top intelligence and lawmakers' concerns that user data could become compromised. A TikTok spokesperson calling the move unfortunate, telling ABC News the bill would trample the free speech rights of 170 million Americans, devastate 7 million businesses, and shutter a platform that contributes $24 billion to the U.S. economy annually. I don't think it's going to pass First Amendment scrutiny because I think there are less restrictive alternatives. We could have uh, made it a, a crime to transfer Americans' data to an adversarial foreign nation or foreign state interference. Bill has now passed the House and it is on the fast track to becoming actual law. The Senate is expected to take up the legislation tomorrow and if passed, President Biden has already indicated he will quickly sign it into law. But... Not so fast. Experts say don't expect the app to go away anytime soon. It's not like the app is going to delete off your phone right away. It could be months, it could be years of, of waiting through regulatory and legal hurdles to actually get this done. All right, Tanae, thank you. And coming up, it sparked 90s nostalgia for fans around the world. A surprise Spice Girls reunion would we'll take you inside the party next. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping... Make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. <laughs> Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! <laughs> 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. From the team that brought you the DuPont Award-winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports, streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Other top headlines were falling for you this hour on ABC News Live. Toxic smoke blanketing India's capital after a massive landfill fire. That blaze in the outskirts of Delhi, and it's carrying fumes across the city. Residents saying that they're having difficulty breathing, and that the size of the trash mound is actually being compared to 40 football fields wide, 200 feet high. Firefighters are working to contain the fire as authorities investigate the cause. Police say they've arrested a man who broke into L.A. Mayor Karen Bass's home. Bass was reportedly there at the time of the incident. It's unknown if she had an interaction with the suspect, but no injuries were reported. Mayor Bass says she's grateful for the response of the LAPD. And stop right now and enjoy this impromptu Spice Girls reunion that took place at Victoria Beckham's 50th birthday bash over the weekend. Right now, thank you very much. I need somebody with a human touch. 
Oh yeah, the Fisum treated uh, guests at the star-studded event to a recreation of the dance from the music video for their 1997 hit Stop and Beckham, AKA Posh Spice, called it the best night ever. Thanks for streaming with us, I'm Kira Phillips. A lot more news on the other side, we'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, history happening before our eyes. Court wrapping just a short time ago in the first ever criminal trial against a former president of the United States. Presidents have been impeached, they've resigned, they've been voted out of office, but for the first time ever, former President Donald Trump is facing a jury of his peers in criminal court. And it's all stemming from charges related to that payment to porn star Stormy Daniels, hoping to hide an alleged affair with her before the 2016 election. Prosecutors and defense attorneys now starting to lay out their cases. The state already calling in the first witness, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, who they say was part of that scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about Trump. We do have team coverage, starting off with our senior investigative course on Eric Kintersky. He's outside court there. We also have Tim Jansen, criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor Aaron. Paint us a picture of inside court today. What stood out to you? There was former President Trump seated at the defense table, slouched in his seat. The jury walked in. He had to stand, but did not appear to look at the jury. And he sat there rather passively, occasionally maybe subtly shaking his head as if to say no, as prosecutors with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office accused him of election fraud, pure and simple, by paying hush money to porn actress Stormy Daniels and then logging it as a legal expense. Illegally, prosecutors say, because they believe it was meant to conceal information that voters in 2016 should have been able to know to make a better informed choice. Trump perked up a little bit more when his defense attorney Todd Blanche said he committed no crime and tried to distance him from the hush payment. But there was Trump leaning forward with his arms crossed on the defense table, something of a glower on his face when his friend David Pecker, the longtime publisher of the National Enquirer, became the first witness. Nothing terribly substantive from Pecker, but, but you could tell Trump was not happy to see someone he considered a friend there testifying against him. Tim, if convicted, I mean, his freedom is at stake here. Could we actually see the former president being taken away in handcuffs? Well, that would be really bad optics. I don't even think this judge, who's not a friend of Trump, for a first-time offender, 
on a, fan, on a technical offense that probably would not call for incarceration. I think the purpose of the trial is, is not for incarceration. Um, so I would find that very difficult. I think the judge would be misplaced to do that. So, Aaron, where do you see this going tomorrow with David Pecker? What more could we hear him say? I think that we're going to get to the substance of why he's the first witness. He is going to take the jury inside a meeting at Trump Tower in 2015. Donald Trump had announced his candidacy, and Pecker, according to prosecutors, promised to be his eyes and ears. He would buy and then bury any unflattering stories about Trump, whether it be a doorman's claim that Trump fathered a kid out of wedlock, uh, a Playboy model's claim of a sexual affair, and then Stormy Daniels, the adult film actress, and her claim of a sexual tryst with Trump. He denies all of that, but David Pecker was part of what prosecutors called a, a, a triumvirate con conspiracy with Michael Cohen and Trump himself to make sure voters did not know everything that they might have been entitled to before they made their choice in 2016. And Tim, Aaron describes uh, all the stories, allegations against the president as very unflattering. Uh, I think there would be a lot of other people that would use different terms when you think of a former president and someone also uh, who's leading in the polls uh, to possibly uh, win this, this White House. I mean, how would you defend this case if you were a part of Trump's defense team? Well, I think that uh, Todd is doing the same thing that I would do. I would lay out that he's innocent, that the state carries the burden, that the government's witnesses are not to be believed. And even if you believe part of what they're saying, they still cannot prove intent that he didn't fill out the invoice. He didn't produce those records the lawyers did, the accountant did, that sure, he's going to probably have the John Edwards defense, right? He was trying to save his family reputation and his brand. It worked for John Edwards. And while they, they, they bring all this salacious material in, Stormy Daniels, remember, she was done 10 years ago. Only when Trump started to come up in the polls and get the nomination did she want to get a payday. Cohen wanted to get a payday. The Playboy said she wanted a payday. Everybody wanted a payday. And Trump's going to say, I, it's not illegal to pay hush money. It's not illegal to pay for non-disclosure agreements. What happened here is what Cohen did and the accountant. You know, I was trying to look it up real quickly. Yes, it was. John Edwards' extramarital affair was exposed in the National Enquirer. So this is the same, the same publisher, the same publication that we're talking about here. Um, yet, uh, clearly, his story wasn't uh, bought and buried. Um, Aaron, tomorrow the judge is also going to hear arguments over whether Trump uh, disobeyed the limited gag order by posting those disparaging things about Michael Cohen and, and Stormy Daniels. Is that significant to the case at this point? Well, it could be for Trump because prosecutors are asking for a fine of $1,000 for each offending post. Now, that amount of money isn't going to mean much to Trump, but it could well be an indication that the judge is trying to set a particular tone and perhaps would curtail Trump from, from attacking witnesses, which is what prosecutors want. They say it's had a chilling effect on the ability of witnesses to come forward, and they don't want Trump doing it. Now, is he going to stop? He didn't today. In the hallway after court, as he was leaving, he said more uh, disparaging things about, about Cohen on his way out. Uh, but for prosecutors, uh, there's a gag order in place. Trump should follow it. All right, Aaron, Tim, thank you, gentlemen. Let's continue the conversation once again with Ty Cobb, former assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Maryland, also served as the special counsel to then-President Donald Trump during the investigation into Russian interference uh, in the 2016 presidential election. So, Ty, in January, you said that Trump poses the gravest threat to democracy that we have ever seen, specifically when asked about presidential immunity and what it covers. As we're watching all of this unfold, uh, this particular case, what's going through your mind? So I, this case doesn't have that much to do with democracy, unlike the two federal cases. On the other hand, it's a sad day for America. I mean, now our country has been exposed as a country stupid enough, you know, to elect pre as a president somebody who's been indicted four times and is now standing trial in a case involving a sordid uh, affair with a porn star and a months-long affair with a Playboy model and 
you know, hush money payments and NDAs, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, none of that's illegal. And that's the difficulty that the uh, prosecution has in this case is tying uh, these um, uh, record keeping pay, uh, misdemeanors to an actual crime. And I think that's going to be difficult for them to do, not at trial. I think there's really no doubt that uh, this jury is likely to convict uh, uh, Donald Trump. But I think on appeal, there are some significant issues, and I'm sure the defense will be trying to seed those throughout the uh, cross-examinations of the various witnesses. You know, do you agree with Tim Jansen, what he just said uh, prior in the prior segment, that he doesn't see the president uh, being taken off in handcuffs and serving any prison time here? Absolutely. I, this is not a case uh, that uh, uh, typically would uh, result in prison time. First offender, uh, the amount of money is not consequential, $130,000 or even the, even the inflated amount paid to Cohen. Uh, plus, uh, you've got uh, uh, the fact that, you know, the conduct, you know, the affair with Stormy Daniels is 18 years old. Uh, the payments here were, you know, um, Eight years old, so it's it's not it's not uh, um, that the president poses an imminent threat uh, uh, of lawlessness in the sense of uh, danger to anybody. So I don't see I don't see jail time as as likely. And keep in mind that even if he did get jail time, he almost uh, certainly would get uh, a bond pending appeal, and he wouldn't be in in jail uh, during the campaign uh, based on this case. That, that was my next question. It's a lot of em embarrassing information. He can't control the narrative, which I'm sure is driving him nuts. He has to watch uh, everything he he does in that courtroom because the jury's looking at him and wants to see if he rolls his eyes or starts to sweat or uh, blurts out a comment. I mean, they're paying very close attention to that. But the bottom line is you brought it up. I mean, this is not new information. Um, and and it's just it's it's historic in the sense that it's a criminal trial and it's a former president and it's the first time that we've seen this, but is it going to impact his run for the White House? Could we still see President Trump, president of the United States, once again? I fear that's uh, possible, if not likely. Uh, at the same time, I think this case will have an impact, uh, uh, particularly on people who. You know, have even the slightest uh, open-mindedness because um, anybody who is trying to make a decision about who to vote for who hasn't already uh, uh, taken a side is going to be interested in uh, uh, these facts. And you know, most people don't have an encyclopedic uh, recollection of the Stormy Daniels affair, the McGoogle affair, uh, the hush money, the relationship with Cohen, uh, and then all the all the other uh, consequential things that Trump has done that would come up if he made the serious mistake of testifying. So I do think that people uh, will see a drip, drip, drip um, impact here that will affect their view of his character. Whether that is actually going to be enough to change his status as uh, the current uh, leader in the polls, hard to say. Um, I, I, I would hope so as a, as a citizen and a, uh, somebody who uh, believes that uh, the presidency is reserved for uh, only people of impeccable character, but I'm not sure it will. Point well made. Ty Cobb, great to see you. Thank you. Great to be with you, Kira. Thank you so much. You bet. Now to the Middle East, the crisis there, and the man who was the symbol of the failure to prevent the deadliest attack in Israel's history. Netanyahu's head of military intelligence has resigned. The major general is the highest-ranking Israeli official to step down since the Hamas-led attack back on October 7th. This resignation happening as a special State Department panel here in our nation's capital recommending to sanction Israeli military units linked to human rights abuses. For more, let's bring in our foreign correspondent, Tom Sufi Burridge in Tel Aviv, along with our senior national policy reporter, Ann Flaherty. So Tom, let's talk about the resignation here of the Major General and what it tells you about Israel's intelligence failure. Well, given the scale of the intelligence failings in the run-up to, and really on the night of October the 7th, Kira, I think it was almost an inevitability that the head of military intelligence would step down. Perhaps the more interesting thing is why it's taken him so long to do so, and that's really probably down to the fact that the IDF has been so busy with the war in Gaza, uh, up on the northern border against Hezbollah, uh, against Iranian proxies, and Iran itself, as we've seen in the last uh, few days. Uh, look, you know, the intelligence failings, it's kind of hard to overstate them. I mean, the IDF and the 
the intelligence community here had a dossier a year before uh, the actual terror attack itself. They called it Jericho Wall, and effectively, it was a blueprint. It really detailed the plan that ultimately Hamas uh, ended up executing. So I, I think the head of military intelligence stepping down uh, was inevitable. Uh, it has happened now, and I don't think he'll be the last senior military official here in Israel to step down because of those intelligence failings. So, Anne, in this annual report, the State Department is considering Gaza uh, in the midst of a s severe humanitarian crisis. And this comes as the U.S. is about to impose sanctions on this IDF unit and human rights abuses. Um, put this in context for us. Yeah, Kara, so we heard from Secretary Blinken just minutes ago who said, yeah, the U.S. is looking into whether or not Israel has committed human rights violations, war crimes, essentially. Uh, he said, we're not going to give anybody a, a cut here because they're simply an ally. We're, we're going to look at this process, do it fairly, and make a determination. So he said, you know, watch more of this space, but we'll follow the facts on that. You know, I think there are, are obviously a lot of questions, um, you know, worth pointing out the October 7th attack by Hamas a clear violation of any international standard of, uh, you know, war crimes and so forth. So, uh, but really for the U.S. to hold Israel accountable, um, it would be historic. We have not seen this law being applied to an IDF unit before. Kira? We'll follow it. Tom, Anne, thank you. So for the first time in decades, the Supreme Court is hearing a major case involving homelessness. The justices are hearing arguments for more than two and a half hours and appear to favor whether cities can fine unhoused people for sleeping outside. Advocates say that this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment, and it comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. Let's bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, who's been following it since the start. So let's just talk about how we got here and the implications of these arguments. Fascinating case, Kira. The biggest case on homelessness here at the Supreme Court in 40 years, and it comes from the city of Grants Pass, Oregon. I was out there a few weeks ago, and it looked like many other cities uh, nationwide that we've seen dealing with encampments in public places, parks, sidewalks. And the city in uh, Grants Pass decided to pass an ordinance that would make it a crime to sleep outside if you didn't have a home and used a blanket. A group of homeless people in the city uh, sued, uh, alleging a constitutional violation of federal appeals court agreed with them, said it was cruel and unusual punishment, and the city was here today at the Supreme Court appealing Cura, and as you said at the top, they found a very sympathetic arg uh, audience. A majority of the conservative justices today, while certainly empathetic to the unhoused uh, situation, uh, seem to say that it should be up to local officials to pass ordinances to regulate these encampments that, of course, have come with uh, issues of crime, public sanitation issues, um, and so uh, we'll have to see what the justices say, but as of now, uh, the city of Grants Pass fighting to get that law back on the books, Kira. All right, and you spoke with people in Grants Pass. What are they telling you? Well, one of the things that we heard repeatedly, Kira, is that this is uh, uh, pits residents of a community who want their leafy lined streets and kids to feel safe in public parks with advocates for the unhoused and soaring housing prices as so many different parts of the country. Those things colliding in public places. Uh, and here's a little bit of uh, some of the folks on both sides of this told us when we were out there. We're fighting between what the law is telling us and what the people want us to do and trying to make everybody happy. That's a big, huge struggle for us, a city government. Criminalizing the, the victims of our failed housing policy is morally wrong and it's unconstitutional. And that's essentially what the, city's, the city of Grants Pass has done by making it illegal for someone to exist while being homeless. Now, while the conservative justices, Kira, seemed sympathetic to the city, the three liberal justices on the court today did not mince words. They were aggressive, passionate, attacking the city for passing an ordinance like this. Justice Elena Kagan saying perhaps the city should just uh, uh, as well criminalize breathing on the sidewalk if they're going to go after sleeping. Uh, of course, uh, uh, an intense debate around a very complicated issue that cities are really struggling. Red cities, blue cities, red states, blue states as they try to get their arms around this. Record numbers of Americans right now, Kira, as you know, are homeless. So this case will have very big impact. Yep, state by state. Devin, thank you. You bet. Coming up, a deadly shooting at Delaware State University. The breaking news details next.
whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war, after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Breaking news right now, police in Delaware are searching for a suspect after an 18-year-old woman was shot and killed on the campus of Delaware State University. That victim has been identified as Kame Mitchell De Silva of Wilmington. According to investigators, De Silva was not a registered student at the university, but was visiting the campus with another student. Our Ike Ajachi is following the late-breaking details for us. Ike, what do you know? Well, Kira, we're being told right now again that that 18-year-old who was found shot and killed on the campus of Delaware State University went by the name of Kame Mitchell De Silva, obviously of Wilmington, Delaware. Now, officers say that this entire investigation started just before 2 a.m. when campus police were called to the area of the Warren Franklin Residential Hall for reports of shots fired. Now, once on scene, police officers say they found De Silva suffering from a gunshot wound to her upper body. She was transported to an area hospital where she was later pronounced dead. Now, according to investigators, De Silva was not a registered student at the universities. Officials say that De Silva and another non-student were visiting a student on campus at the time of the shooting. Now, we're being told no other injuries were reported. However, university leaders did say that the suspect was seen fleeing the uh, campus uh, on the direction of College Road, again, away from the campus. Now, we're being told that there will be a forum for students, faculty, staff, and parents on Tuesday tomorrow to share any updates of this case and obviously they're asking anybody with information to contact the Delaware police. Uh, we're being told that classes have been canceled for the rest of the day today. We have no word on whether those can, uh, classes rather will resume tomorrow but again the Delaware State Police is still conducting this active investigation and again they're asking anybody with any kind of information on the whereabouts of the possible suspect or any kind of information surrounding this incident should contact them as media, immediately and as fast as they can Kira. All right, we'll follow it. Ike, thank you. Some other top headlines we're tracking this hour for you. California will soon allow Arizona doctors to practice reproductive care in the Golden State, a retaliatory response to Arizona's 160-year abortion law going back into effect. Governor Gavin Newsom says he's pursuing emergency legislation, hoping to provide access for those fleeing Arizona and seeking reproductive care. Choo-choo, here comes that speed rail. Construction kicking off for the $12 billion high speed rail today that'll take commuters from Southern California to Vegas. That trip usually takes about mm, three hours by car, but will only take two hours each way by rail. Construction is expected to finish in 2028, just in time for the Summer Olympics there in LA. 
And in just the first few days, Taylor Swift's newest work, the tortured poets department, breaking record after record. It has become the most streamed album in a single day, raking in 300 million streams. The historic success also making Swift the most streamed artist in a single day. Straight ahead, working throughout South America to plant 10 million trees, hoping to restore thousands and thousands of acres of forests. We are kicking off our Earth Day series here on ABC News Live, The Power of Us. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismael? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The truck fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Taipei, Taiwan, I'm Britt Clement. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Environmental activist Florent Kaiser brings a whole new meaning to tree hugger. Matter of fact, he's so passionate about our world's forests that he spends every day looking for ways to scale up restoration and protection of our world's forest ecosystems. But it's not just all of us here at ABC that are honoring his work today on Earth Day, but Prince William has also celebrated his community led work as an Earthshot Prize winner. By co leading Axion Andina, Florent has worked throughout South America planting 10 million trees and restoring thousands and thousands of acres of high Andean forests. Regions critical for biodiversity because it's home to not only plant species but thousands of species of birds, reptiles and amphibians. Earthshot recipient Florent Kaiser joins me now. Florent, so good to see you. Talk about what inspired you to start Acción Andina and how did you know protecting these forest ecosystems were so important? Hi, Kira. Thanks. So, and thank you so much. Actually, our co-founder, Constantino Oka, who is a UN Earth Champion 2022, inspired us to start this work. He wanted to reforest the Andes with the communities he's from, indigenous communities of the high Andes in South America. And when we met Tino in, in 2018, he shared his dream. He wanted to go for what he had built in Cusco, in Peru, across the entire Andes. And we knew he couldn't do it alone. We knew we wouldn't be able to do it alone. So we teamed up in 2018 to start Acción Andina. It started as a project that is now becoming a movement led by the communities. They're bringing back forests for water security. So what's happening in the Andes? 
is glaciers are melting. Climate change is hitting really, really hard. Water security is becoming a huge issue. The communities are now teaming out with the support of Axion Andina to actually bring back the forest, bring back the ecosystem, nature that is the only substitute to those glaciers that will guarantee the water long term, whether it be for livelihoods, whether it be for um, agriculture and the water security, basically of the entire economies and societies across South America. You know, it's interesting, you talk about water security. I mean, let's just go back in history. Let's think of the Incas. Let's go up to Machu Picchu and how they created these incredible uh, ducts to bring water flowing throughout the region. I mean, it only makes sense you would want to, you know, continue to protect such a spiritual and historical part of the globe. Yes, um, indeed. And I, I think looking ahead at this, at this century that is coming at us, Axion Andina has to be a hundred year long effort. This is the scale of, of time we need to look at. We need, we, we've planted 10 million native trees. I can't hear. I can't hear. Oh, Florent, we lost uh, our connection to you. We appreciate, of course, the, the work that you're doing and the 22 projects across five countries and how you've been able to manage such terrific work. We will stay in close touch. And ABC News Live will have special reporting on the climate challenges that we face and empowering stories about solutions. So be sure to watch our brand new special, Trash, The Secret Life of Plastic Experts, airing tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. And then on Thursday, be sure to catch our other other brand new special, The Power of Us, where we delve into individual and systematic solutions and the impact that we can have together to protect our Earth. That's 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Both specials will be streaming on Hulu. We sure hope that you will check them out. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops. A lot more ahead. We'll be right back. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. This is Sir Combat Operations Center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a care, ain't it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, history happening right before our eyes. Court wrapping up just a short time ago in the first ever criminal trial against former president of the United States. Presidents have been impeached. They've resigned. They've been voted out of office. But for the first time ever, former President Donald Trump is facing a jury of his peers in criminal court. 
And it's all stemming from those charges related to a payment to a porn star hoping to hide an alleged fair with Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Prosecutors and defense attorneys now starting to lay out their cases. The state already calling the first witness to the stand, former National Enquirer publisher and longtime friend of Trump, David Pecker, who they say was part of the scheme to buy and bury all those unflattering stories about Trump. Let's bring in our investigative reporter, Olivia Rubin, outside court there, executive editorial producer John Santucci, and legal contributor and law professor at the University of Baltimore, Kim Whaley. So, Olivia, highlights from today. Well, I think what we saw today was not only the jury getting their first look at this case, and if they listened to prosecutors, it was a fraud, plain and simple. If they listened to Donald Trump's team, there was no crime here at all. But what is also so fascinating is we got a first look at Donald Trump also getting his first taste of what it is like to be a criminal defendant in front of a jury. And I think it's sort of a, a lot of the same uh, observations that we saw during jury selection, which is sort of the painstaking process for someone like Donald Trump, who's used to uh, being the leader of the free world, going out in front of a microphone whenever he feels like it. The plane takes off when he gets on. He runs uh, essentially his whole life, and now he just has to sit there while prosecutors talk about him in front of a jury. And today, his old friend, David Pecker, got up on the witness stand to testify against him. So it sort of set the stage for what is to come, and they didn't get into much of the nitty-gritty with David Pecker because court ended early today, uh, but they are expected to resume with him tomorrow morning where he's going to get to the heart of prosecutors' case, which is this overall catch-and-kill scheme that David Pecker allegedly worked on with Donald Trump and Michael Cohen to bury negative stories, one of which, of course, was Stormy Daniels, which is what the entire case here centers around. So John Trump always uh, takes advantage of the cameras after proceedings like this. Let's take a look at some of what he said today. Sure. This is done as election interference. Everybody knows it. I'm here instead of being able to be in Pennsylvania and Georgia and lots of other places campaigning. And it's very unfair. Fortunately, the poll numbers are very good. So, John, poll numbers and primaries are one thing. But yep. when it comes to voters that cast ballots in the general election, could this be time in court that could actually cost him? It's not going to help him, that's for sure, Kira. I mean, the reality is that Donald Trump is really stuck in this courtroom for the next several weeks. I mean, look at, you know, just last week is a great example, right? They had no court um, on Wednesday, so they took advantage of that with a campaign stop at a bodega in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I mean, that doesn't really do a lot if you're trying to win votes in battleground states. So they certainly are struggling with this. You saw this weekend. He tried to get on the campaign trail out in North Carolina, but there was some bad weather, so that made it tricky. It just shows that really there is less and less time to do this. The other thing that we have to remember, and a lot of exit polling data in the early states that voted this year showed this, there are some voters that have said a conviction in any of the four criminal cases Donald Trump faces could potentially sway their vote. Now, is that a big enough uh, percentage of the voter turnout that could impact the election? Remains to be seen, but it is nevertheless something the campaign is fully aware of and knows that while they are in court, they are not connecting with voters, they are not connecting with fundraising, they're simply stuck. So, Kim, Trump's defense attorney said, there is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. <laughs> what do you make of that argument? Well, it's a pretty bold and aggressive argument, frankly. It suggests that when it comes to the elements of the crime, that is, uh, the alleged crime, whether there was an intent to cover up the hush money payment, that they might be concerned that Michael Cohen's testimony, uh, presumably directly uh, incriminating Donald Trump in that, um, and will be corroborated. So they're essentially saying, they're trying to persuade the jury that this is this is all normal business as usual, that it's okay to, to essentially keep information from voters to, to fraudulently uh, change documents around to, to help sway and dupe the voters in the election. This is kind of out of Donald Trump's political playbook where people get confused, where the lines are begin and end when it comes to the rule of law and just sort of normal corruption as usual. Um, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for the prosecution to keep the, the jury on task and uh, lay out the elements and make it clear that this is a, these are statutory crimes and that if the, if the there's sufficient evidence that beyond a reasonable doubt their obligation is to convict. So Olivia, why do you think David Pecker was the first witness to be called? 
Well, it seems that prosecutors find David Pecker to be really central to their story. When uh, the prosecutor, Michael Colangelo, got up to do the openings for the jurors, one of the very first things he spoke about was this meeting that Donald Trump, David Pecker, and Michael Cohen had all together. And they, that was sort of the origin of what they say was this catch and kill scheme. And remember, when prosecutors go in front of a jury, they need to tell a story with this case. And I think it was very telling that that is what they be began with that meeting between the three of them. So it seems maybe that Pecker is going to sort of start to thread that needle for them before they get into the nitty gritty of the payments to Michael Cohen and then Stormy Daniels. But David Pecker, who uh, appeared today via a subpoena and is testifying against his old friend Donald Trump, uh, is going to lay that groundwork for him and it was a, or for them. And it was a really interesting demeanor from Pecker inside of the courtroom, who seemed at times, uh, I would say, almost jovial. He actually took the stand this morning with a huge smirk on his face. So it was interesting to see that from him. And John, the Access Hollywood tapes, the infamous tapes brought back into the spotlight, tapes where Trump talked about how easy it was to sexually assault women. How is how do we see this impacting Trump's current campaign for president? Because this was all exposed the last time around and it didn't hurt him. You know, I don't think it's going to really matter too much, Kira. To your point, I, I think when everyone hears the Access Hollywood tape words, they kind of know what we're talking about at this rate, because to your point, it's infamous. It was everywhere. I mean, I was talking with um, a colleague of, of ours, a competitor of ours at another outlet, uh, when this first came up a few days ago, this would become part of evidence, and we both reminisced about that weekend, because everybody remembered that weekend of Donald Trump held up in Trump Tower debating what to do with his 2016 campaign. Well, he won, and look where we we are now, you know, in almost a decade later. Um, I don't think it has any impact, but nevertheless, it's not a good image for Donald Trump, right? And I think you even saw this morning as part of a ruling by the judge of if Donald Trump took the stand, there would be other past transgressions, other legal issues that prosecutors could bring up, including E. Jean Carroll. Um, so anything that paints Donald Trump and the way he speaks about women in a negative way is obviously just not a good thing in general for him. Kimberly, let me ask you about um, the, you know this uh, gag order that was put uh, on Trump. We have seen him put things out on social about people that are tied to this case, Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohen. And now Trump has attacked uh, Mershon for not allowing him to attend uh, the Supreme Court hearing, uh, comparing himself to um, a rogue cop in immunity claims. Um, what do you think? Did he violate? the gag order here and what, what, what could happen? Well, I think technically the question is whether the judge himself constitutes uh, court personnel, uh, which is the you know covered in the scope of the gag order. The the judge has to be really careful to not create an appealable issue for Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is very savvy at walking this this fine line uh, between violating the terms of the order and sort of violating it, asking someone else to tweet or retweeting something, for example. How this is enforced? Uh, the judge would start with a, a financial penalty. I think it's a thousand dollars. That's going to be a drop in the bucket for. Donald Trump. But if he continues, he can actually remit him to custody. And that, I think, his lawyers are going to have to make clear to him is a line he does not uh, need to cross or should not cross. I would suspect something like this, the judge will let it go. Um, but it certainly builds the case for the prosecution, which is now racking up multiple alleged violations of the gag order, that with six weeks to go, if he's not sort of brought into line, there might have to be some major action taken to, to bring him there. Because because people's safety is really on the line. These jurors, the witnesses, court personnel, court staff, this is not just rhetoric and First Amendment rights. This is serious public safety for these people that are really voluntarily uh, participating in this for the good of the country. And the Trump putting, Trump putting out on, on his social, uh, referring to Judge Mershon as the highly conflicted judge in the Manhattan DA quote unquote case, uh, prohibiting him from attending. All right, it's uh, just getting started too. Olivia, John, Kimberly, thank you.
Now to the Middle East, the crisis there, and the man who was the symbol of the failure to prevent the deadliest attack in Israel's history. Netanyahu's head of military intelligence has resigned. The major general is the highest ranking Israeli official to step down since the Hamas led attack back on October 7th. This resignation happening as a special State Department panel here in our nation's capital recommending to sanction Israeli military units linked to human rights abuses. For more, let's bring in our foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge in Tel Aviv, along with our senior national policy reporter Ann Flaherty. So Tom, let's talk about the resignation here of the Major General and what it tells you about Israel's intelligence failure. Well, given the scale of the intelligence failings in the run-up to, and really on the night of October the 7th, Kira, I think it was almost an inevitability that the head of military intelligence would step down. Perhaps the more interesting thing is why it's taken him so long to do so, and that's really probably down to the fact that the IDF has been so busy with the war in Gaza, uh, up on the northern border against Hezbollah, uh, against Iranian proxies and Iran itself, as we've seen in the last uh, few days. Uh, look, you know, the intelligence failings, it's kind of hard to overstate them. I mean, the IDF and the the intelligence community here had a dossier a year before uh, the actual terror attack itself. They called it Jericho Wall and effectively it was a blueprint. It really detailed the plan that ultimately Hamas uh, ended up executing. So I, I think the head of military intelligence stepping down uh, was inevitable. Uh, it has happened now and I don't think he'll be the last senior military official here in Israel to step down because of those intelligence failings. So, Anne, in this annual report, the State Department is considering Gaza uh, in the midst of a s severe humanitarian crisis. And this comes as the U.S. is about to impose sanctions on this IDF unit and human rights abuses. Um, put this in context for us. Yeah, Kara, so we heard from Secretary Blinken just minutes ago who said, yeah, the U.S. is looking into whether or not Israel has committed human rights violations, war crimes, essentially. Uh, he said, we're not going to give anybody a, a cut here because they're simply an ally. We're, we're going to look at this process, do it fairly, and make a determination. So he said, you know, watch more of this space, but we'll follow the facts on that. You know, I think there are, are obviously a lot of questions, um, you know, worth pointing out the October 7th attack by Hamas a clear violation of any international standard of, uh, you know, war crimes and so forth. So, uh, but really for the U.S. to hold Israel accountable, um, it would be historic. We have not seen this law being applied to an IDF unit before. Kira. We'll follow it. Tom, Ann, thank you. So for the first time in decades, the Supreme Court is hearing a major case involving homelessness. The justices are hearing arguments for more than two and a half hours and appear to favor whether cities can fine unhoused people for sleeping outside. Advocates say that this amounts to cruel and unusual punishment, and it comes as homeless numbers are skyrocketing nationwide. Let's bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, who's been following it since the start. So let's just talk about how we got here and the implications of these arguments. Fascinating case, Kira. The biggest case on homelessness here at the Supreme Court in 40 years, and it comes from the city of Grants Pass, Oregon. I was out there a few weeks ago, and it looked like many other cities uh, nationwide that we've seen dealing with encampments in public places, parks, sidewalks. And the city in uh, Grants Pass decided to pass an ordinance that would make it a crime to sleep outside if you didn't have a home and used a blanket. A group of homeless people in the city uh, sued, uh, alleging a constitutional violation of federal appeals court agreed with them, said it was cruel and unusual punishment, and the city was here today at the Supreme Court appealing Cura, and as you said at the top, they found a very sympathetic uh, audience. A majority of the conservative justices today, while certainly empathetic to the unhoused uh, situation, uh, seem to say that it should be up to local officials to pass ordinances to regulate these encampments that, of course, have come with uh, issues of crime, public sanitation issues, um, and so uh, we'll have to see what the justices say. But as of now, uh, the city of Grants Pass fighting to get that law back on the books, Kira. All right. And you spoke with people in Grants Pass. What are they telling you? Well, one of the things that we heard repeatedly, Kira, is that this is uh, uh, p pits residents of a community who want their leafy lined streets and kids to feel safe in public parks with advocates for the unhoused and soaring housing prices as so many different parts of the country. Those things colliding in public places. Uh, and here's a little bit of uh, some of the folks on both sides of this told us when we were out there. We're fighting between what the law is telling us and what the people want us to do and trying to make everybody happy. That's a big, huge struggle for us 
city government. Criminalizing the, the victims of our failed housing policy is morally wrong and it's unconstitutional and that's essentially what the, city's, the city of Grants Pass has done by making it illegal for someone to exist while being homeless. Now, while the conservative justices Kira seemed sympathetic to the city, the three liberal justices on the court today did not mince words. They were aggressive, passionate, attacking the city for passing an ordinance like this. Justice Elena Kagan saying perhaps the city should just uh, uh, as well criminalize breathing on the sidewalk if they're going to go after sleeping. Uh, of course, uh, uh, an intense debate around a very complicated issue that cities are really struggling. Red cities, blue cities, red states, blue states as they try to get their arms around this. Record numbers of Americans right now, Kira, as you know, are homeless. So this case will have very big impact. Yep, state by state. Devin, thank you. You bet. Coming up, a deadly shooting at Delaware State University. The breaking news details next. You're watching America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges against parents of the shooter at Oxford High School who killed four students and wounded others. There's a myth that the shooter just snaps. It's just not true. There are always signs. He was crying for help and being ignored. He had pictures of a target on his bedroom wall, shell casings on his nightstand. A very toxic, turbulent relationship. Those people are yikes. The life they lived was just crazy. The sexting and the really terrible things they'd video of their sexual acts. They purchased that gun for him with his money and bragged about it. They're being told by a school counselor that he thinks their son's going to kill himself. And they do nothing. As soon as I heard they were called to the school that day, the messages about LOL, don't get caught, those were very, very concerning to me. That's the moment that no juror is going to think, well, haven't we all been there? Here's what it is. I got it. They do not seem shocked about him having the gun. There was no shock. Zero. Zero. School shooters aren't created, they're made, and it's made over time. You don't get to walk away from that. You just don't. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Breaking news right now, police in Delaware are searching for a suspect after an 18-year-old woman was shot and killed on the campus of Delaware State University. That victim has been identified as Kame Mitchell De Silva of Wilmington. According to investigators, De Silva was not a registered student at the university, but was visiting the campus with another student. Our Ike Ajachi is following the late-breaking details for us. Ike, what do you know? Well, Kira, we're being told right now again that that 18-year-old who was found shot and killed on the campus of Delaware State University went by the name of Kame Mitchell De Silva, obviously of Wilmington, Delaware. Now, officers say that this entire investigation started just before 2 a.m. when campus police were called to the area of the Warren Franklin Residential Hall for reports of shots fired. Now, once on scene, police officers say they found De Silva suffering from a gunshot wound to her upper body. She was transported to an area hospital where she was later pronounced dead. Now, according to investigators, De Silva was not a registered student at the universities. Officials say that De Silva and another non-student were visiting a student on campus at the time of the shooting. Now, we're being told no other injuries were reported. However, university leaders did say that the suspect was seen fleeing the uh, campus uh, on the direction of College Road, again, away from the campus. Now, we're being told that there will be a forum for students, faculty, staff, and parents on 
on Tuesday, tomorrow, to share any updates of this case. And obviously, they're asking anybody with information to contact the Delaware police. Uh, we're being told that classes have been canceled for the rest of the day today. We have no word on whether those can, uh, classes rather will resume tomorrow. But again, the Delaware State Police is still conducting this active investigation. And again, they're asking anybody with any kind of information on the whereabouts of the possible suspect or any kind of information surrounding this incident should contact them as media, immediately and as fast as they can, Kira. All right, we'll follow it. Ike, thank you. Some other top headlines we're tracking this hour for you. California will soon allow Arizona doctors to practice reproductive care in the Golden State, a retaliatory response to Arizona's 160-year abortion law going back into effect. Governor Gavin Newsom says he's pursuing emergency legislation, hoping to provide access for those fleeing Arizona and seeking reproductive care. Choo-choo, here comes that speed rail. Construction kicking off for the $12 billion high speed rail today that'll take commuters from Southern California to Vegas. That trip usually takes about mm, three hours by car, but will only take two hours each way by rail. Construction is expected to finish in 2028, just in time for the Summer Olympics there in LA. And in just the first few days, Taylor Swift's newest work, the Tortured Poets Department, breaking record after record. It has become the most streamed album in a single day, raking in 300 million streams. The historic success also making Swift the most streamed artist in a single day. Straight ahead, working throughout South America to plant 10 million trees, hoping to restore thousands and thousands of acres of forests. We are kicking off our Earth Day series here on ABC News Live, The Power of Us. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. When it matters most, America turns to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. The clock fell on my stepson. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. Here, that was a good lie. Do you think this ends in a good way? Interrogation tapes tonight on ABC. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. I'm Zoreen Shah reporting from the New Hampshire primary. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Environmental activist Florent Kaiser brings a whole new meaning to tree hugger. Matter of fact, he's so passionate about our world's forests that he spends every day looking for ways to scale up restoration and protection of our world's forest ecosystems. But it's not just all of us here at ABC that are honoring his work today on Earth Day, but Prince William has also celebrated his community led work as an Earthshot Prize winner. By co leading Axion and Dina, Florent has worked throughout South America planting 10 million trees and restoring thousands and thousands of acres of high Andean forests. Regions critical for biodiversity because it's home to not only plant species but thousands of species of birds, reptiles and amphibians. Earthshot recipient Florent Kaiser joins me now. Florent, so good to see you. Talk about what inspired you to start Acción Andina and how did you know protecting these forest ecosystems were so important? Important. Hi, Kira. Thanks. So, uh, thank you so much. Actually, our co-founder, Constantino Oka, who is a UN Earth Champion 2022, inspired us to start this work. He wanted to reforest the Andes with the communities he's from, indigenous communities of the high Andes in South America. And when we met Tino in, in 2018, he shared his dream. He wanted to go for what he had built in Cusco, in Peru, across the entire Andes. And we knew he couldn't do it alone. We knew we wouldn't be able to do it alone. So we teamed up in 2018 to start Acción Andina. 
It started as a project that is now becoming a movement led by the communities that are bringing back forests for water security. So what's happening in the Andes is glaciers are melting. Climate change is hitting really, really hard. Water security is becoming a huge issue. The communities are now teaming out with the support of Axion Andina to actually bring back the forest, bring back the ecosystem, nature that is the only substitute to those glaciers that will guarantee the water long term, whether it be for livelihoods, whether it be for um, agriculture and the water security basically of the entire economies and societies across South America. You know, it's interesting, you talk about water security. I mean, let's just go back in history. Let's think of the Incas. Let's go up to Machu Picchu and how they created these incredible uh, ducts to bring water flowing throughout the region. I mean, it only makes sense you would want to, you know, continue to protect such a spiritual and historical part of the globe. Yes, um, indeed. And I, I think looking ahead at this, at this century that is coming at us, Acción Andina has to be a hundred year long effort. This is the scale of, of time we need to look at. We appreciate, of course, the, the work that you're doing and the 22 projects across five countries and how you've been able to manage such terrific work. We will stay in close touch and ABC News Live will have special reporting on the climate challenges that we face and empowering stories about solutions. So be sure to watch our brand new special trash the secret life of plastic exports airing tomorrow at 8 30 p.m eastern and then on thursday be sure to catch our other brand new special the power of us where we delve into individual and systematic solutions and the impact that we can have together to protect our earth that's 8 30 p.m eastern both specials will be streaming on hulu we sure hope that you will check them out thanks so much for streaming with us i'm kira phillips the news never stops a lot more ahead we'll be right back What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league. A side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. I'm Matt Gutman at this march in Israel. These are the families of the hostages being held in Gaza. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. We're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching for you right now on ABC News Live. Court wrapping just a time ago in the first ever criminal trial against a former president of the United States. Prosecutors saying this case is about criminal conspiracy, using Trump, accusing Trump of arranging a $130,000 payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels to keep her from revealing their alleged affair right before the 2016 presidential election. The defense arguing Trump relied on lawyer Michael Cohen to arrange that payment. Former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker was called as the first witness who prosecutors say was part of that scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about the former president. 
Trump denies any wrongdoing. The court will be back in session tomorrow morning with David Pecker back on the stand. But first, the judge plans to hold a contempt hearing on Trump's alleged violation of the limited gag order in this case. The head of the Israeli military intelligence is resigning after almost 40 years of service over the failures that led to the surprise October 7th attack by Hamas. Major General Aaron Haliba becoming the first senior figure in the IDF to step down for his role in what became the deadliest attack in Israel's history. And Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots and graduate of Columbia University, releasing a statement today that he's no longer supporting the university. Kraft is also the founder of the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism, and in his statement he said he's no longer confident that Columbia can protect its students and staff, and it's his hope during this difficult time that the Kraft Center at Columbia will serve as a source of security and safety for all Jewish people. Kraft Foundation has been at the forefront of the fight against anti-Semitism since the October 7th Hamas terror attack against his country. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. The head of Israel's military intelligence steps down over failure surrounding the unprecedented October 7th Hamas attack, the first senior official to resign over it. And is time running out for TikTok? The move by the House that could affect the app loved by 170 million Americans and small businesses. And opening statements begin today in the hush money trial of Donald Trump, the first criminal case against a former president in American history. Plus, did you have a bad date this weekend? What women say men aren't doing that leaves many scratching their heads. Monday morning quarterback Mike Muse with the conversation you won't want to miss. Who's gonna save the world tonight? Also, the power of us, people, climate, and our future on this Earth Day. We'll meet teens fighting to save the planet's most prolific pollinators, the bees. And the mom on a mission to help others break bad habits when it comes to keeping household waste down. Also, star Wilson Cruz joins us in our Times Square studio, bringing us a special sneak peek at his new Netflix film, Mother of the Bride. And the Spice Girl reunion. We didn't want to say stop in honor of Victoria Beckham's 50th birthday. Their biggest fan, David Beckham, bringing us into the party. Now from Times Square, Eva Pilgrim and DeMarco Morgan with Dr. Jen Ashton and what you need to know. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a new week of What You Need to Know on this Earth Day. And welcome to our friend and colleague, Will Reeves. So good to have you in for DeMarco. Hi, everyone. I'm so sad I'm not wearing green. I'm sorry. I do love the Earth, I promise. Yes, you do. But this was a complete coincidence. That's wow. how cosmically connected we are. Yeah, you thought it through accidentally. And this was not wrinkled. Right. That, sometimes <laughs> that's, 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 that's the way you want to Yes. Right there. Um, we are talking about Earth Day, Dr. Jen, yeah. and you're breaking down some ways that not only we can help the earth but also help our health yeah and you know we've been talking a lot about how the earth and climate change has a direct not an indirect impact on our health and the world health organization bringing that uh into the forefront again not just on earth day but every day um in particular talking about air pollution and respiratory disease. Obviously, we know this can impact um, the development of other pulmonary conditions, most notably COPD. It can increase or exacerbate asthma symptoms and lead to more hospitalizations due to such. Particulate matter and nitrogen oxide then, of course, can worsen pre-existing or any chronic or underlying lung condition. And globally, nine out of 10 people are breathing polluted air on a regular basis so this isn't just someone else's problem we can control the things that we can control because obviously there's a lot of this that people cannot uh, control but first of all you can always check your daily local air pollution forecast and the air quality you can go to airnow.gov for uh, latest accurate reports you can avoid exercising in high traffic or high polluted areas some people can't avoid being outdoors and they have to earn their living um, in poor air quality walking around biking using carpooling we can all do that to help this situation and then 
don't burn wood or trash. That is really big offender in creating this particulate matter. You've reported on it, Will, when you talk about wildfires, so we don't want to make little wildfires in our own environment. Well, there's always something yeah. we can do. Dr. Jen, thank you, you for bet. that. Let's get to some headlines right now with our friend Brad Melke. He is the host and managing editor of the ABC News award-winning podcast, Start Here, and he starts with us right now. Brad, hello. And also not wearing green, so I feel like... <laughs> but I wore, some, I wore blue, I guess, but yeah, okay, sure. And we begin with the new developments overseas. The head of Israeli military intelligence resigning over his role in the failures to prevent the October 7th terror attack by Hamas. He is the first senior official to step down following that worst attack in history on Israeli soil. Here at home, the massive foreign aid package that includes billions in funding for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan was pushed through this weekend by GOP House Speaker Mike Johnson in a dramatic vote on the Hill. Johnson needed help from Democrats to overcome opposition from his own party. In fact, more Republicans voted against this than for it. The Senate now set to vote on it tomorrow. However, this measure includes a closely watched provision that could potentially ban TikTok here in the U.S. if changes aren't made regarding its Chinese ownership by next year. Now let's check in with our Ginger Z on the big spring freeze. What you got, Ginger? Colorado had some late season snow. Denver's airport, 6.3 inches of snow, which is the most this late in the season they've had since the airport has been the observation center. So probably the most this late, even longer than that. Uh, but we do see that cold air, and we even had frost and freeze alerts this morning, but that's going to have a reinforcing shot later this week. We could even see a couple of records be broken from Flint, Michigan, to tying one maybe at LaGuardia. Uh, Boston itself dip into about freezing Thursday morning. And a quick look at that next storm that plows through some severe weather toward the end of the week possible too and if you're gonna have a birthday you gotta get with your friends the spice girls stopping to say happy 50th to victoria beckham hubby david beckham was capturing it all very high-priced cameraman you guys and there's much more ahead of course on gma3 on this monday thank you guys all right, thanks, Brad. We love, I always like the videos where you see David actually dancing to the Spice Girls songs. <laughs> yeah. he, enjoys, he supports. He does support. He supports. Big time wife guy. Yeah. He's fired up, <laughs> as he should be. Thanks, Brad. And coming up here on GMA3 on this Monday, history unfolding in lower Manhattan as opening statements get underway in the first criminal trial of a former president. Our team with the deep dive. Plus, the new trend in dating. Some women are noticing what they say men are not doing that has them frustrated. And that's a conversation you are going to want to weigh in on, and you can do that when we are back in a moment. I'm glad you got a single guy. <laughs> Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America this morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. 
Party America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Welcome back to GMA3. Opening statements begin today in a Manhattan courtroom as former President Donald Trump stands trial on criminal charges, a first in our nation's history. The former president is accused of falsifying business records over an alleged 2016 hush money payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. He's pleaded not guilty and denies any wrongdoing. And joining us now, attorney and ABC News contributor Brian Buckmeyer and from outside the courthouse, ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. Aaron, we'll start with you outside the courthouse there. The trial's getting underway. What are you hearing about the expected timeline, and what witnesses should we expect early on here? This case is going to last perhaps six weeks, Will, and the first witness is going to be David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer. According to prosecutors, he was at the center of this alleged scheme to buy and bury unflattering stories about Donald Trump before the 2016 election. And one of those stories was Stephanie Clifford's, better known as the porn actress Stormy Daniels. She had a tale to tell about a sexual encounter with Trump that he denies. And in order to keep her quiet about it, the campaign decided it would be best to pay her $130,000. The defense says there's nothing unusual about wealthy people paying hush money as part of non-disclosure agreements, but prosecutors say the way that payment was logged constituted the crime of falsifying business records because it was done with the intent to keep information away from voters before the 2016 election. Brian, what's the biggest challenge that prosecutors are going to face here? I actually see probably two large challenges here. One, the prosecution has to make sense of taking what is often a misdemeanor case and connecting it to what might be uh, federal election interference, and that's why we're at a felony and not a misdemeanor. But also another large issue that they have to do is prove that a person, specifically Michael Cohen, who is known to be a liar to the courts, to Congress, to investigators, is now telling the truth here in this case when he, being the star witness, testifies against Donald Trump and basically lays out their case for them. Aaron, what kind of sentence is former President Trump facing if he is indeed convicted? If he's convicted, it's possible, Will, that he could face up to four years in prison. But prosecutors would have to ask for it, and having a former president serve prison time just seems highly unlikely and, and perhaps, uh, you know, would really test the, the system in a way that it's never been tested before, as have all of these criminal cases that the former president is facing. But in theory, up to four years in prison, if he is convicted, is charged of falsifying uh, 34 business records. Brian, former President Trump says he wants to testify in this case. So what can we expect to hear? If he testifies, we've already kind of seen a bit of a glimpse of this because he comes out after every day and gives us his take on the case. He's already said that this was a legal expense. And so if he testified, which I would probably highly recommend that he shouldn't, I would expect him to say, hey, I asked Michael Cohen to do a job for me. He did a job for me. I wrote it down as a legal expense. What's the problem? But that admits to a large portion of what the prosecutor is alleging in this case. And so I, I think we're still not quite sure whether or not he's going to testify. He's told us that he, that he was and he wants to. I think that's more testing the waters. But time will tell us to whether or not his attorneys convince him to testify or not. But ultimately, like any criminal defendant, it's his right to choose that and no one else can tell him otherwise. 
Ryan Buckmeyer and Aaron Katursky hitting every angle for us as former President Trump's hush money trial gets underway in Manhattan. And just ahead here on GMA3, the new dating trend that is raising questions. Oh, questions. We'll explain when we come back. Stay with us. <laughs> What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you. David, good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from the nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine, the USS Kentucky in South Korea, I'm Martha Raddatz. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. It is Monday, which means it is time for another round of Monday Morning Quarterback. Today, we are talking love. Oh, yeah, or maybe the absence of love. Here to catch us up on what we need to know when it comes to who's responsible for a bad date is our favorite Monday Morning Quarterback, Mike Muse. Okay, you got to hey. tell us about this. What are women saying? <laughs> Yo, Eva and Will, I went down a rabbit hole this weekend. I found this article Inside Hook, and this article suggested that men are just not engaging on dates and are not conversational. Uh, the author goes on to say that, in a podcast as well, would say that they will actually sip their coffee or their drink and wait awkwardly for the man to say something to which the man never says anything. They also go on this article to say that sometimes the Trader Joe's cashiers will talk more to them than the actual men do. And I just wholeheartedly disagreed um, with this assessment. But I'm curious to know, what are your thoughts? I, that's a good We're way of engaging right people. there. <laughs> yeah, I haven't like had to do that in a while, but yeah. I think you you gotta, if you're actually interested in someone, you need to show interest, I, I guess. Our and, executive producer Kat was saying she wants someone to play tennis with her. You've got to at least be able to keep the conversation going. Yeah, do ping pong. So I was doing some of my market research. So I was talking to a lot of my single friends and they were actually agreeing parts of this article and saying that sometimes it's the second date uh, where the guy clams up and not so much the first date. I yeah. think when you aren't connected to someone, it can be hard to have like a truly engaging conversation. Right, there's nothing yeah. worse than the yeah. boring like, oh yeah. man, I'm not having a good time. I'm yeah. on the hook for this whole yeah. meal and like 
Can't wait for well, it to be this over. This is why you pay cash. You bring cash you can pay for it and go, this was lovely. You yeah. are lovely. So you, I, this is not a thing. You can't, you, well, no, you can't, as a guy, you better be doing well enough that you don't get a runner. <laughs> so it's like you're so, yeah, you but this is that. what they're saying also too in terms of how social media has changed the construct of the conversation because, well, because of, everyone's uh, on their phones no, they're no, not used to having no. to say words to each oh, other oh you mean not that. on a date yeah. if no. someone breaks out their phone on a date i'm like all right i'm I'm out. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I don't need that. But also, too, though, it talks about this idea of social media has created these conversations about commodity. So guys are now viewed as, like, a commodity, as well as women oh, when it comes to high quality value of a man, high quality value of a woman. Um, is this guy able to fund a lifestyle? I wish you could see Keisha's face right now. I, like, really want you to see Keisha's face. Yeah, there's an eyebrow raise. The fact that you just referred to men as a commodity. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, not me, Keisha. Social media. Yeah, uh, but that's what they're saying in some She's of these articles like is that men are being looked at as commodities and so therefore they may be more reserved uh, in the conversation not knowing and trusting the intentions of this date. I mean women have been treated like commodities for a long time so I, I, I was, was just going to say that. I we wanted to in say New York that. City and yeah. it is it is not nice out there to be a female dating in New York. I'm just yeah. going to put that out. I there. wanted to yeah. say that, but didn't feel that it was my place. But I appreciate that you've uh, introduced Which is that why to the Keisha conversation. Is making that face at you, <laughs> like, watch yourself. You got to walk out of here. <laughs> Keisha in America. This is not me. I'm just reporting the weekend in Here's terms the... of what I've been going down a rabbit hole on. What are guys doing wrong, and how can we? do better. There are a few school of thoughts here. One school of thought that from the Mashable article that I read down the weekend, I mean, literally I was down this rabbit hole. Article in the Mashable is suggesting that society now has become more selfish. Um, and then that is part of it. It's a me society. It's what I want. Let me figure out if this is for me versus doing the dance or as our executive producer Kat is saying, playing tennis. Um, also too, I was reading another article where millionaire matchmaker Patty Stanger was suggesting that now we're in this position in this space. And I think Eva, I would curious your thoughts on this comment is that women are making so much more money now and are having such successful careers uh, that they're in ownership of owning their own agency able to pay for their own meals pay for their own you know lifestyle you know like and just non-traditional <laughs> norms are being cash. shattered and so therefore um, women are owning the agency so the dance is becoming disrupted due to the social conversation that's happening online that sounds like a good thing though right like yeah. I, I, that doesn't sound I mean, like a negative uh, yeah. chemistry is chemistry yeah, it always is. You either have yeah. it, or you either have it, or you yeah. don't. And what we don't have is more time. But <laughs> yeah. Mike, thank you so much yeah. for being here and wading into these waters yeah. with as, us. As always, up yeah. next and be here careful on walking out of here. <laughs> We've got Dr. Jen's tips on what to look for when buying a protein powder. How's that for and a turn? And the student is studying bees. What she's learning may surprise you. Our ABC News Power of Us report on this Earth Day when we come back. Who's gonna bring First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 
25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Dirt, it's good for us. Yeah, <laughs> micro, also known as microbiobial diversity. So inspired by a recent article in the New York Times, you know, we've heard before this sterile hypothesis where we're trying to make our environment too clean, too completely devoid of any kind of other organisms, which a lot of times are good organisms, to this playing in dirt, which... My daughter was making mud pies this weekend. <laughs> See? Such a good mommy. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. And so there are actually certain daycares that have a forest floor. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, I no. think that sounds amazing. Um, but, but we can get into a little of those benefits literally just by going for a walk outside, planting a tomato tree, you know, on, on your backyard, on your pa porch, on your front step. Literally, it doesn't have to be playing in dirt to get some of those benefits. And a lot of uh, scientists are really saying that the mass lay public has overemphasized, you know, how much dirt has to be in our kind of environment to get that benefit. It doesn't take that much. Quite literally, even taking a walk in a park gives us and our body the good exposure that we need for, for diversity, which mm. I think is interesting. Right? This is of a piece of like, the more you can get out in nature, the better. Exactly, I saw the wheels spinning well, yeah, for well, sure. Well, I was giving, yeah. we started off, you just go dirt, you I'm did, like, oh, You didn't want to go to the, built, you know, planting a tomato plant, but I'm, I'm not kidding, like that can actually do it, and there's benefits to gardening that go beyond the, the microbiome. Because you can um, eat that tomato. Mm. Correct. And it's relaxing. You certainly can. But if you're like me and you have a brown thumb, it's not going to go Same. very well. <laughs> but try it anyway. All right, Dr. Jack. Well, Thank exactly. you. We will that. return. No oh, dirt here. Was like, oh, there's a flower. Take a walk. Oh, yep. Nature. Nature. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Thanks to meet you. Ismael? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my God! <laughs> 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? This is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Start Here. ABC News, America's number one news source.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines that we are watching for you right now on ABC News Live this hour. Breaking at this moment, police in Delaware searching for a suspect after an 18-year-old woman was shot and killed on the campus of Delaware State University. That victim has been identified as Kame Mitchell De Silva of Wilmington. According to investigators, De Silva was not enrolled at the school but was visiting another student when she was gunned down. She later died at the hospital. Delaware State Police and the FBI are now working with campus investigators on the case. Case. That gunman is still at large. California proposing a law to allow Arizona doctors to practice reproductive care in the Golden State, a retaliatory response to Arizona's 160 year old abortion law going back into effect. Governor Gavin Newsom says he's pursuing emergency legislation, hoping to provide access for those fleeing Arizona and seeking reproductive care. And the 2024 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees are here. Finally, Cher is a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee alongside music legends Ozzy Osbourne, Cool and the Gang, Mary J. Blige, and Dave Matthews, just to name a few. According to the organization, this year's inductees have created music whose originality, impact, and influence has changed the course of rock and roll. That induction ceremony will happen October 19th in Cleveland, Ohio. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA3 right now. Welcome back to GMA3. What you need to know that, of course, the just fine Mary J. Blige. And she and a number of outstanding names in music will be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. Among them, Cher, Foreigner, Peter Frampton, and the one and only Dave Matthews. You know Kat, our EP, major fan of Dave. Yeah. And you can catch it all streaming live on Disney Plus on October 19th and later right here on ABC and Hulu. Can't wait for that. And Dr. Jen is here and she's looking closely mm -hmm. at a health and wellness question on viewers mind and on mine which is <laughs> what should I look for Dr. Jen when I'm choosing a protein powder okay protein is as many of us know incredibly important uh, as a macronutrient and there's a calculation that's generally weight based for how much protein we should shoot for getting on a daily basis my number is 80 I can take you guys uh, through the calculation for that I'll put it on my Instagram because there's some math involved but it's hard to get that from natural food sources so a lot of people I think us included turn to a protein powder to get you know a kind of a high amount of protein in a in a relatively easy and consistent way what should you look for first of all uh, there's no way to verify purity and accuracy with these kind of products so it's kind of you know buyer beware uh, you should look for taste you should look for the source of the protein whether it's whey protein or plant-based protein you should definitely look for cost um, and you should look for the number of grams per scoop or per serving I try to get 20 grams of protein anytime I'm using a protein powder protein mm -hmm. collagen powder so that you know I know that in that shake I'm getting about 20 to 30 grams mm -hmm. a day makes sense your makes prescription sense. for wellness All right has to do with hair health you know I'm big hair person um, so some natural ways that we can uh, boost our hair in terms of oil for hair health coconut oil is in my bathroom uh, I think in DeMarco's as well it, it boosts the um, strand health and appearance almond oil also good for softening and moisturizing you can put a little of that on the ends and then castor oil believe it or not is good for the scalp and can nourish the hair follicle you do want to be careful when you're using hair on your scalp not to actually clog and suffocate your scalp because that good blood flow is important for hair. This is my faux po, everybody, in case anyone doesn't know, in case there's one person in America who doesn't know, I clip her on to rest my hair. Yeah, you protect your hair. Very aggressively. <laughs> <laughs> and you can send us your medical questions on Instagram at ABCGMA3. And coming up next on GMA3, Power of Us, the teen beekeepers setting up a science experiment in their backyards and what they are learning on this Earth Day. And the mom on a mission determined to change the way we throw things away. More on that in a moment. Stay with us.
so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh, my goodness! Oh, my goodness. And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love it. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Who's gonna save? Welcome back to GMA3. There is a buzz of excitement in the air for these two young high schoolers who are fighting to save our world's greatest pollinators, the bees. Yes, and as part of our ABC News Power of Us campaign, our M Win is sharing how two girls separated by thousands of miles are linked by the same mission. In the suburbs of San Ramon, California, a young beekeeper tending to her beehives in her backyard. 17-year-old Cherise Zoe instantly fell in love with nature's tiny workers. When she learned how factors like climate change and pesticides were killing them off at an alarming rate, she jumped into action. It's disappointing for me, but it's, it's also a very real-world issue that we do need to take on. Cherise transformed her backyard into a science project, constructing a maze to train honeybees how to fly through. These patterns and colors representing those of wildflowers. She set out to prove how certain pesticides may reduce bees' cognitive abilities. <laughs> Cherise convinced her parents to help her acquire 150,000 honeybees. This is so heavy because yeah. it's full of honey. Full of honey, yes. Wow. When observing small groups of bees, she found the ones exposed to pesticides appeared not to remember how to get through the maze. I wanted to see if my research could decrease the usage of pesticides in the real world. Her work now submitted to a scientific journal. They're our world's most crucial pollinators. Bees alone pollinate 80% of all flowering plants, including more than 130 types of fruits and vegetables. But bee populations are rapidly declining, like the American bumblebee, where nearly 90% of them have been wiped out in the last 20 years. 
Many of them are in danger. Jim Veach, an avid beekeeper who specializes in genetics, says population declines can be due to several factors, though mainly habitat loss. If bees poof disappear, then there's a huge economic hit to agriculture. The Agricultural Research Service found radical shifts in temperature, droughts, wildfires and floods resulted in habitat destruction and foraging disruptions. While honeybee populations have been relatively steady in recent years, they still face major threats like varroa mites. In spring 2022, more than 40 percent of all honeybee colonies were afflicted with the parasite. That's where another young beekeeper comes in, 18-year-old Katie Colbert of Toms River, New Jersey. You said they're pretty gentle? Yes. After weeks of field studies, her now-published work found that thymol-based essential oils extracted from thyme leaves through a mist diffuser could stun varroa mites. This continuous release system had an efficacy of over 97%, which is really promising and exciting. Katie was crowned the Honey Queen, acting as a spokesperson for the New Jersey Beekeepers Association. With few young people having hive mind over beekeeping, Katie says knowing Sharice is out on the West Coast. It makes me super excited that there's someone else out there who's like me. So what can you do to help? Experts say you can avoid using pesticides and check with your local garden center about what plants are native to your area to put down around the house. And despite a sting or two, it's pretty swelling. I oh. can't even barely walk. Oh, wow. Both of the girls' parents say it's worth it. <laughs> what doesn't hurt? Having homegrown honey all year round. Wow. And Em joins us here in studio. Oh my God, first of all, you were around <laughs> all those bees. I cannot imagine, what was that like? Okay, so it actually was pretty intimidating at first. You know, the buzzing of the bees, it's a lot louder when you're actually next to them. But the two girls, they were such great teachers, so it was a really fun experience. And what, what are the things that we should be thinking about if the bee population does decline? Right, great question. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually says that billions of dollars worth of crops would be affected if the population of pollinators really took a hit. So that means the prices of the fruits and vegetables that we love, like apples, bananas, watermelons, even almonds, all of that would skyrocket if pollinators were to take a hit. Oh, wow. Now, wow. now these two women, young women, are 17, 18 years mm -hmm. old. They're about to graduate high school. What's next for them? Okay, oh, this is great. So they are so intelligent. I loved being around them. Sharice tells me she's not sure which college she's going to go to, but she's going to go into neuroscience, which is spurred by her cognitive research of the honeybee and then Katie, she's going to go into biology and political science. And I hope I'm not spoiling this for her fan, friends and family, but she has accepted an offer from Harvard University. Oh, oh, no. Congrats to her. And happy birthday to oh, you. <laughs> Okay, your fiance remembers to book the reservation for dinner tonight. She's getting back at 7. All right, 7 p.m. going to be a great dinner. Happy birthday. Thank you for bringing that story to us. Thank you for being here with us on this Earth Day birthday. And we are going to keep it moving. Yeah, just ahead here on GMA3, more on our Earth Day coverage and ABC's The Power of Us. One mom determined to change the way we throw things away, all to help save the planet. So come on back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I watch you every night. 
ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. From the team that brought you the DuPont Award-winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports, streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. I'm Tom Sufi Barrage with this group of Ukrainian attack helicopters in eastern Ukraine. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3 as we continue our Earth Day special series, The Power of Us. We're going to take a closer look at how we can all minimize waste in our daily lives. One mom took the idea to a surprising extreme, going zero waste after the birth of her first child, then launching an eco-friendly cleaning brand. I sat down with the CEO of Blue Land to talk about her mission to change people's daily habits for a better Earth. This is plastic. Entrepreneur Sarah Paiji Yu broke new ground in sustainability, creating the refillable eco-friendly cleaning brand, Blue Land. The company says it's diverted more than 1 billion plastic bottles from landfills and oceans so far. And it all started when you became a mom. You went zero waste after you had a baby? <laughs> Uh, my mind is blown because babies make a lot of waste. Yeah, yes, and I think that that was part of it. I was doing all this research into the water that I would use to mix with my um, son's, baby son's formula. I was horrified to learn that regardless of if you're drinking tap water or bottled water here in the United States, you know, a liter contains hundreds of pieces of microplastics. The U.S. produces 42 million metric tons of plastic per year and adults consume over 100,000 microplastic particles a year through air, food, and beverages. That inspired you to create products with the goal of changing people's daily habits. I would say we spend as much or more time really thinking about how do we empower, educate, inspire people to make more sustainable choices across their lifestyle. And joining us now is the CEO of Blue Land, Sarah Paige Yu. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And to be clear, you're not zero waste every day now, <laughs> but you learned a lot about living sustainably, yes. and you're actually going to show us some of those changes that we can make ourselves in our GMA3 grocery store. Let's start in the produce section. Yes. <laughs> so one of my favorite tips is for produce is just to ditch the plastic produce bag. Um, so what I like to do is I have my fruits and veggies just roll naked in my car. They roll naked in my fridge. I promise you it's okay. It's unfortunately already dirty and you know you're already gonna wash your fruits and veggies before you use them. So it's a good way to you know cut out eight to ten produce plastic bags per grocery trip. Oh, that's amazing. I yeah. do the same thing. That's uh, that's good to know. Um, <laughs> so let's move over here, yes. right, to the snacks and drinks section. A lot of this stuff does look delicious, <laughs> admittedly, but how do you avoid all the packaging that can be problematic? Yeah, so unlike produce, snacks and, and drinks are a category that everything seems to come packaged in plastic. Um, the good news is that there are so many grocery stores now that offer a bulk section, um, which offers things like snacks, like pretzels, nuts, granola, even chocolate and candy. And so what my family likes to do is we bring our own containers, 
to the grocery store, we can get exactly how much we need, and we, we save money as well because we're not paying for the excess packaging. Yeah, I saw this in your pantry. <laughs> yes. And then how about here on the, these crinkly bottles yeah, of yeah. water? But this can't be good. Yeah, so one of my biggest tips is for everyone to just carry around a reusable water bottle as well as a reusable coffee mug if you drink coffee. Um, Americans use over 50 billion plastic, single-use plastic water bottles each year, and even though they're intended to be recycled, only about one in five is actually recycled. Yeah, yeah. recycling is never yeah. as good That's as That's crazy. Okay, we got to talk about the cleaning products yeah. of it all. Because so many of them say, oh, earth friendly, eco friendly, but that isn't actually a claim that's provable. Yeah, unfortunately, that claim is not regulated here in the US. Um, I mean, things like pods, for example, there are a lot of pods and laundry sheets that are marketed as eco friendly. Um, but this thin film that you see wrapping each pod, it's actually plastic. Um, and so what I recommend is, you know, our company, Blue Land, we make these naked uh, laundry tablets oh. without the plastic, but you get the single dose oh, convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I also recommend, you know, good old laundry powder that comes in a big cardboard box or even a jug of liquid detergent, because at least this jug is recyclable versus this plastic, um, polyvinyl alcohol, it breaks down into tiny pieces of plastic, it goes down our drains and ultimately into mm -hmm. our environment. And on our plates. Yeah, and on our plates. <laughs> Can't have that on yeah. the dishwashing pods. And finally, storage, paper goods, Plastic wrap, sandwich bags, all that. What do you, what do we need to change about yeah, the Yeah, so the great thing is there are a lot of great alternatives um, to sort of the plastic wrap and the zip top sort of plastic baggies. My family lives by these silicone reusable bags for snacks and for leftovers. Oh, that's great. You yeah. just wash them and... Yeah, you just wash them and you can reuse them. And there's also great like bees wrap wax as well that you can, that's moldable that you can use to Instead cover Instead of the food. saran wrap. Yeah. Oh, awesome. awesome. <laughs> Sarah, thanks so much for being with us. Of course. Thank thanks so much for having me. And when we come back, actor Wilson Cruz bringing the laughs. What drew him to his new role in the film Mother of the Bride? We are going to find that out on GMA3 in the film. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a, a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled, anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. The clock fell on my stepson. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. Here, that was just good lie. Do you think this ends in a good way? Interrogation tapes tonight on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! For our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. He is known for making his impact on stages and beyond, starring in cult classics like My So-Called Life and Star Trek Discovery. And now he's bringing the laughs in the new film, Mother of the Bride. Please welcome Wilson Cruz. Thank you, guys. 
So what about this character drew you to this role? Well, I have to say, you know, after five seasons of saving the universe and high stakes in, on Star Trek Discovery, it was really nice to go to Phuket and, like, sit by the pool and make people laugh. Like, you know, I didn't have to save the universe all, all day. So that and the fact that, you know, uh, I'm a huge fan of Benjamin Bratz, who is like the Latino Cary Grant, I like to say, and I wanted to, you know, pick up some tips on that. And Brooke Shields has been an icon of mine since I was a teenager, obviously. So uh, it was just a, it was a paid vacation, let's be honest. <laughs> let's be real. It so, was so much fun. But it was also hard work, obviously. Oh, no, it and, wasn't and, hard work at all. I'm gonna... <laughs> and I would love to sign up for that uh, location. You you were at a luxury resort in Thailand. Two, yes, we and, were. Oh, I know how to say hello in Thai. In thai. Sawadika. Yes. Right? Uh-huh. Is that sure. pretty good? Yeah. Okay. He's gonna, he's gonna what go else did you learn? What was it like, you know, being in Thailand? I'll tell for, you, for the food period? was amazing. The people were amazing. We had an, an all-Thai crew. Um, it's just a gorgeous place in the world. You know, I took a week after we finished filming, and my brother and I explored the entire island. Wow. Yeah. Thailand is at the top of my bucket list, so I'll have right. to get some recommendations <laughs> from you, you and live it. vicariously. <laughs> through you by watching Mother of the Bride. Please but I want to go back now 30 years, can't yeah. believe it, to that one singular amazing season of my so-called life. Critics dub it as one of the best teen drama series ever. And when you reflect upon the success of that show and your career 30 years on, what, where does your mind go? I mean, the first thing that comes up is gratitude. You know, I am so grateful for that opportunity. It just set up the rest of my career, but also the gratitude I have for being allowed to be that person for a generation of young people and more generations that followed that really got to see a young, queer person of color come into their own and go on this journey of self-acceptance. And, you know, uh, I know how much that character meant to LGBTQ people because it would have meant that much to me. I'm, I'm the chair of the board at GLSEN, which is an organization that works to um, support students in, in schools. Um, and so I know how difficult schools are um, to, be a, to, to go through that process. We actually have our big New York City gala April 29th if anybody wants to come. Mm. Uh, you can go to glisten.org and buy tickets. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it's, it, was, it was a huge moment in terms of visibility and I'm just really proud to have been able to be that person. It's crazy. Yeah. Do you think that was 30 years ago? Yes, and we only I only look 15 yeah, I mean, now. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wilson Cruz, for being here, for sharing yourself with us here. It is a pleasure to see you and be with you. And you can check Wilson out on The Mother of the Bride on Netflix on May 9th. And that is what you need to know for this Monday. I'm Eva Pilgrim. And I'm Will Reed. And I'm Dr. Jen Ashton. And for all of us here at ABC News, have a great day. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here and 
We got gotcha. you. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, Afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love you that. Me. Traveling with the president in Vietnam, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Ken Weaver here in Los Angeles and right now on ABC News Live. Witness testimony set to resume tomorrow in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president, Donald Trump, back in court in New York for his hush money trial. What a former tabloid publisher accused of catching and killing negative stories about Trump told the court today. Also, growing concerns over security and anti-Semitism at Columbia University, the major safety step from the school ahead of the first night of Passover. Also, Congress moving closer to passing a potential ban on TikTok. How this and it may decide the future of the app used by 170 million people across the United States. But we begin here on this Monday with testimony set to resume tomorrow in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Donald Trump defiant again today while leaving his hush money trial in New York, doubling down on his defense that payments to his former attorney, Michael Cohen, were appropriately labeled as legal expenses. Actually, nobody's been able to say what you're supposed to call it. If a lawyer puts in a bill or an invoice and you pay the bill and in the book, it's a little line that's a very small little line. I don't know if you can even write more than two words. It's not like you can tell a life story. They marked it down to a legal expense. This is what I got indicted on. Well, prosecutors say those payments were actually part of an effort to funnel hush money to porn star Stormy Daniels and that Trump falsified business records to hide it. And the former president in court today as the first witness in the case took the stand. His longtime friend and former publisher of the National Enquirer, David Pecker, testifying about what he called the tabloids brand of checkbook journalism, essentially paying for stories. So prosecutors say that he acted as a co-conspirator in helping buy and bury damaging stories about Trump. So joining me for more on this is our investigative reporter, Olivia Rubin, along with our executive editorial producer, John Santucci, and criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor, Tim Jansen. So thank you all for being here. And Olivia, let's start here with you. Please tell us, I mean, what was it like for Trump in court today? What was his mood and, and how did he respond, Olivia, to Pecker's testimony? I think we saw a few different moods from Donald Trump in the courtroom today, Kena. We saw the bored Donald Trump letting out a yawn during sort of the lengthy jury instructions that were delivered by Juan Marchand at the beginning of the day. We saw sort of a maybe more angered Donald Trump when the prosecutors were going through their opening statement, talking about how he committed a fraud, talking about how he tried to influence the election, how they uh, read through the Access Hollywood tapes, said that he bragged about abusing women. And then we saw Donald Trump uh, when David Pecker first got on the stand, and it was so interesting to watch him watch David Pecker make his way up to the stand, and it was a really fascinating moment. The demeanor of David Pecker sort of flashing this big smile right when he got on the witness stand, right before he began his testimony. But, Kena, I do think that it was the prosecutor's opening statement that appeared to get under Donald Trump's skin the most today, specifically with what I just said, the Access Hollywood tape. You could see him shaking his his head. He, you know, was kind of pursing his lips at times, passing notes with his attorney, and that, that's when we kind of saw the most reaction out of him. But you have to remember, a lot of what court is, is very slow at times. It's very laborious. It's very just litigious. And it's not as exciting as some of the more uh, high-profile moments. And those are the times when you see Donald Trump just sort of slumped in his chair with absolutely nothing to do. Right. And even uh, to that point, Olivia, I know the judge told everyone, including the jurors, you know, don't think about how this plays out in TV. This exactly. is a real courtroom. It's going to be different. Exactly. Uh, so, John, yeah. So, John, to you, look, uh, Trump and David Pecker, I mean, they've been close for years, yeah. right? At one point, Trump calling him brilliant, David Pecker referring to him as a close first personal friend at one point. Uh, so how crucial is he right now to the prosecutor's case? And why call him to the stand first? Well, he's critical. I mean, because at the end of the day, this arrangement 
arrangement was between allegedly three people, Donald Trump, David Pecker, and Michael Cohen. So getting two of the you know partners in this up on the stand really is what prosecutors need to do to show not only that this was the team that did this, but this was a repeat performance, right? Though Stormy Daniels and that situation is the only one part of the 34 criminal count indictment brought by prosecutors here in New York. The idea is that Pecker, Trump, and Cohen had done this multiple times before Kana. So really what David Pecker does is give voice to the scheme. And, and look, prosecutors acknowledged it today during their opening statements that, look, you know, there's certainly some issues with Michael Cohen, but the reality is this was a deal that he carried out at Donald Trump's behest as his lawyer. He worked with David Pecker, and this is how the deal got done. I do just think, though, and Olivia hit on this point very smartly a couple seconds ago with you, you know, calling David Pecker first in part sort of sets the table up, obviously, into what catch and kill is and this relationship they had, but it does also give a different voice to all of this. And what I mean by that is, look, we've heard Michael Cohen talk before. We've heard Stormy Daniels talk before. You have never heard David Pecker speak before. So even for the jurors, some of whom might be familiar with this, to see somebody new in this performance already sets the stage. Oh, piquing that interest, that's a really good point. And we know uh, the defense attorneys, uh, to quote Aaron Katursky, tried their best to essentially eviscerate the credibility of Michael Cohen. Uh, and David Pecker will be back on the stand tomorrow. So, Tim, to you also tomorrow. Uh, the judge is going to hear some arguments about whether Trump violated the gag order in this case, in part by posting about expected witnesses, including Michael Cohen uh, do, and Stormy Daniels, doing this on social media. Uh, do you think you might see any firm enforcement of this gag order? I know they've talked about about you know potentially throwing a thousand dollars at him each time he does it well clearly he violated the gag order uh the judge set the gag order and trump apparently violated it multiple times i'm surprised they haven't done anything beforehand um i think the judge is going to get some control he, he might give him some fines and, and give him the riot act and let him know next time i'm going to start whole, or double the fines triple the fines but i, I think he's got to take control he can't allow Trump to be out there every day after court criticizing witnesses. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the gag order, right? And he's violating it. So he's violating a court order uh, against this judge on a daily basis. And he also even uh, again today, according to reports, attacked the judge uh, on social media for not allowing him to attend the Supreme Court hearing on Thursday that's happening. So I know that all of you will be watching this closely. We'll continue to discuss this as it all plays out. Olivia, John and Tim, thank you so much. Also, President Biden today weighing in on those protests that have raised major concerns about safety and anti-Semitism on college campuses. He answered questions that were shouted to him from reporters while leaving an Earth Day event. Take a listen. Do you condemn the anti-Semitic protests on college campuses? I condemn the anti-Semitic protests. That's why I've set up a program to deal with that. I also condemn those who don't understand what's going on with the Palestinians. So protesters rallying again at Columbia University in New York City, calling for it to cut financial ties with businesses connected to Israel. Administrators stepping up security. They're shifting to virtual learning today ahead of the start of Passover tonight. The NYPD also helping form safe corridors, as they call it, for students and saying that there are no credible threats right now to any particular groups or individuals. Pro-Palestinian rallies taking place at other schools, including Yale University in Connecticut. Police they're saying that they took dozens of protesters in, into custody and charged them with trespassing that happened earlier today. Uh, turning our attention now to Capitol Hill, where the $95 billion foreign aid package heads to the Senate and is expected to pass this week. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer bringing the package to the Senate floor that would provide aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Now, the legislation also includes a ban against TikTok unless its Chinese-based parent company, ByteDance, sells it. The package is a combination of four bills that the House passed on Saturday after months of delay, with Democrats helping push the funding measure through over the no votes of a group of hardline GOP lawmakers who strongly oppose it, arguing that the U.S. should instead focus on the crisis at our own southern border. Some even threatening House Speaker Mike Johnson's gavel, but Johnson defending the legislation despite the pushback. I want to bring in our ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang from Capitol Hill for us. So, uh, Selena, a lot, a lot going on here with this aid package. Again, expected to pass in the Senate, but what does that mean, if it does, for the future of TikTok? 
Yeah, Kana, there's a lot of bipartisan support for this. So this whole aid package, including this part that includes TikTok, it is expected to speed through the Senate. But what does this actually mean? So it would result in a ban here in the U.S. for TikTok unless this Chinese company ByteDance, parent company ByteDance, sells it within a year. Now, this is not going to be an easy process. First of all, TikTok is going to fight this in the court, saying that it violates the First Amendment and saying it devastates those millions of small businesses that rely on the platform. In addition to that, the Chinese government could block a sale of the app. And it's not going to be easy to find a buyer, Kena. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars here. This is an extremely expensive app. And then, of course, wondering if all the information and data bytes come with it. Uh, of course, uh, Selena, also talk to us about House Speaker Johnson uh, pushing his way with this bill. He had to have help from Democrats to do it, which essentially, you know, put his job on the line. I mean, is his speakership right now under threat? Yeah, a total 180 for Johnson going from being staunchly against Ukraine to putting his job on the line to get this $95 billion aid package passed. Now, for now, his job is safe, but there is a still threat. This threat is still out there that he could lose his speakership with Marjorie Taylor Greene and two other House Republicans signaling that they would back her motion to vacate. But so far, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's been all bark and no bite. She's lording this over their head, his head, but she still hasn't done it. She could do it when the House is back back in session next week. But even if this motion to vacate goes through, Kana, it's not clear that it would be successful. You've got Democrats and moderate Republicans saying he should keep his job. All right, well, that'll be interesting to see how all of that plays out, especially as we watch that vote come down tomorrow. Selena, thank you so much. Uh, and now to the Middle East, where Iran is speaking out about the Israeli airstrikes that hit near a major air base and nuclear site in the country. Iran's foreign ministry calling last week's strikes harassment and saying that they caused no damage whatsoever, but warning about a more powerful response if there is another attack. And the head of the Israeli military intelligence is now resigning over the failures that led to that surprise attack on October 7th by Hamas. Major General Aaron Haliva becoming the first senior figure in the IDF to step down for his role in what became the deadliest attack in Israel's history. Uh, that news coming as the U.S. State Department considers sanctioning a specific IDF unit that is accused of human rights violations in the West Bank, and that was before the war in Gaza began. ABC News foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge is joining us now from Tel Aviv with more on this. So, Tom, thanks for being here. Look, how significant right now is this resignation of this major general in the IDF? What does it tell us about the scale of that intelligence failure? Oh, it underlines the enormity of those intelligence failings, Kena. I mean, look, the IDF had an intel dossier a year before the attack, and it read like a blueprint for Hamas's plans, but Israeli intelligence didn't think Hamas was capable of executing that plan. And there were multiple other warnings in the months and even hours before the attack. So I think it was almost an inevitability that the head of military intelligence would resign. He is the first senior officer to do so, but I probably don't think he'll be the last. And the U.S. is now set to make a decision on whether to sanction this specific IDF unit that's accused of these human rights violations uh, in the West Bank. So what right now are you hearing about that and how is Israel responding? Yeah, that's Netzach Yehuda. It's an IDF unit for ultra-Orthodox Jews. And prior to October the 7th, it was accused of multiple human rights violations against Palestinians in the West Bank. Now, the IDF says it did take disciplinary action against soldiers involved with some cases of alleged human rights abuses. The Biden administration has signaled it might take action against that unit. We don't have details of what type of action are confirmed at this stage. But that hasn't stopped an angry response from top Israeli officials, including the Prime Minister Netanyahu, saying if anyone is thinking about putting sanctions on a unit of the IDF, he'll fight it with all his strength. The defence minister here also saying the US would be wrong to single out one unit and doing so would cast a shadow over the entire IDF. All right, Tom Sufi Verage in Tel Aviv for us. Tom, thank you so much. Coming up next here, the Supreme Court hearing a high-stakes case on homeless encampments and whether cities can punish people who don't have a place to sleep. We have more on that straight ahead. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then 
bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges against parents of the shooter at Oxford High School who killed four students and wounded others. There's a myth that the shooter just snaps. It's just not true. There are always signs he was crying for help and being ignored. He had pictures of a target on his bedroom wall, shell casings on his nightstand. A very toxic, turbulent relationship. Those people are yikes. The life they lived was just crazy. The sexting and the really terrible things they'd video of their sexual acts. They purchased that gun for him with his money and bragged about it. They're being told by a school counselor that he thinks their son's going to kill himself and they knew nothing. As soon as I heard they were called to the school that day, the messages about LOL, don't get caught, those were very, very concerning to me. That's the moment that no juror is going to think, well, haven't we all been there? Here's what it is. I got it. They do not seem shocked about him having the gun. There was no shock. Zero. Zero. School shooters aren't created. They're made, and it's made over time. You don't get to walk away from that. You just don't. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. All right, the Supreme Court is hearing a major homelessness case for the first time in decades. The justice is weighing in on a case that could affect how cities treat people who are homeless. This comes after a Ninth Circuit ruling found that fining people for sleeping on the streets amounts to, quote, cruel and unusual punishment. Officials in California and Oregon argue that homelessness numbers are skyrocketing amid housing, uh, housing costs that are rising and income equality as well. Uh, so for joining us for more on this is our ABC News senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer. He's live outside the Supreme Court. And Devin, I know you've been following this closely. Uh, this case really one of the most significant legal disputes over homelessness in more than 40 years. Uh, so what stood out to you the most today in court? A fascinating debate today, Ken. It lasted more than two and a half hours, and the court's conservative majority was clearly sympathetic to cities like Grants Pass, Oregon, the one that brought this case today. Uh, while certainly empathetic with people who are unhoused, the, the conservative justices said cities need to be able to crack down on those homeless encampments. We've seen an explosion of those up and down the West Coast in particular. They frame this as a matter of public health and safety. Uh, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas suggesting that the eighth and Amendment, that cruel, unusual punishment ban doesn't apply to civil fines. Amy Coney Barrett worried that if they wouldn't uh, allow a camping ban, maybe cities then could be at risk for punishing people for public defecation and urination. She said that clearly needs to be prohibited, even though it's a human need. But the liberal justices, Kena, were on fire today. They were adamant that sleeping is a basic human right, that doing so in public when there are no other places for these people to go, um, it needs to be protected. It cannot be punished by the state. And the justices will have to issue an opinion here uh, in the next few weeks, Kana. Well, and Devin, I know that you even went to Oregon and you spoke with officials there. How do they feel about this case? You know, the community, uh, the community level is so divided, you know, and we talked to uh, state attorneys, local council people out in Grants Pass, and they said, look, this is something that residents feel strongly about. They have a right to be in their parks, too. And here's what the police chief had to say, along with the city attorney. We have community members in Grants Pass that are afraid to come to their parks. We've had shootings in our parks. We've had fights in our parks, chronic drug abuse in our parks. So, so much of our citizenry are not walking through our parks. It's not acceptable for anyone to call the streets or a park their home. And cities need to have these ordinances so that they can help to incentivize people to accept offers of help. That's what these laws do. 
So the city saying these sorts of laws are incentivizing people to seek shelter, but a number of homeless residents in Grants Pass, I talked to Kena, I said this is simply about human rights. There was nowhere else for them to go. The city doesn't have a public shelter, uh, and therefore the answer to this problem, a very complicated and emotional problem nationwide, is more affordable housing and more shelters, that the city needs to do that rather than punish people with tickets. Again, the justices appeared sympathetic to the city, uh, but we'll have to see what they say in their final opinion in June, Kena. Well, and so, Devin, as you mentioned there, we aren't expecting this final opinion until June, but it's coming quickly. Uh, so how could this ruling then impact other states and cities uh, with large homeless populations? I know uh, the genesis of this argument even started in Boise, Idaho, right? It, it sure did, and uh, states like Idaho, Washington State, California, up and down the coast are watching this very closely because cities uh, want to move in. They want to clear out these encampments. They want to more aggressively pursue them, and they don't want to face constitutional challenges. So whatever the court says here will have a sweeping impact. It won't solve the homeless problem. Uh, it's more than 600,000 Americans homeless on any given night in this country. That's a record number. Uh, both sides acknowledge whatever the court says won't fix that here, um, but cities, states, red states and blue states, Republicans and Democrats in many cases, hoping that the Supreme Court will give them back this charge to be able to clean it up. On the other hand, Kena, advocates are hoping that the uh, Supreme Court won't green light more punishment for people already in a tough spot, Kena. All right, Devin Dwyer, thanks to you. Also, the Supreme Court today agreeing to take up a legal battle over ghost guns as well. These are weapons with no serial numbers. They're assembled from individual parts that are often created with a 3D printer. Uh, the Biden administration appealing to keep a regulation in place targeting ghost guns after lower court struck it down. The justices had previously voted five to four to keep that regulation in effect as the legal battle played out. All right, coming up next here on ABC News Live on this Earth Day, we will show you a group of kids who think that they can change the world or at least their school's cafeteria. That's coming up next. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. You have another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Give it to me. This week, opening arguments in Donald Trump's criminal trial. Plus, the massive foreign aid bill and the bipartisan coalition behind it. With so much at stake, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir, the most watched newscast on television. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The truck fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from the front lines of the war in Israel, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Today is Earth Day, which began in 1970 and marks the anniversary of what its organizers called the birth of the modern environmental movement to raise awareness for protecting our planet. So all week long, ABC News will feature reports on climate challenges that we face and possible solutions as well in an initiative we're calling 
the power of us. So this year's theme is plant versus plastics, a call to reduce plastic production by 60% by the year 2040. And like so many movements, children across the country are helping move towards that goal. ABC's chief climate correspondent, Ginger Z, explains how elementary school students are demonstrating the power of us. The school cafeteria might seem like just a place to eat, but for these students, the learning hasn't stopped. When we use plastic, they send it over to like factories and they burn it and it affects like the ecosystem. It's plastic free lunch day at this school in Brooklyn, New York. The plastic free lunch movement all started in 2018 after fifth graders advocated for the change. And they started to ask a question. Wow, this is a zero waste school, but how can it be a zero waste school when we have so much plastic in our lunches? So much plastic packaging. Rhonda Kaiser is the program director at Cafeteria Culture, an organization that facilitates plastic free lunch day. She says the initiative has grown exponentially. Now, one day a month, schools across New York City go plastic free during lunch. That means they don't use any single use plastic like utensils or packaging. Reusable trays are ideal, but since this school doesn't have a dishwasher, they're using compostable plates and composting them the right way. The menu, modified. Handheld foods like sandwiches and veggies that they can dip. Bananas, cauliflower, cucumbers, and broccoli. 19 school districts across the country have joined. The reach of Plastic Free Lunch Day has been enormous. Just the data from New York City schools, from the 16 Plastic Free Lunch Days, we've reduced more than 13 million single-use plastic items from the waste stream. A review published by the National Institutes of Health revealed that public schools in the U.S. generate about 14,500 tons of municipal solid waste every day. And approximately 42% of that is packaging generated by schools' food service. If your kids pack a lunch for school, there are ways to reduce plastic there, too. So we invested in this bento box that is aluminum. Cleans up really nicely. It's even dishwasher safe, uh, but we mostly hand wash it. No microplastics shedding into my kids' food, and I don't have to have that ugly habit of buying plastic baggies. The kids know they're making a difference. I think it's important. That's why I think more schools should do it. We're definitely not going to stop until it's plastic-free lunch day every day. All right, our thanks to Ginger Z uh, for more of her reporting on Earth Day. Be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. ABC News Live will also have special reporting on the climate challenges that we face and more empowering stories about solutions. So tune in to our new special, Trash, The Secret Life of Plastic Exports, airing tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. And then on Thursday, be sure to catch another brand new special, The Power of Us, which focuses on individual and systemic solutions and the impact that we can have together to protect our earth that's at 8 30 p.m eastern both specials will also be streaming on hulu so we certainly hope that you check them out of course so we have a lot more news here on abc news live and in today's big story the first witness testimony in the first criminal trial of a former u.s president what the former publisher of the national Enquirer, a longtime friend of donald trump's told the court about the tabloids brand of checkbook journalism. Also in our spotlight, Congress moving closer to passing a potential ban on TikTok. Our panel lays in on whether it could trigger a revolt from younger voters. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Well, the first witness taking the stand in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and that is our big story today. Donald Trump back before a judge in his criminal hush money trial in New York. What he said while leaving court and the testimony from a longtime friend of his accused of being part of this alleged catch and kill scheme to bury negative stories about Trump. And in our spotlight, Congress moving closer to passing a potential ban on TikTok. Our panel weighs in on whether it could trigger a political revolt from younger voters. Okay, of course, we begin here with our big story testimony set to resume tomorrow in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Uh, Donald Trump defiant again today while leaving his hush money trial in New York, doubling down on his defense that his payments to his former attorney, Michael Cohen, were appropriately labeled as legal expenses. Actually, nobody's been able to say what you're supposed to call it. If a lawyer puts in a bill or an invoice and you pay the bill and in the book, it's a little line that's a very small little line. I don't know if you could even write more than two words. It's not like you could tell a life story. They marked it down to a legal expense. This is what I got indicted on. Well, prosecutors say that those payments were actually part of an effort to funnel hush money to porn star Stormy Daniels and that Trump falsified business records to hide it. Uh, the former president in court today as the first witness in the case took the stand. His longtime friend and former publisher of the National Enquirer, David Pecker, testifying about what he called the tabloid's brand of checkbook journalism, essentially paying for stories. So prosecutors say that he acted as a co-conspirator in helping buy and bury damaging stories about Donald Trump. Trump. Uh, joining me for more on this is our ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent, Jonathan Carl. So, John, thank you so much for being here with me today. And look, this is something that you have covered for so long. And actually, I was just watching you watch the former president address the media there as he left the courthouse today, talking about this little line that you can't write a life story in. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, well, look, uh, first of all, overall, what a day uh, for history. This is not the first day of the trial, but it's the first day opening statements, the substantive first beginning of this trial. And it features David Pecker, uh, a guy who is uh, the, the, the former head of the National Enquirer, uh, a lead witness. So fascinating because they led with him clearly because they think that he is going to be central to their case. The testimony barely got underway. We don't know where exactly it's going to go. But put this in context here. You have the three central witnesses now that we know for this case, the 
uh, basically a scandal monger, head of a tabloid, uh, a convicted liar in Michael Cohen, and a porn star. Uh, that seems to raise questions about how the prosecution is going to make their case. It also raises questions about Donald Trump. All three of them are central to this case because of their direct ties to the former and potentially future president. Certainly, and we know that the defense uh, jumped to their chance in opening statements to, as Aaron Katursky wrote, to essentially eviscerate Michael Cohen's credibility. Uh, but also, John, I'm curious uh, to get your thoughts on, after the Sandoval hearing, uh, ju the judge said that if Trump does take the stand, the prosecutors can, in fact, ask him about a number of past legal issues. It's limited in scope a bit. Uh, so knowing that now, John, do you think that he'll still testify? So I, I have to tell you, Ken, I've been skeptical that he would testify primarily because I've seen Donald Trump over the course of so many other cases where he said, I'll testify, I'll talk, I've got nothing to hide, and then he doesn't testify. This goes mm -hmm. all the way back to the Mueller report. But I actually, you know, my understanding and his lawyers are not counseling him against testifying. I don't think he's going to testify in any of the other criminal cases if they come to trial. But on this one, it basically comes down to Michael Cohen's word against Donald Trump's word. So there is a reason for him to get on the stand and to directly dispute what Michael Cohen has said about these statements. I still think there is a very good chance that Donald Trump will testify in this case. Oh, wow. Well, that'll be something. And also, John, as you know, tomorrow will again, it will start with this contempt hearing. Prosecutors saying that Trump has violated the gag order multiple times. Some even questioning, you know, if what he said about Michael Cohen today after court is yet another violation. We also know he mentioned the judge on social media today as well. Uh, so he's also, though, taking those moments at the microphone, John, to highlight what he's missing in his opinion. He's missing at his time on the campaign. Yeah, and by the way, it sure looked like he violated the gag order today. He is not allowed to criticize the witnesses, to go after the witnesses, and he went after Michael Cohen over and over again at this, uh, at, at the microphones. But overall, you know, he is, his advisors have urged him to use those moments before the camera, when really he has the attention of much of the country, everybody following this case, to use those moments to do what he can't do, which is the campaign, because he's stuck in the courtrooms, to come out and to emphasize uh, his big themes, to go after Joe Biden on a substantive way, and instead he is out there making smallish complaints about being mis treated by the by by the court system by the prosecutors uh, I I don't think it's been particularly effective and he is he is deprived of being on the campaign trail that is true and he's not using the attention that he has all right uh, thank you so much for your analysis as always John Carl it's a pleasure to have you with us I want to bring our big story now to our panel so joining us today is our ABC News political contributor and former Democratic US Senator from North Dakota Heidi Heitkamp our ABC News contributor and former Virginia Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse and our legal news contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer okay so there's a lot to talk about even though we just had a short day in court today uh, so Brian and let's talk about what the judge made very clear, that the burden lies with the prosecution. They have to prove here behind, beyond a reasonable doubt, right? The jury just can't think that Donald Trump is probably guilty. Uh, but, Brian, the defense arguing that these payments, the practice of catch and kill and influence, influencing election isn't illegal. They said it's democracy. Yeah, I'm not sure of that argument. It seems more rhetoric than a legal argument. It's, again, where the campaign is kind of bumping up with the criminal court itself. Uh, but other than that argument from the defense, they did make some points where they were trying to highlight the credibility issue that some of the prosecutor's witnesses may have. And another point that I think that wasn't really highlighted but might be a larger issue down the road, if not for this trial, then for the appeal, is in order to make these falsification of business records a felony, there needs to be an underlying crime. And it seems like the prosecution kind of glanced over that in many ways. The defense may harp on that a little bit uh, louder come the end of this trial, and that might not win the day for the trial, but maybe a strong argument for an appeal if Donald Trump is found guilty of these crimes. All right, looking far down the line there, as you always do in anticipation, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you. Uh, Heidi, to you, uh, first of all, what is your reaction to, to Brian's statement there? Well, I think that is going to be tough for this prosecutor to try and link the, the, the uh, falsification of business records, which Trump is going directly at when he said, I didn't falsify anything. I paid a legal bill that was handed to me, uh, along with uh, election 
fraud. And, and so this isn't a slam dunk, but the, the most important part politically is it is highly unflattering to Donald Trump going forward. And if Donald Trump gets on the stand, it's going to be very, very difficult for him to recover any kind of reputational, uh, recover from the injury that's going to happen. So you got to look at this from a legal standpoint. That's tough. Political standpoint, I don't think this is good for Donald Trump. Yeah, and Barbara, what's your take on what Heidi just said there about uh, politically? You know, he's he's not filling his campaign coffers. He's not going to the states that he needs to be campaigning in. Instead, he's sitting in this courtroom. He can't go to the Supreme Court as he'd like to on Thursday as well. Uh, so what's your take? Well, I think it's smart to start with this David Pecker, the National Enquirer, because having worked on a lot of campaigns, the idea that a candidate himself was sitting down and starting with this conspiracy with his lawyer and the National Enquirer to catch and kill these negative stories about him and talking about how, you know, either the National Enquirer would pay off a Playboy model or these or Stormy Daniels or whoever that he had affairs with and, and that his lawyer would be paying them off. And then you have all these receipts and all these things. And that the candidate himself, not somebody on his campaign, but the candidate himself, Donald Trump, was going to be involved in it. And then you have all these receipts of him paying his lawyer, who he was very complimentary of Michael Cohen until the time when Michael Cohen turned on him and then he trashed him. So I think the timeline's going to be what's going to be interesting of when he was nice to him, and when he started trashing him. And the timeline and what they can actually submit into evidence uh, to prove the point that they're trying to make. Uh, so, Mike, I'm also really the curious. <laughs> mm -hmm. Imagine Ronald uh, Reagan doing that. <laughs> And uh, yeah, Mike, Mike, I want to get your take, too, on there was a lot of characterization that happened today in these opening statements, right? Uh, I, I keep saying it. Aaron Katursky said that they tried to essentially eviscerate the character of Michael Cohen, but also the defense trying to paint Donald Trump as Donald Trump, the man, the husband, the father. But they also, Mike, continued to refer to him as president. And they said that that was purposeful. Yeah. Aaron always does great reporting, Kate, and I think he was onto something. I think what yeah. the defense is going to have to do is really try and undermine the character of one of the prosecution star witness, which is Michael Cohen, which is kind of what Barbara is alluding to. And when you look at it on paper, the data is there, the paper trail is there. You are able to connect the dots in terms of receipts and evidence. It all goes down to a tent, to which Brian was talking about. And so with these key witnesses, if they can prove the intent of former President Trump, Trump's doings, um, that is strong for the prosecution, which is why the defense needs to make the jury discredit the characters of these lead witnesses. But politically, Kana, I'm really interested to see what's coming out. Particularly over the weekend, uh, we saw the campaign filings of the strength of his campaign, and we saw his super PAC. And what we saw is it's almost equal part money is coming in equal parts to how much is being spent on his legal bills. And so I think as time goes on, politically, no matter the outcome of the case, I think that's going to be a bigger story to watch uh, in the near future. And I know and I that also John Santucci. His family is not there. No one from his family is sitting there with him. And that's highly unusual to not have anybody. It is possible, right? Him. It is possible that they end up getting called to testify, right? They were on that initial list. Uh, and it also, as John Santucci has pointed out here uh, time and time again, that we really have to see how this does play out with his campaign because there are some voters out there that say if he is convicted, they will not vote for him. All right, Heidi, Barbara, Mike, and Brian, thank you so much for your time with us. All right, coming up next in our spotlight, uh, the Senate teeing up a vote this week on a foreign aid package that also takes the next step to banning TikTok in America. Our panel weighs in on the jobs that could be lost from the TikTok economy. That's after the break. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! 
traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. All right, in our spotlight, the $95 billion foreign aid package passed by the House this weekend now heads to the Senate, where it's expected to see a vote this week. It would provide aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. The legislation also includes a ban against TikTok, unless its Chinese-based parent company, ByteDance, sells it. Uh, the package is a combination here of four bills. The House passed them on Saturday. Of course, you remember, this is after months of delay. With Democrats, though, helping to push the funding measure through over the no vote votes over a group of hardline GOP lawmakers. They strongly opposed it, arguing that the U.S. should focus on the crisis at the southern border, some threatening House Speaker Mike Johnson's gavel, but Johnson defending the legislation despite all that pushback. I want to bring back my panel here. So Heidi, Barbara, Mike, and joining us is ABC News contributor and op-ed columnist for the Los Angeles Times, LZ Granderson. So Heidi, let's start here with you. I mean, it, as we have seen, it play out. It takes a lot to get Republicans and Democrats to agree and work together, but senators from both parties parties here in the Senate Intelligence Committee claim that TikTok could be used as a propaganda tool by China. So what is your take here on the urgency they're using to address this issue? Yeah, I'm sure Barbara will agree. Um, those members have more information than we do. There's been a lot of work done by the Intel committees to expose the, the risk that TikTok presents. And I know Mike disagrees with us, but um, I think this is a smart move. And I, I know on the queue up, there was a question about politically whether this mm -hmm. would affect the election. But you got to remember that they've been given nine months to uh, alienate and sell TikTok um, by that time the election will be over. So we'll see how this plays out with young people going forward. Yes, yeah, certainly. It could be a critical voting block there uh, for the Biden administration in terms of TikTok users. Uh, Barbara, what is your take here on Johnson standing firm with that? Well, listen, I think it is so exciting that the speaker went forward on this with all the threats that he had from the right on the Ukraine piece. And I just want to give kudos to my friend Mike McCall, who was fighting for this for so long to get the Ukraine peace in Israel. And it, this was such a great kumbaya moment on Saturday for everyone to be celebrating on that, you know, international win. So I think there was less focus probably on the TikTok part because the other pieces were such, you know, an international crisis that that's what was so important that we get done and was, was such a great win to kick that Freedom Caucus to the curb and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's now having her moment of, you know, uh, you know, his hysteria is just a beautiful thing to see. As for TikTok, I do think there's going to be, 
you know, a lot of legal challenges there. So I don't know that it's yeah. really going to happen the way it's in the bill. I do think there's going to be some legal issues there as that goes forward. Yeah, it certainly sounds like there might be. It'll be interesting to see how this does in the Senate tomorrow. So, LZ, what is your take here, especially considering the fact that some people say it was a bit of a Trojan horse, right, to put TikTok in there the way that they did? I don't know if it's a Trojan horse, given the fact that we've been talking about China, China yeah. using TikTok as a method to infiltrate, you know, various departments of government for years. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's a Trojan horse, but I would say it, was, it made it more enticing, perhaps, to Republicans who have been concerned about this for a number of years. And I would just, you know, agree with Barbara. I think this was a really powerful moment uh, in our country's history, given how divided we have been and how nonsensical we have been, even about the most sensible of things. Um, Speaker Johnson does deserve credit for his courage to go forward with this, despite the possibility of losing his job. I've been very critical of him on a lot of different things, and so I want to compliment him on the strength of this, because this was about more than just a party. This was about the country, and he came through. Wow. This, I have to be honest. The fact that we're having this conversation right now is kind of amazing to me. I wasn't sure what everyone was going to say and how this would play out today. Uh, so, Mike, I would just love your just sort of overall take here. Do you share that sentiment, this kumbaya-ish sentiment? Well, one, I love that Heidi knows me way too well uh, in terms of my sentiments around um, <laughs> TikTok. Uh, Heidi, my sentiments still remain true to this day. I, I do believe that, as we've heard of reports, uh, there are other adversaries that are out to do cyber attacks and cyber warfare against us, in particular around infrastructure. And so I'm just wondering if this is just uh, a way of getting distracted from a lot of key issues around big tech mm. um, in ways that they can easily just pinpoint China relationship to, to TikTok. The kumbaya moment I'm happy for, but Kana, I still go to the baseline principle of this is the job of Congress. Congress is supposed to act. Yeah. Congress is supposed to move forward with legislation on behalf of not just the American people, but for our allies. And so it's hard for me to give an award or a trophy uh, to a speaker for doing the job uh, of the speaker. But we are in unique, unprecedented times. So uh, here we are today in a kumbaya moment. Here and we President are. President Biden was awesome on it, too. So, you know, he, he made it happen, too. All right, uh, LZ, Heidi, Barbara, and Mike, thank you so much. This is a fascinating conversation. I appreciate you all coming up here in our last call. Uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame announcing its newest members, why one of the new inductees may be turning down the honor. Our panel weighs in after the break. So these bags are identical, but one is real and one is fake. This feels like real. So I got a bunch of super fakes. Some of these are chef's kiss. A million dollar line. This is a counterfeit. Really? The Louis Vuitton, the Prada, the Gucci, we get everything. To make us a, a super fake is easier now than ever before. Anybody can be fooled. Anybody. Super fakes, now streaming on Hulu. From the team that brought you the DuPont Award-winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports, streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. You have another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 
25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league. A side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. I'm Mo Lenghi in Beirut. And wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. There's definitely a celebration of our cool and the gang make it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's class of 2024. Uh, this year's class stretching the boundaries of rock and roll. So take a quick listen as to who else made it. On, everybody get on down, cause you know we got to get it wrong. Mary J is in the spot tonight and I'm gonna make you feel all right. Oh, that song just takes me back. Oh, I love it so much. Oh, we have to ask. Mike, Muse, I asked them to bring your mic up so you could help me through this. They want me to sing. Do you, you, feel the way we do, Mike? <laughs> that perhaps... <laughs> <laughs> Kate, I never miss an opportunity to do karaoke with you, ever. <laughs> oh, it's so embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Future Journalist Hall of Fame and Rock Roll Hall of Fame for you, Kana. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mike. But it was really creative writing by Carrie because did you know in the end that Peter Frampton wasn't already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Uh, we have. So can we play his quick song real quick? Do we have time? So now it's time for our panel, Elsie, Heidi, Barbara, and Mike. Thank you all. I mean, Elsie, Peter Frampton, he's been making records for more than 50 years. I'm surprised he's not in there already. You know, this is the reason why I hate these voting systems, because sometimes they just make no sense. Like, seriously, there isn't a such thing as classic rock without Frampton Comes Alive. It's one of the greatest live rock albums of all times. How in the heck is it just not getting in? I do not know. I, it's like a slip between the seats. Uh, Barbara, what about Cher? Cher's in. I know, but, but the politics of this seems uh, even more complicated than what Congress is sometimes. So I'm going <laughs> to defer to uh, these guys who know more than I do. <laughs> Oh, no. Barbara's like, kumbaya um, in Congress, and now Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's a mess. Uh, Mike, <laughs> Mike, just give me your take. One, I love our producer, Carrie, for being so esoteric and knowing everything. She's my new phone friend. Um, but I'm really happy for Susan DePas to receive uh, yeah. the Business Award. She is a legendary icon in the music and media space, and she deserves her flowers. And Kana, I'm so glad when people behind the scenes get the chance, because she's responsible for discovering one of our goats, which is Michael Jackson. So. Really, really right, the Jackson that. 5. I mean, like Motown for her, right? Uh, Heidi, Heidi, what about you? Hey, listen, I'm giving a shout out to Cool in the Gang. I had to listen to a lot of funk because my 10 year old son got very in to Cool in the Gang. And you can't go anywhere where you don't hear celebrate. So come on, oh, let's get that's it. good. Yeah, the next generation loving that music. All right, thank you so much, everybody. That's it for our last call. LZ, Heidi, Barbara, and Mike, thank you. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories, the impact that they have on you. The news never stops. Neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. This week, opening arguments in Donald Trump's criminal trial, plus the massive foreign aid bill and the bipartisan coalition behind it. With so much at stake, more Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir, the most watched newscast on television. From the team that brought you the DuPont Award winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports. Streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. Did that told us to complete you. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you say it just ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series tonight on ABC. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here's to good mornings in America. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America. You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. I'm Matt Gutman reporting from Ramallah. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Kane Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and right now on ABC News Live, witness testimony set to resume tomorrow in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Donald Trump back in court in New York for his hush money trial that a former tabloid publisher accused of catching and killing negative stories about Trump told the court today. Also, Israel's top intelligence chief resigns over the failures that led to that surprise Hamas attack on October 7th. What this means for the IDF as the war rages on in Gaza. And on this Earth Day, we're shining a light on those trying to make our planet a better place. We speak with head of the world's largest youth-led nonprofit working to make climate education accessible to everyone. But of course, we begin here with the testimony set to resume tomorrow in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Donald Trump defiant again today while leaving his hush money trial in New York, doubling down on his defense that his payments to his former attorney, Michael Cohen, were appropriately labeled as legal expenses. Actually, nobody's been able to say what you're supposed to call it. If a lawyer puts in a bill or an invoice and you pay the bill and in the book, it's a little line that's a very small little line. I don't know if you can even write more than two words. It's not like you could tell a life story. They marked it down to a legal expense. This is what I got indicted on. Well, prosecutors say those payments were actually part of an effort to funnel hush money to porn star Stormy Daniels and that Trump falsified business records to hide it. The former president in court today as the first witness in the case took the stand. His longtime friend and former publisher of the National Enquirer, David Pecker, testifying about what he called the tabloid's brand of, quote, checkbook journalism, essentially paying for stories. So prosecutors say he acted as a co-conspirator in helping buy and bury damaging stories about Donald Trump. ABC News investigative reporter Olivia Rubin has more. 
The first preview of the case today playing out in that Manhattan courtroom, prosecutors telling the jury that this was a fraud, plain and simple, that Donald Trump and Michael Cohen and David Pecker all worked together, a conspiracy to influence the 2016 election. And even more so, what was likely more painful for Donald Trump in that courtroom was to hear prosecutors tell the jury about that Access Hollywood tape, that infamous tape that they say sparked the need to pay out Stormy Daniels for her claims for fears that he could lose the 2016 election. And it was the first time that the jury, this body of 12 individuals that are going to decide Donald Trump's case, got to hear prosecutor's side of the story. But they also heard for the first time Donald Trump's side of the story. And his attorney, Todd Blanche, tried to humanize Donald Trump. He said that he is, uh, you know, the former president. He is the man you see on TV. But he is also a father. He is also a husband. And he is also just a man. And what they said is that there was no crime here, that there is no uh, crime against paying hush money. There's no crime in having someone sign an NDA. And what this was were payments to someone who was Donald Trump's attorney. And what Todd Blanche did in front of that jury was just eviscerate the credibility of the prosecution's lead witness, Michael Cohen. They said he is obsessed with Donald Trump. They said that he wants to see him behind bars and that that is exactly what he is trying to do here. So at times a difficult day for Donald Trump when he heard about the Access Hollywood tape. At times a slow, apparently boring day for Donald Trump. At one time yawning through some of the more procedural purposes. But regardless, that is going to be Donald Trump's reality for the next six to eight weeks. And David Pecker, his longtime friend, now leading it off a little bit of testimony today that will really get underway tomorrow in earnest as he tells the story likely of how the three of them work together to catch and kill stories, including Stormy Daniels. All right, Olivia Rubinar, thanks to you as always. I now want to bring in our ABC News legal contributor and trial attorney for more on this, Brian Buckmeyer. So, Brian, thank you so much for being here with us. And as Olivia pointed out here, look, the defense is trying to say that, you know, it's not a crime to essentially pay someone for an NDA. It's not a crime to try and influence an election. They said that's democracy. And they can make these arguments during opening statements, Brian, but really what it boils down here, right, is can the prosecution prove intent, right? Yeah, and to your point, yeah, they can make these arguments or, or these statements because they're opening statements, not necessarily arguments or not evidence at all. But yes, the state has to prove this intent to defraud and also to cover up a crime and aid in a bed. That's something that seemed to be lacking a little bit in the uh, prosecution opening statement. But to the defense's point, I didn't see really much pushback other than don't believe uh, Michael Cohen. Uh, Donald Trump didn't really know the ins and outs of these agreements. You'll see his names on a few of those papers, as he references the 34 accounts and those invoices, but not so much everything else. But then Donald Trump comes outside and starts talking about what seems to be like a lot of knowledge as to the ins and outs of how these payments were made, that seems to be a little bit contradicting the opening statements from what the client is saying. Right. We've heard time and time again, Brian, right, that Donald Trump knew where every penny of his money was going, that it was something that he looked at very, very carefully. But also in terms of credibility, uh, the defense did their best, as Aaron Katursky says, to eviscerate the credibility of Michael Cohen. Uh, they talked about how he, as a goal, he was like obsessed with Donald Trump and with getting to know him. And they said, absolutely, he cannot be trusted. So what does that mean here for the prosecution when their star witness at this point point is a known liar. For the prosecution, they've got to show that two things can be true at the same time, that as the defense puts it, Michael Cohen is obsessed, quote unquote, with Donald Trump, has all these social media platforms and, and books and, and whatnot, and even to some extent Stormy Daniels. But through the art of corroboration, I think the prosecution has to make their case out that says, yes, he's a liar, he's lied to Congress, he's lied to court, he's lied to other people. But look at when he's telling the truth here, because the evidence backs it up. In the opening statements, the prosecutors say that Michael Cohen actually kept recording recordings of Donald Trump, almost as if he didn't believe that Donald Trump would pay him back. So if Cohen takes a stand and he has evidence to corroborate his statements, he seems to be less of a liar in this instance and might actually, in fact, help the prosecution rather than hurt them when the defense tries to poke holes in his credibility.
All right, and as we know, in the end here, the state carries that burden. Uh, Brian Buckmeyer, our thanks so much to you, as always, for your analysis. Also today, President Biden weighing in on protests that have raised concerns about safety and anti-Semitism on college campuses. He answered questions that were shouted to him from reporters while he was leaving an Earth Day event. Take a listen. Do you condemn the anti-Semitic protests on college campuses? I condemn the anti-Semitic protests. That's why I've set up a program to deal with that. I also condemn those who don't understand what's going on with the Palestinians. Well, protesters rallying again at Columbia University in New York City, calling for it to cut financial ties with businesses connected to Israel. Administrators stepping up security and shifting to virtual learning today ahead of the start of Passover tonight. The NYPD also helping form what they call safe corridors for students, saying that there's no credible threat to any particular groups or individuals right now. Also pro-Palestinian rallies taking over places at other schools, including Yale University in Connecticut. Police there say they had to take dozens of protesters into custody and charge them with trespassing. ABC News' Stephanie Ramos is live for us now at Columbia University. has been tracking the very latest. And Stephanie, look, I know you've been out there all day. So can you sort of uh, give us a look inside of what you've been seeing there throughout the day? And also, are we hearing any reaction right now from Jewish leaders at this moment? Absolutely, Kena. There is tension on both sides here from pro-Palestinian demonstrators who are students who are not students here at Columbia University and pro-Israel demonstrators. It was a much larger group earlier today outside the gates here at Columbia University. The group is a, it's a bit smaller right now, but I can tell you, I mean, we just spoke with a student. Uh, she is studying here and she was arrested last week. She says that she did not expect one to get arrested and also to get suspended. She says that she is here to fight for for the people of Gaza. She says that she and the other demonstrators want the genocide in Gaza to stop. She says that is her message. That is their message and that's why they are here. Of course, there are, there have been incidents, uh, harassment and other intimidation tactics uh, that have been taken that have taken place towards Jewish students by other individuals that have been here. She tells me together with other pro-Palestinian demonstrators that we met throughout the day, they say that these are isolated incidents. We also just spoke with a rabbi who says he is urging students to stay safe, travel in groups, not go by the school right now, and just urging caution. There was one rabbi specifically that urged students to stay home, saying the school and the NYPD cannot guarantee Jewish students' safety. But again, there are still pro-Palestinian demonstrators who insist those incidents are isolated. Okay, now. And Stephanie, look, we know we're already seeing a ripple effect from this. A big announcement today from New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft uh, saying that he's going to stop donating to Columbia. What more do we know about that? That's right. The New England's uh, Patriot owner, Robert Kraft, indicated that he will no longer donate to Columbia. He says uh, that through a statement that he hopes his center, which he has a center here at the school, will serve as a source of security and safety for all Jewish students and faculty. But he is concerned about the future of his alma mater. Okay, now. Well, Stephanie Ramos, thank you so much for your reporting. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Uh, now to the Middle East, where Iran is speaking out about the Israeli airstrikes that hit near a major air base and nuclear site in the country. Iran's foreign ministry calling last week's airstrikes, quote, harassment, saying that it caused no damage whatsoever, but warning about a more powerful response if there's another attack. We also learned that the head of Israeli military intelligence is resigning over failures that led to that surprise October 7th attack by Hamas. Uh, Major General Aaron Haliva becoming the first senior figure in the IDF to step down for his role in what became the deadliest attack in Israel's history. That news coming as the U.S. State Department considers sanctioning another specific IDF unit accused of human rights violations in the West Bank before the war in Gaza began. ABC News Ford correspondent Tom Sufi Burge has the latest for us from Tel Aviv. Yeah, Kena, his resignation underlines the enormity of those intelligence failings. The IDF had an internal dossier a year before the October 7th attack and it read like a blueprint for Hamas's plans but Israeli intelligence didn't think Hamas was capable of executing that plan. There were multiple other warnings in that months and even hours before the attack. So I think it was almost an inevitability that the head of military intelligence here in Israel would resign. He's the first senior officer to do so but I don't think he'll be the last. Now it comes as the House uh, signs off an additional $17 billion 
of military aid for Israel. But that doesn't mean uh, that the overall relationship between the Biden administration and the Israeli government is all now smooth sailing. And we're now picking up on another area of potential tensions, and that is surrounding uh, one particular Israeli military unit called Netzer Yehuda. It's a, a unit for ultra-Orthodox Jews. Prior to October the 7th, it was accused of multiple human rights violations against Palestinians in the West Bank. Now, the IDF says it did take disciplinary action against soldiers involved with specific cases. Fairly minor disciplinary action, I think it's fair to say. The Biden administration has signaled it might take action against that unit. No details of what type of action are confirmed at this stage. But that hasn't stopped an angry response from top Israeli officials, including the Prime Minister Netanyahu, saying if anyone is thinking about putting sanctions on a unit of the IDF, he says he'll fight it with all his strength. The defence minister here also saying that if the US does do this, it would be wrong to single out one unit, and doing so would cast a shadow over the entire IDF. Kena. All right, Tom Sufi Burridge in Tel Aviv for us. Thank you. Also now to dramatic video showing the moments that a Russian missile attacked Ukraine. It broke a huge TV tower, essentially splitting it in half. So we have the video again. This happened today in Kharkiv. You see see it falling right there. Uh, this is Ukraine's second largest city. It's just 18 miles from Russia's border. Ukraine's president says that the attack took place just minutes before he spoke on the phone with President Biden. He also called the strike part of a deliberate effort from Russia to make Kharkiv uninhabitable. All right, coming up next here, tens of thousands of people taking to the streets in major cities uh, in Colombia to protest their president's reform plan, why potential policy changes are causing an uproar there. That's next. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges against parents of the shooter at Oxford High School who killed four students and wounded others. There's a myth that the shooter just snaps. It's just not true. There are always signs. He was crying for help and being ignored. He had pictures of a target on his bedroom wall, shell casings on his nightstand. A very toxic, turbulent relationship. Those people are yikes. The life they lived was just crazy. The sexting and the really terrible things they'd video of their sexual acts. They purchased that gun for him with his money and bragged about it. They're being told by a school counselor that he thinks their son's going to kill himself. And they do nothing. As soon as I heard they were called to the school that day, the messages about LOL, don't get caught, those were very, very concerning to me. That's the moment that no juror is going to think, well, haven't we all been there? Here's what it is. I got it. They do not seem shocked about him having the gun. There was no shock. Zero. Zero. School shooters aren't created. They're made, and it's made over time. You don't get to walk away from that. You just don't. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. All right, welcome back. Let's look at some other stories that we're following at this hour, starting with North Korea. Test firing short-range ballistic missiles again. South Korean officials today saying weapons launched from the North's capital flew about 185 miles before crashing in the waters between the Korean Peninsula and Japan. And the range suggests the weapons could likely target sites in South Korea. The South also saying that there's evidence that North Korea is planning a launch to launch a spy satellite, but there are no signs that it's imminent. Also, protests against the Colombian president picking up steam over the weekend. Tens of thousands of demonstrators took to the streets across the country to speak against President Gustavo Petro's reform agenda. Protests have been a constant there since the former leftist guerrilla took office in 2022. But they've gained some momentum lately after he floated the possibility of rewriting the country's constitution to spur social policies that some call dire. 
And a construction officially underway on a high-speed passenger rail line between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Almost the entire project will be built uh, in the median of Interstate 15. Uh, it would take you about four hours to drive that route. I do it a lot. This train, though, is expected to cut that time in half. The $12 billion project is expected to be finished by 2028. And Caitlin Clark is reportedly cashing in. The Wall Street Journal says that Clark will sign a $28 million contract with Nike as she begins her pro career next month. The basketball superstar, who was the top pick in this month's WNBA draft, is only being paid about $76,000 by the Indiana Fever for her first season, which is about 100 times less than her NBA counterparts. All right, coming up next here, we celebrate Earth Day and we shine a light on people that are working to preserve our planet. Stay with us. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. When it matters most, America turns to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. From the team that brought you the DuPont Award-winning report, a groundbreaking new investigation spanning 9,000 miles, trashed the secret life of plastic exports, streaming Tuesday night on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from Portland International Airport, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. Turning our attention now to Capitol Hill, where the $95 billion foreign aid package heads to the Senate and is expected to pass over the weekend. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer bringing the package to the Senate floor that would provide aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. The legislation also includes a ban against TikTok unless its Chinese-based parent company ByteDance sells it. ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang has the latest for us. Hey, Kana, that massive $95 billion foreign aid package is finally making its way through Congress. And House Speaker Mike Johnson, he put his job on the line to push this through the House, defying the far right wing of his party. So this is a major transformation for Johnson, who had for months been stalling on the president's request for more foreign aid. And he had staunchly been opposed to any more aid to Ukraine. So why the change? Well, number one, the pressure from the president as well as other congressional leaders. Number two, he had these classified intelligence briefings, including with the CIA director that helped shift his stance. And in addition to that, he's a devout Christian. His co his colleague, Congressman Michael McCall, said he got on his knees and prayed about what would be the right thing to do. So in order to get this through the House, he split this foreign aid bill into separate parts in order to get a majority coalition for each one of them. And now this entire package, it goes to the Senate, where it, it is expected to speed through the Senate with major bipartisan support. Now, this bill, it does also 
also include that possible ban on TikTok. So the legislation would force the sale of TikTok if the Chinese owner of TikTok, ByteDance, doesn't sell the app within a year. So how would that work? Well, first of all, it's going to be a complicated process because TikTok is going to fight this law in the courts. In addition to that, the Chinese government could block a sale of the app. And even if this ban actually went through, it's not just going to disappear for the millions of people that have TikTok on their phones. It would likely mean that app stores wouldn't be able to offer the app anymore. So that means new users would have issues downloading it, as well as those who want to update the app. Kena. All right, Selena from Capitol Hill, our thanks as always to you. Well, today is Earth Day, which began in 1970 and marks the anniversary of what its organizers called the birth of the modern environmental movement to raise awareness for protecting our planet. So all week long, ABC News will feature reports on climate challenges that we face and possible solutions in an initiative that we're calling The Power of Us. This year's theme is Plant versus Plastics, a call to reduce plastic production by 60% by the year 2040. And like so many movements, children across the country are helping move towards that goal. ABC's chief climate correspondent Ginger Z explains how elementary school students are demonstrating the power of us. The school cafeteria might seem like just a place to eat, but for these students, the learning hasn't stopped. When we use plastic, they send it over to like factories and they burn it and it affects like the ecosystem. It's Plastic Free Lunch Day at this school in Brooklyn, New York. The Plastic Free Lunch movement all started in 2018 after fifth graders advocated for the change. And they started to ask a question, wow, this is a zero waste school, but how can it be a zero waste school when we have so much plastic in our lunches, so much plastic packaging? Rhonda Kaiser is the program director at Cafeteria Culture, an organization that facilitates Plastic Free Lunch Day. She says the initiative has grown exponentially. Now, one day a month, schools across New York City go plastic free during lunch. That means they don't use any single-use plastic like utensils or packaging. Reusable trays are ideal, but since this school doesn't have a dishwasher, they're using compostable plates and composting them the right way. The menu? Modified. Handheld foods like sandwiches and veggies that they can dip. Bananas, cauliflower, cucumbers, and broccoli. 19 school districts across the country have joined. The reach of Plastic Free Lunch Day has been enormous. Just the data from New York City schools, from the 16 Plastic Free Lunch Days, we've reduced more than 13 million single-use plastic items from the waste stream. A review published by the National Institutes of Health revealed that public schools in the U.S. generate about 14,500 tons of municipal solid waste every day. And approximately 42% of that is packaging generated by school's food service. If your kids pack a lunch for school, there are ways to reduce plastic there, too. So we invested in this bento box that is aluminum. It cleans up really nicely. It's even dishwasher safe, uh, but we mostly hand wash it. No microplastics shedding into my kids' food, and I don't have to have that ugly habit of buying plastic baggies. The kids know they're making a difference. I think it's important. That's why I think more schools should do it. We're definitely not going to stop until it's plastic-free lunch day every day. All right, and our thanks to Ginger Z for that reporting. ABC News Live will have special reporting on the climate challenges that we face and empowering stories about solutions. So be sure to catch our brand new special, Trash, The Secret Life of Plastic Exports, airing tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. And then on Thursday, you can catch our other new special, The Power of Us, where we delve into individual and systemic solutions and the impact that we can have together to protect our Earth. That's at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, with both specials, of course, also streaming on Hulu as well. And there's a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live in today's big story. The first witness testimony in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. What the former publisher of the National Enquirer, a longtime friend of Donald Trump, told the court about the tabloid's brand of